Section 1 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Colleen Benedicto. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Cannon. The Marketplace. Chapter 1, Part 1. Disorder in order, untidy officials off-handed in manner, travellers protesting against the rules and regulations to which they submitted all the same. Christophe was in France. After having satisfied the curiosity of the customs, he took a seat again in the train for Paris. Night was over the fields that were soaked with the rain. The hard lights of the station accentuated the sadness of the interminable plain buried in darkness. The trains, more and more numerous that passed, rent the air with their shrieking whistles which broke upon the torpor of the sleeping passengers. The train was nearing Paris. Christophe was ready to get out an hour before they ran in. He had jammed his hat down on his head. He had buttoned his coat up to his neck for fear of the rubbers, with whom he had been told Paris was infested. Twenty times he had got up and sat down. Many times he had moved his bag from the rack to the seat, from the seat to the rack, to the exasperation of his fellow passengers, against whom he knocked every time with his usual clumsiness. Just as they were about to run into the station, the train suddenly stopped in the darkness. Christophe flattened his nose against the window, and tried vainly to look out. He turned towards his fellow passengers hoping to find a friendly glance which would encourage him to ask where they were. But they were all asleep, or pretending to be so. They were bored and scrowling. Not one of them made any attempt to discover why they had stopped. Christophe was surprised by their indifference. These stiff, somnolent creatures were so utterly unlike the French of his imagination. At last, he sat down, discouraged, on his bag rocking with every jolt of the train and in his turn he was just dozing off when he was roused by the noise of the doors being opened. Paris. His fellow travelers were already getting out. Jostling and jostled, he walked towards the exit of the station, refusing the porter who offered to carry his bag. With a peasant's suspiciousness, he thought everyone was going to rob him. He lifted his precious bag onto his shoulders and walked straight ahead indifferent to the curses of the people as he forced his way through them. At last, he found himself in the greasy streets of Paris. He was too much taken up with the business in hand, the finding of lodgings, and too weary of the whirl of carriages into which he was swept, to think of looking at anything. The first thing was to look for a room. There was no lack of hotels. The station was surrounded with them on all sides. Their names were flaring in gas letters. Christophe wanted to find a less dazzling place than any of these. None of them seemed to him to be humble enough for his purse. At last, in the side street, he saw a dirty inn with a cheap eating house on the ground floor. It was called Hotel de la Civilisation. A fat man in shirt sleeves was sitting smoking at a table. He hurried forward as he saw Christophe enter. He could not understand a word of his jargon, but at the first glance he marked and judged the awkward, childish German who refused to let his bag out of his hands and struggled hard to make himself understood in an incredible language. He took him up an evil-smelling staircase to an airless room which opened on to a closed court. He vaunted the quietness of the room, which no noise from outside could penetrate, and he asked a good price for it. Christophe only half understood him, and knowing nothing of the conditions of life in Paris, and with the shoulders aching with the weight of his bag, he accepted everything. He was eager to be alone. But hardly was he left alone when he was struck by the dirtiness of it all, and to avoid succumbing to the melancholy which was creeping over him, he went out again very soon after having dipped his face in the dusty water, which was greasy to the touch. He tried hard not to see and not to feel, so as to escape disgust. He went down into the street. The October mist was thick and keenly cold. 
that had that stale Parisian smell in which were mingled the exhalations of the factories of the outskirts and the heavy breath of the town. He could not see ten yards in front of him. The light of the gas jets flickered like a candle on the point of going out. In the semi-darkness there were crowds of people moving in all directions. Carriages moved in front of each other, collided, obstructed the road, stemming the flood of people like a dam. The oaths of the drivers, the horns and bells of the trams made a deafening noise. The roar, the clamor, the smell of it all struck fearfully on the mind and heart of Christophe. He stopped for a moment, but was at once swept on by the people behind him and borne on by the current. He went down the boulevard de Strasbourg, seeing nothing, bumping awkwardly into the passers-by. He had eaten nothing since morning. The cafés which he had found at every turn abashed and revolted him, for they were all so crowded. He applied to a policeman, but he was so slow in finding words that the man did not even take the trouble to hear him out, and turned his back on him in the middle of a sentence and shrugged his shoulders. He went on walking mechanically. There was a small crowd in front of a shop window. He stopped mechanically. It was a photograph and picture postcard shop. There were pictures of girls in chemises, or without them. Illustrated papers displayed obscene jests. Children and young girls were looking at them calmly. There was a slim girl with red hair who saw Christophe lost in contemplation and accosted him. He looked at her and did not understand. She took his arm with a silly smile. He shook her off and rushed away, blushing angrily. There were rows of cafe concerts. Outside the doors were displayed grotesque pictures of the comedians. The crowd grew thicker and thicker. Christophe was struck by the number of vicious faces, prowling rascals, vile beggars, painted women sickeningly scented. He was frozen by it all. Weariness, weakness, and the horrible feeling of nausea, which more and more came over him, turned him sick and giddy. He set his teeth and walked on more quickly. The fog grew denser as he approached the Sienne. The whirl of carriages became bewildering. A horse slipped and fell on its side. The driver flogged it to make it get up. The wretched beast, held down by its harness, struggled and fell down again, and lay still as though it were dead. The sight of it, common enough, was the last drop that made the wretchedness that filled the soul of Christophe overflow. The miserable struggles of the poor beast, surrounded by indifferent and careless faces, made him feel bitterly his own insignificance among these thousands of men and women. The feeling of revulsion, which for the last hour had been choking him, his disgust with all these human beasts, with the unclean atmosphere, with the morally repugnant people, burst forth in him with such violence that he could not breathe. He burst into tears. The passers-by looked in amazement at the tall young man whose face was twisted with grief. He strode along with the tears running down his cheeks and made no attempt to dry them. People stopped to look at him for a moment. If he had been able to read the soul of the mob, which seemed to him to be so hostile, perhaps in some of them he might have seen, mingled, no doubt, with a little of the ironic feeling of the Parisians for any sorrow so simple and ridiculous as to show itself, pity and brotherhood. But he saw nothing. His tears blinded him. He found himself in a square, near a large fountain. He bathed his hands and dipped his face in it. A little news vendor watched him curiously and passed comment on him, waggishly though not maliciously, and he picked up his hat for him. Christophe had let it fall. The icy coldness of the water revived Christophe. He plucked up courage again. He retraced his steps, but did not look about him. He did not even think of eating. It would have been impossible for him to speak to anybody. It needed the merest trifle to set him off weeping again. He was worn out. He lost his way, and wandered about aimlessly until he found himself in front of his hotel just when he had made up his mind that he was lost. He had forgotten even the name of the street in which he lodged. He went up to his horrible room. He was empty, and his eyes were burning. 
he was aching body and soul as he sank down into a chair in the corner of the room. He stayed like that for hours and could not stir. At last, he wrenched himself out of his apathy and went to bed. He fell into a fevered slumber, from which he awoke every few minutes, feeling that he had been asleep for hours. The room was stifling. He was burning from head to foot. He was horribly thirsty. He suffered from ridiculous nightmares, which clung to him even after he had opened his eyes. Sharp pains thudded in him like the blows of a hammer. In the middle of the night he awoke, overwhelmed by despair, so profound that he all but cried out. He stuffed the bedclothes into his mouth so as not to be heard. He felt that he was going mad. He sat up in bed and struck a light. He was bathed in sweat. He got up, opened his bag to look for a handkerchief. He laid his hand on an old Bible, which his mother had hidden in his linen. Christophe had never read much of the book, but it was a comfort beyond words for him to find it at that moment. The Bible had belonged to his grandfather and to his grandfather's father. The heads of the family had inscribed on the blank page at the end their names and the important dates of their lives, births, marriages, deaths. His father had written in pencil, in his large hand, the dates when he had read and re-read each chapter. The book was full of tags of yellowed paper, on which the old man had jotted down his simple thoughts. The book used to rest on a shelf above his bed, and he used often to take it down during the long, sleepless nights and hold converse with it rather than read it. It had been with him to the hour of his death, as it had been with his father. A century of the joys and sorrows of the family was breathed forth from the pages of the book. Holding it in his hands, Christophe felt less lonely. He opened it at the most somber words of all. Is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hireling? When I lie down, I say, When shall I arise and the night be gone, and I am full of tossings to and fro unto the dawn of the day? When I say, My bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou searest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions. How long wilt thou not depart from me, nor let me alone till I swallow down my spittle? I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee, O thou preserver of men? Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. All greatness is good, and the height of sorrow tops the deliverance. What casts down and overwhelms and blasts the soul beyond all hope is mediocrity in sorrow and joy. Selfish and niggardly suffering that has not the strength to be rid of the lost pleasure and in secret lends itself to every sort of degradation to steal pleasure anew. Christophe was braced up with a bitter savour that he found in the old book. The wind of Sinai coming from the vast and lonely spaces and the mighty sea to swept away the steamy vapours. The fever in Christophe subsided. He was calm again, and lay down and slept peacefully until the morrow. When he opened his eyes again, it was day. More acutely than ever, he was conscious of the horror of his room. He felt his loneliness and wretchedness. But he faced them. He was no longer disheartened. He was left only with a sturdy melancholy. He read over now the words of Job. Even though God slay me, yet would I trust in him. He got up. He was ready calmly to face the fight. He made up his mind there and then to set to work. He knew only two people in Paris, two young fellow countrymen, his old friend, Otto Diener, who was in the office of his uncle, a cloth merchant in the male quarter, and a young Jew from Mainz, Sylvain Kahn, who had a post in a great publishing house, the address of which Christophe did not know. He had been very intimate with Diener when he was fourteen or fifteen. He had had for him one of those childish friendships which precede love, and are themselves a sort of love. Footnote. See Jean-Christophe I. The Morning. Diener had loved him too. 
the shy, reserved boy had been attracted to Christophe's gusty independence. He had tried hard to imitate him, quite ridiculously. That had both irritated and flattered Christophe. They had made plans for the overturning of the world. In the end, Diener had gone abroad for his education and business, and they did not see each other again. But Christophe had news of him from time to time from the people in town with whom Diener remained on friendly terms. As for Sylvain Kahn, his relation with Christophe had been of another kind altogether. They had been at school together, where the young monkey had played many pranks in Christophe, who thrashed him for it when he saw the trap into which he had fallen. Kahn did not put up a fight. He let Christophe knock him down and rub his face in the dust while he howled. But he would begin again at once with a malice that never tired, until the day when he became really afraid. Christophe having seriously threatened to kill him. Christophe went out early. He stopped to breakfast at a cafe. In spite of his self-consciousness, he forced himself to lose no opportunity of speaking French. Since he had to live in Paris, perhaps for years, he had better adapt himself as quickly as possible to the conditions of life there, and overcome his repugnance. So he forced himself, although he suffered horribly, to take no notice of the sly looks of the waiter as he listened to his horrible lingo. He was not discouraged, and went on obstinately constructing ponderous, formless sentences and repeating them until he was understood. He set out to look for dinner. As usual, when he had an idea in his head, he saw nothing of what was going on about him. During that first walk, his only impression of Paris was that of an old and ill-kept town, Christophe was accustomed to the towns of the new German Empire. They were both very old and very young, towns in which there is expressed a new birth of pride, and he was unpleasantly surprised by the shabby streets, the muddy roads, the hustling people, the confused traffic, vehicles of every sort and shape, venerable horse omnibuses, steam trams, electric trams, all sorts of trams, booths on the pavements merry-go-round of wooden horses, or monsters and gargoyles, in the squares that were choked up with the statues of gentlemen in frock coats, all sorts of relics of a town in the Middle Ages endowed with the privilege of universal suffrage, but quite incapable of breaking free from its old vagabond existence. The fog of the preceding day had turned to a light, soaking rain. In many of the shops, the gas was lit, although it was past ten o'clock. Christophe lost his way in the labyrinth of streets round the Place de Victoire, but eventually found the shop he was looking for in the Rue de la Banque. As he entered, he thought he saw Diener at the back of the long, dark shop, arranging packages of goods, together with some of the assistants. But he was a little short-sighted and could not trust his eyes, although it was very rarely that they deceived him. There was a general movement among the people at the back of the shop when Christophe gave his name to the clerk who approached him, and after a confabulation, a young man stepped forward from the group and said in German, Her dinner is out. Out? For long? I think so. He has just gone. Christophe thought for a moment, then he said, Very well, I will wait. The clerk was taken aback, and hastened to add, "'But he won't be back before two or three. "'Oh, that's nothing,' replied Christophe calmly. "'I haven't anything to do in Paris. "'I can wait all day if need be.' The young man looked at him in amazement and thought he was choking. But Christophe had forgotten him already. He sat down quietly in a corner with his back turned towards the street, and it looked as though he intended to stay. The clerk went back to the end of the shop and whispered to his colleagues. They were most comically distressed, and cast about for some means of getting rid of the insistent Christophe. After a few uneasy moments, the door of the office was opened, and Hid and Diner appeared. He had a large red face, marked with a purple scar down his cheek and chin, a fair mustache, smooth hair parted on one side, a gold-rimmed eyeglass, gold studs in a shirt front, and rings on his fat fingers. He had his hat and an umbrella in his hands. 
he came up to Christophe in a nonchalant manner. Christophe, who was streaming as he sat, started with surprise. He seized Diener's hands and shouted with a noisy heartiness that made the assistants deader and Diener blush. That majestic personage had his reasons for not wishing to resume his former relationship with Christophe, and he had made up his mind from the first to keep him at a distance by a haughty manner. But he had no sooner come face to face with Christophe than he had felt like a little boy again in his presence. He was furious and ashamed. He muttered hurriedly. In my office. We shall be able to talk better there. Christophe recognized Diener's habitual prudence. But when they were in the office and the door was shut, Diener showed no eagerness to offer him a chair. He remained standing, making clumsy explanations. Very glad. I was just going out. They thought I had gone. But I must go. I have only a minute, a pressing appointment. Christophe understood that the clerk had lied to him, and that the lie had been arranged by Diener to get rid of him. His blood boiled, but he controlled himself and said dryly, There is no hurry. Diener drew himself up. He was shocked by such offhandedness. What? he said. No hurry. In business. Christophe looked him in the face. No. Diener looked away. He hated Christophe for having so put him to shame. He murmured irritably. Christophe cut him short. Come, he said. You know. He used to do, which maddened Diener, who from the first had been vainly trying to set up between Christophe and himself the barrier of the sea. You know why I am here? Yes, said Diener. I know. He had heard of Christophe's escapade and the warrant out against him from his friends. Then, Christophe went on, you know that I am not here for fun. I have to fly. I have nothing. I must live. Diener was waiting for that, for the request. He took it with a mixture of satisfaction, for it made it possible for him to feel the superiority over Christophe and embarrassment for he dared not make Christophe feel his superiority as much as he would have liked. Ah, he said pompously, it is very tiresome, very tiresome. Life here is hard. Everything is so dear. We have enormous expenses, and all these assistants. Christophe cut him short contemptuously. I am not asking for money. Dinner was abashed, Christophe went on. Is your business doing well? Have you many customers? Yes, yes, not bad, thank God, Diner said cautiously. He was on his guard. Christophe darted a look of fury at him and went on. You know many people in the German colony? Yes. Very well, speak for me. They must be musical. They have children. I will give them lessons. Diner was embarrassed at that. What is it? asked Christophe. Do you think I'm not competent to do the work? He was asking a service as though it were he who was rendering it. Diner, who would not have done a thing for Christophe except for the sake of putting him under an obligation, was resolved not to stir a finger for him. It isn't that. You're a thousand times too good for it. Only... What then? Well... You see, it's very difficult, very difficult, on account of your position. My position? Yes, you see, that affair, that, that warrant, if that were to be known, it is difficult for me. It might do me harm. He stopped as he saw Christophe's face go hot with anger, and he added quickly, No, not on my account. I am not afraid. Ah, if I were alone, but my uncle... You know, the business is his. I can do nothing without him. He grew more and more alarmed at Christophe's expression, and at the thought of the gathering explosion, he said hurriedly. He was not a bad fellow at bottom. Avarice and vanity were struggling in him. He would have liked to help Christophe at a price. Can I lend you fifty francs? Christophe went crimson. He went up to Diner, who stepped back hurriedly to the door and opened it and held himself in readiness to call for help if necessary. 
but Kristoff only thrust his face near his and bawled. You swine! And he flung himself aside and walked out through the little throng of assistants. At the door, he spat in disgust. He strode along down the street. He was blind with fury. The rain sobered him. Where was he going? He did not know. He did not know a soul. He stopped to think outside a bookshop, and he stared stupidly at the rows of books. He was struck by the name of a publisher on the cover of one of them. He wondered why. Then he remembered that it was the name of the house in which Sylvain Kahn was employed. He made a note of the address. But what was the good? He would not go. Why should he not go? If that scoundrel Diener, who had been his friend, had given him such a welcome, what had he to expect from a rascal who he had handled roughly, who had good cause to hate him? Fame humiliations. His blood boiled at the thought, but his native pessimism, derived perhaps by his Christian education, urged him to probe through the depths of human baseness. I have no right to stand in ceremony. I must try everything before I give in. And an inward voice added, And I shall not give in. He made sure of the address and went up to hunt Khan. He made up his mind to hit him in the eye at the first show of impertinence. The publishing house was in the neighborhood of Madeline. Christophe went up to a room on the second floor and asked for Sylvain Khan. A man in livery told him that Khan was not known. Christophe was taken aback and thought his pronunciation must be at fault, and he repeated his question, but the man listened attentively and repeated that no one of that name was known in the place. Quite out of countenance, Christophe begged pardon and was turning to go when a door at the end of the corridor opened, and he saw Khan himself showing a lady out. Still suffering from the affront put upon by Diener, he was inclined to think that everybody was having a joke at his expense. His first thought was that Khan had seen him and had given orders to the man to say that he was not there. His gorge rose at the imprudence of it. He was on the point of going in a huff when he heard his name. Khan, with a sharp eyes, had recognized him, and he ran up to him with a smile on his lips and his hands held out with every mark of extraordinary delight. Sylvain Kahn was short, thick-set, clean-shaven like an American. His complexion was too red, his hair too black. He had a heavy, massive face, coarse-featured, little darting wrinkled eyes, a rather crooked mouth, a heavy, cunning smile. He was modishly dressed, trying to cover up the defects of his figure, high shoulders and wide hips. That was the only thing that touched his vanity. He would have gladly have put up with any insult if only he could have been a few inches taller and of a better figure. For the rest, he was very well pleased with himself. He thought himself irresistible. And indeed he was. The little German Jew, Claude as he was, had made himself the chronicler and arbiter of Parisian fashion and smartness. He wrote insipid society paragraphs and articles in a delicately involved manner. He was the champion of French style, French smartness, French gallantry, French wit, regency, red heels, lauzun. People laughed at him, but that did not prevent his success. Those who say that in Paris ridicule kills do not know Paris. So far from dying of it, there are people who live on it. In Paris, ridicule leads to everything, even to fame and fortune. Sylvain Kahn was far beyond any need to reckon the goodwill that every day accumulated to him through his frank fortune affectations. He spoke with a thick accent through his nose. Ah, what a surprise! He cried gaily, taking Christophe's hand in his own clumsy paws with their stubby fingers that looked as though they were crammed into too tight a skin. He could not let go of Christophe's hands. It was as though he were encountering his best friend. Christophe was so staggered that he wondered again if Con was not making fun of him. But Con was doing nothing of the kind. 
or rather, if he was choking, it was no more than usual. There was no rancor about Khan. He was too clever for that. He had long ago forgotten the rough treatment he had suffered at Christophe's hand, and if ever he did remember it, it did not worry him. He was delighted to have the opportunity of showing his old schoolfellow his importance in his new duties, and the elegance of his Parisian manners. He was not lying in expressing his surprise. A visit from Christophe was the last thing in the world that he expected and if he was too worldly wise not to know that the visit was of set material purpose, he took it as a reason the more for welcoming him, as it was in fact a tribute to his power. "'And you have come from Germany? How was your mother?' he asked, with a familiarity which at any other time would have annoyed Christophe, but now gave him comfort in the strange city. "'But how was it?' asked Christophe who was still inclined to be suspicious, that they told me just now that her con did not belong here. Her con doesn't belong here, said Sylvain Con, laughing. My name isn't con now. My name is Hamilton. He broke off. Excuse me, he said. He went and shook hands with a lady who was passing and smiled grimacingly. Then he came back. He explained that the lady was a writer, famous for her voluptuous and passionate novels. The modern Sappho had a purple ribbon on her bosom, a full figure, bright golden hair on a painted face. She made a few pretentious remarks in a mannish fashion with the accent of a Franchet Comte. Khan played Christophe with questions. He asked about all the people at home and what had become of so and so, plumbing himself on the fact that he remembered everybody. Christophe had forgotten his antipathy. He replied cordially and gratefully, giving a mass of detail about which Khan cared nothing about at all, and presently he broke off again. Excuse me, he said, and he went to greet another lady who had come in. Dear me, said Christophe, are there only women writers in France? Khan began to laugh and said fatuously, France is a woman, my dear fellow. If you want to succeed, make up to the women. Christophe did not listen to the explanation, and went on with his own story. To put a stop to it, Con asked, But how the devil do you come here? Ah, thought Christophe, he doesn't know. That's why he was so amiable. He'll be different when he knows. He made it a point of honor to tell everything against himself. The brawl with the soldiers, the warrant out against him, his flight from the country. Con rocked with laughter. Bravo, he cried. Bravo, that is a good story. He shook Christophe's hand warmly. He was delighted by any smack in the eye of authority, and the story tickled him the more as he knew the heroes of it. He saw the funny side of it. I say, he said, it is past twelve. Will you give me the pleasure? Lunch with me? Christophe agreed gratefully, he thought. This is a good fellow, decidedly a good fellow. I was mistaken. They went out together. On the way, Christophe put forward his request. You see, I am placed. I came here to look for work, music lessons, until I can make my name. Could you speak for me? Certainly, said Con. To anyone you like. I know everybody here. I am at your service. He was glad to be able to show how important he was. Christophe covered him with expressions of gratitude. He felt that he was relieved of a great weight of anxiety. At lunch, he gorged with the appetite of a man who has not broken fast for two days. He tucked his napkin round his neck and ate with his knife. Con Hamilton was horribly shocked by his veracity and his peasant manners, and he was true too, by the small amount of attention that his guests gave to his bragging. He tried to dazzle him by telling him of his fine connections and his prosperity, but it was no good. Christophe did not listen, and bluntly interrupted him. His tongue was loose, and he became familiar. His heart was full, and he overwhelmed Con with the simple confidences of his plans for the future. Above all, 
he exasperated him by his insisting on taking his hand across the table and pressing it effusively and he brought him to the pitch of irritation at last by wanting to clink glasses with him in the german fashion and with sentimental speeches to drink to those at home and to vaterain khan saw to his horror that he was on the point of singing the people at the next table were casting ironic glances in their direction khan made some excuse on the score of pressing business and got up christophe clung to him he wanted to know when he could have a letter of introduction and go see someone and began giving lessons i'll see you about it today this evening said khan i'll talk to you at once you can be easy on that score when shall i know tomorrow or the day after very well i'll come back tomorrow no no said khan quickly i'll let you know don't you worry oh it's no trouble quite the contrary eh i've nothing else to do in paris in the meanwhile good god thought khan no he said aloud but i would rather write to you you wouldn't find me the next few days give me your address christophe dictated it good i'll write to you tomorrow 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 we can count on it he cut short christophe's hand shaking and escape ugh he thought what a bore as he went to the office he told the boy that he would not be in when the german came to see him ten minutes later he had forgotten him christophe went back to his lair he was full of gentle thoughts what a good fellow he thought how unjust i was about him and he bears me no ill will he was remorseful and he was on the point of writing to tell Khan how sorry he was to have misjudged him, and to beg his forgiveness for all the harm he had done him. The tears came to his eyes as he thought of it, but it was harder for him to write a letter than a score of music. And after he had cursed and cursed the pen and ink of the hotel, which were in fact horrible after he had blotted, criss-crossed, and torn up five or six sheets of paper, he lost patience and dropped it. The rest of the day he dragged warily, but Christophe was so worn out by his sleepless nights and his excursions in the morning that at length he dozed off in his chair. He only woke up in the evening, and then he went to bed. And he slept for twelve hours on end. End of section one. Section two of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Cannon. The Marketplace. Chapter 1. Part 2. Next day, from eight o'clock on, he sat waiting for the promised letter. He had no doubt of Khan's sincerity. He did not go out, telling himself that perhaps Khan would come round by the hotel on his way to his office. So as not to be out, about midday he had his lunch sent up from the eating-house downstairs. Then he sat waiting again. He was sure Khan would come on his way back from lunch. He paced up and down his room, sat down, paced up and down again, opened his door whenever he heard footsteps on the stairs. He had no desire to go walking about Paris to stay his anxiety. He lay down on his bed. His thoughts went back and back to his old mother, who was thinking of him, too. She alone thought of him. He had an infinite tenderness for her, and he was remorseful at having left her but he did not write to her he was waiting until he could tell her that he had found work in spite of the love they had for each other it would never have occurred to either of them to write just to tell their love letters were for things more definite than that he lay on his bed with his hands locked behind his head and dreamed although his room was away from the street the roar of Paris invaded the silence. The house shook. 
night came again and brought no letter came another day like unto the last on the third day exasperated by his voluntary seclusion christophe decided to go out but from the impression of his first evening he was instinctively in revolt against paris he had no desire to see anything no curiosity he was too much taken up with the problem of his own life to take any pleasure in watching the lives of others and the memories of life's past the monuments of a city had always left him cold and so hardly had he set foot out of doors than although he had made up his mind not to go near con for a week he went straight to his office the boy obeyed his orders and said that monsieur hamilton had left paris on business it was a blow to christophe he gasped and asked when monsieur hamilton would return the boy replied at random in ten days christophe went back utterly downcast and buried himself in his room during the following days he found it impossible to work his heart sank as he saw that his small supply of money the little sum that his mother had sent him carefully wrapped up in a handkerchief at the bottom of his bag was rapidly decreasing he imposed a severe regime on himself he only went down in the evening to dinner in the little pot-house where he quickly became known to the frequenters as the prussian or sauerkraut with frightful effort he wrote two or three letters to french musicians whose names he knew hazily one of them had been dead for ten years he asked them to be so kind as to give him a hearing his spelling was wild and his style was complicated by those long inversions and ceremonious formulae which are the custom in germany he addressed his letters to the palace of the academy of france the only man to read his gave it to his friends as a joke after a week christophe went once more to the publisher's office this time he was in luck he met sylvain cohn going out on the doorstep cohn made a face as he saw that he was caught but christophe was so happy that he did not see it he took his hands in the usual uncouth way and asked gaily you've been away did you have a good time Cohen said that he had had a very good time, but he did not unbend. Christophe went on. I came, you know. They uh, told you, I suppose. Well, any news? You uh, mentioned my name. What did they say? Cohen looked blank. Christophe was amazed at his frigid manner. He was not the same man. I uh, mentioned you, said Cohen, uh, but I haven't heard yet. I haven't had time. I've been very busy since I saw you, up to my ears in business. I don't know how I can get through. It is appalling. I shall be ill with it all. Aren't you well? asked Christophe, anxiously and solicitously. Cohn looked at him slyly and replied, Not at all well. I don't know what is the matter. The last few days I am very unwell. I am so sorry, said Christophe, taking his arm. Well, do be careful. You must rest. I am so sorry to have been a bother to you. You should have told me. What is the matter with you, really? He took Cone Sham excuses so seriously that the little Jew was hard put to hide his amusement and disarmed by his funny simplicity. Irony is so dear a pleasure to the Jews and a number of christians in paris are jewish in this respect that they are indulgent with boors and even with their enemies if they give them the opportunity of tasting it at their expense besides cohn was touched by christophe's interest in himself he felt inclined to help him i've got an idea he said while you are waiting for lessons would you care to do some work for a music publisher Christophe accepted eagerly. Uh, I've got the very thing, said Cohen. 
I know one of the partners in a big firm of music publishers, Daniel Hecht. I'll introduce you. You'll see what there is to do. I don't know anything about it, you know. But Hecht is a real musician. You get on with him, all right. They parted until the following day. Cohn was not sorry to be rid of Christoph by doing him this service. Next day, Christoph fetched Cohn at his office. On his advice, he had brought several of his compositions to show to Hecht. They found him in his music shop near the opera. Hecht did not put himself out when they went in. He coldly held out two fingers to take Cohn's hand, did not reply to Christoph's ceremonious bow, and at Cohn's request, he took them into the next room. He did not ask them to sit down. He stood with his back to the empty chimney-place and stared at the wall. Daniel Hecht was a man of forty, tall, cold, correctly dressed, a marked Phoenician type. He looked clever and disagreeable. There was a scowl on his face. He had black hair and a beard like that of an Assyrian king, long and square-cut. He hardly ever looked straightforward, and he had an icy, brutal way of talking which sounded insulting even when he only said, Good day. His insolence was more apparent than real. No doubt it emanated from a contemptuous strain in his character. But it was uh, more a part of the automatic and formal element in him. Jews of that sort are quite common. Opinion is not kind towards them. That hard stiffness of theirs is looked upon as arrogance, while it is often, in reality, the outcome of an incurable boorishness in body and soul. Sylvain Cohn introduced his protégé in a bantering, pretentious voice, with exaggerated praises. Christophe was abashed by his reception, and stood shifting from one foot to the other, holding his manuscripts and his hat in his hand. When Cohn finished, Hacht, who up to then had seemed to be unaware of Christophe's existence, turned towards him disdainfully and without looking at him said, Kraft, Christoph Kraft, never heard the name. To Christoph, it was as though he had been struck full in the chest. The blood rushed to his cheeks, he replied angrily, You'll hear it later on. Heck took no notice, and went on imperturbably, as though Christoph did not exist. Kraft, no, never heard of it. He was one of those people for whom not to be known to them is a mark against a man. He went on in German, And you come from the Rhineland? It's wonderful how many people there are there who dabble in music. But I don't think there is a man among them who has any claim to be a musician. He meant it as a joke, not as an insult. But Christoph did not take it so. He would have replied in kind if Cohn had not anticipated him. Oh, come, come, he said to Hecht. Oh, you must do me the justice to admit that I know nothing at all about it. That's to your credit, replied Hecht. If I am to be no musician in order to please you, said Christoph dryly, I'm sorry, but I'm not that. Hecht, looking aside, went on as indifferently as ever. You have written music. What have you written? Leder, I suppose? Leder. Two symphonies, symphonic poems, quartets, piano suites, theater music, said Christoph Boiling. People write a great deal in Germany, said Hecht with scornful politeness. It made him all the more suspicious of the newcomer to think that he had written so many works and that he, Daniel Hecht, had not heard of him. Well, he said, I might perhaps find work for you if... Uh, you are recommended by my friend Hamilton. At present we are making a collection, a library for young people, in which we are publishing some easy pianoforte pieces. Could you simplify the carnival by Schumann and arrange it for six and eight hands? Christoph was staggered. And you offer that to me? 
to me, me, his naive me delighted Kong, but Hecht was offended. I do not see that there is anything surprising in that, he said. It is not such easy work as all that. If you think it is too easy, so much the better. We'll see about that later on. You tell me you are a good musician. I must believe you. But I've never heard of you, he thought to himself. If one were to believe all these young sparks, uh, they would knock the stuffing out of Johannes Brahms himself. Christoph made no reply, for he had vowed to hold himself in check, clapped his hat on his head, and turned towards the door. Cohn stopped him laughing. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, he said. He turned to Hecht. He has brought you some of his work to give you an idea. Ah, said Hecht warily. Uh, very well, then. Uh, let's see them. Without a word, Christophe held out his manuscripts. Hecht cast his eyes over them carelessly. Uh, what's this? A suite for piano, reading. A day. Ah, always program music. In spite of his apparent indifference, he was reading carefully. He was an excellent musician and knew his job. He knew nothing outside it. With the first bar or two, he gauged his man. He was silent as he turned over the pages with a scornful air. He was struck by the talent revealed in them, but his natural reserve and his vanity, piqued by Christophe's manner, kept him from showing anything. He went on to the end in silence, not missing a note. Yes, he said in a patronizing tone of voice, they are well enough. Violent criticism would have hurt Christophe less. I don't need to be told that, he said irritably. I fancy, said Heck, that you showed me them for me to say what I thought. Not at all. Then, said Heck coldly, I fail to see what you have come for. I have come to ask for work and nothing else. I have nothing to offer you at the time being except what I told you, and I'm not sure of that. I said it was possible, that's all. And you have no other work to offer a musician like myself? A musician like you? said Hecht, ironically and cuttingly. Other musicians, at least as good as yourself, have not sought the work beneath their dignity. There are men whose names I could give you, men who are now very well known in Paris, who have been very grateful to me for it. They must have been fine, bellowed Christophe. He had already learned certain of the most useful words in the French language. You are wrong if you think you have to do with a man of that kidney. Do you think you can take me in this looking anywhere but at me? and clipping your words? You didn't even deign to acknowledge my bow when I came in. But what the hell are you treating me like that? Are you even a musician? Have you ever written anything? And you pretend to teach me how to write? Me, to whom writing is life, and you can find nothing better to offer me than you have read my music? than a hashing up of the great musicians, a filthy scribbling over their works to turn them into parlor tricks for little girls? You go to your Parisians who are rotten enough to be taught their work by you. I'd rather die first. It was impossible to stem his torrents of words. Heck said icily, Take it or leave it. Christophe went out and slammed the doors. Hex shrugged and said to Sylvain Cohn, who was laughing, He will come to it like the rest. At heart he valued Christophe. He was clever enough to feel not only the worth of a piece of work, but also the worth of a man. Behind Christophe's outburst he had marked a force, and he knew its rarity in the world of art more than anywhere else. But his vanity was ruffled by it. Nothing would ever induce him to admit himself in the wrong. He desired loyally to be just to Christophe, 
but he could not do it unless Christoph came in and groveled to him. He expected Christoph to return. His melancholy skepticism and his experience of men had told him how inevitably the will is weakened and worn down by poverty. End of section two. Section three of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rel. Jean Christophe in Paris. By Roman Roland. Translated by Gilbert Cannon. The Marketplace. Chapter One. Part Three. Christophe went home. Anger had given place to despair. He felt that he was lost. The frail prop on which he had counted had failed him. He had no doubt but that he had made a deadly enemy, not only of Hecht, but of Cohen, who had introduced him. He was in absolute solitude in a hostile city. Outside Diener and Cohen, he knew no one. His friend, Corinne, the beautiful actress whom he had met in Germany, was not in Paris. She was still touring abroad, in America, this time on her own account. The papers published clamatory descriptions of her travels. As for the little French governess, whom he had unwittingly robbed of her situation, the thought of her had long filled him with remorse. How often had he vowed that he would find her when he reached Paris? Footnote. See Jean Christophe Unos Revolt. But now that he was in Paris, he found that he had forgotten one important thing, her name. He could not remember it. He could only recollect her Christian name, Antoinette. And then, even if he remembered, how was he to find a poor little governess in that ant heap of human beings? He had to set to work as soon as possible to find a livelihood. He had five francs left. In spite of his dislike of him, he forced himself to ask the innkeeper if he did not know of anybody in the neighborhood to whom he could give music lessons. The innkeeper who had no great opinion of a lodger who only ate once a day and spoke German, lost what respect he had for him when he heard that he was only a musician. He was a Frenchman of the old school, and music was to him an idler's job. He scoffed. The piano. I don't know. You strum the piano. Congratulations. But tis a queer thing to take to that trade as a matter of taste. When I hear music, it's just for all the world like listening to the rain. But perhaps you might teach me. What do you say, you fellows? He cried, turning to some fellows who were drinking. They laughed loudly. It's a fine trade, said one of them. Not dirty work, and the ladies like it. Christophe did not rightly understand the French or the jest. He floundered for his words. He did not know whether to be angry or not. The innkeeper's wife took pity on him. Come, come, Philippe. You're not serious, she said to her husband. All the same, she went on, turning to Christophe. There is someone who might do for you. Who? asked her husband. The Cresset girl. You know, they've bought a piano. Ah, those stuck-up folk. So they have. They told Christophe that the girl in question was the daughter of a butcher. Her parents were trying to make a lady of her. They would perhaps like her to have lessons, if only for the sake of making people talk. The innkeeper's wife promised to see to it. Next day, she told Christophe that the butcher's wife would like to see him. He went to her house and found her in the shop, surrounded with great pieces of meat. She was a pretty, rather florid woman, and she smiled sweetly, but stood on her dignity when she heard why he had come. Quite abruptly, she came to the question of payment and said quickly that she did not wish to give much, because the piano is quite an agreeable thing, but not necessary. She offered him fifty centimes an hour. In any case, she would not pay more than four francs a week. After that, she asked Christophe a little doubtfully if he knew much about music. She was reassured, and became more amiable when he told her that not only did he know about music, but wrote it into the bargain. That flattered her vanity. It would be a good thing to spread about the neighborhood that her daughter was taking lessons with a composer. Next day, when Christophe found himself sitting by the piano, a horrible instrument, bought second-hand, which sounded like a guitar, 
with the butcher's little daughter, whose short, stubby fingers fumbled with the keys, who was unable to tell one note from another, who was bored to tears, who began at once to yawn in his face, and he had to submit to the mother's superintendence, and to her conversation, and to her ideas on music and the teaching of music. Then he felt so miserable, so wretchedly humiliated, that he had not even the strength to be angry about it. He relapsed into a state of despair. There were evenings when he could not eat. If in a few weeks he had fallen so low, where would he end? What good was it to have rebelled against Heck's offer? The thing to which he had submitted was even more degrading. One evening, as he sat in his room, he could not restrain his tears. He flung himself on his knees by his bed and prayed. To whom did he pray? To whom could he pray? He did not believe in God. He believed that there was no God. But he had to pray. He had to pray within his soul. Only the mean of spirit never need to pray. They never know the need that comes to the strong in spirit of taking refuge within the inner sanctuary of themselves. As he left behind him the humiliations of the day, in the vivid silence of his heart, Christoph felt the presence of his eternal being, of his God. The waters of his wretched life stirred and shifted above him and never touched him. What was there in common between that and him? All the sorrows of the world rushing on a destruction dashed against that rock. Christoph heard the blood beating in his veins, beating like an inward voice, crying, Eternal, I am, I am. Well, did he know that voice? As long as he could remember, he had heard it. Sometimes he forgot it. Often, for months together, he would lose consciousness of its mighty, monotonous rhythm. But he knew that it was there, that it never ceased, like the ocean roaring in the night. In the music of it, he found once more the same energy that he gained from it whenever he bathed in its waters. He rose to his feet. He was fortified. No, the hard life that he led contained nothing of which he need be ashamed. He could eat the bread he earned and never blush for it. It was for those who made him earn it at such a price to blush and be ashamed. Patience, patience, the time would come. But next day he began to lose patience again, and, in spite of all his efforts, he did at last explode angrily. One day during a lesson, at the silly little ninny, who had been maddeningly impertinent and laughed at his accent, and had taken a malicious delight in doing exactly the opposite of what he told her. The girl screamed in response to Christoph's angry shouts. She was frightened and enraged at a man whom she paid daring to show her no respect. She declared that he had struck her. Christoph had shaken her arm rather roughly. Her mother bounced in on them like a fury, and covered her daughter with kisses and Christoph with abuse. The butcher also appeared, and declared that he would not suffer any infernal Prussian to take upon himself to touch his daughter. Furious, pale with rage, itching to choke the life out of the butcher and his wife and daughter, Christoph rushed away. His host and hostess, seeing him come in in an abject condition, had no difficulty in worming the story out of him, and it fed the malevolence with which they regarded their neighbors. But by the evening, the whole neighborhood was saying that the German was a brute and a child-beater. Christoph made fresh advances to the music vendors, but in vain. He found the French lacking in cordiality, and the whirl and confusion of the perpetual agitation crushed him. They seemed to him to live in a state of anarchy, directed by a cunning and despotic bureaucracy. One evening... He was wandering along the boulevards, discouraged by the futility of his efforts, when he saw Sylvan Cohen coming from the opposite direction. He was convinced that they had quarreled irrevocably and looked away and tried to pass unnoticed. But Cohen called to him. What became of you after that great day? he asked with a laugh. I've been wanting to look you up, but I lost your address. Good Lord, my dear fellow, I didn't know you. You were epic. That's what you were. Epic. Christoph stared at him. He was surprised and a little ashamed. 
You're not angry with me? Angry? What an idea! So far from being angry, he had been delighted with the way in which Kristoff had trounced Hecht. It had been a treat to him. It really mattered nothing to him whether Kristoff or Hecht was right. He only regarded people as source of entertainment. And he saw in Kristoff a spring of high comedy, which he intended to exploit to the full. You should have come see me, he went on. I was expecting you. What are you doing this evening? Come to dinner? I won't let you off. Quite informal, just a few artists. We meet once a fortnight. You should know these people. Come, I'll introduce you. In vain did Christoph beg to be excused on the score of his clothes. Sylvan Cohen carried him off. They entered a restaurant on one of the boulevards and went up to the second floor. Christoph found himself among about thirty young men, whose ages ranged from twenty to thirty-five, and they were all engaged in animated discussion. Cohen introduced him as a man who had just escaped from a German prison. They paid no attention to him and did not stop their passionate discussion, and Cohen plunged into it at once. Christoph was shy in this select company and said nothing, but he was all ears. He could not grasp. He had great difficulty in following the volubility of the French. What great artistic interests were in dispute. He listened attentively, but he could only make out words like trust, monopoly, fall in prices, receipts, mixed up with phrases like the dignity of art and the rights of the author. And at last he saw that they were talking business. A certain number of authors, it appeared, belonged to a syndicate and were angry about certain attempts which had been made to float a rival concern, which, according to them, would dispute their monopoly of exploitation. The defection of certain of their members who had found it to their advantage to go over bag and baggage to the rival house had roused them to the wildest fury. They talked of decapitation, burnt, treachery, shame, sold. Others did not worry about the living. They were incensed against the dead, whose sales without royalties choked up the market. It appeared that the works of Des Musées had just become public property and were selling far too well. And so they demanded that the state should give them rigorous protection and heavily tax the masterpieces of the past so as to check their circulation at reduced prices, which, they declared, was unfair competition with the work of living artists. They stopped each other to hear the takings of such and such a theater on the preceding evening. They all went into ecstasies over the fortune of a veteran dramatist, famous in two continents, a man whom they despised, though they envied him even more. From the incomes of authors, they passed to those of the critics. They talked of the sum, pure calumny, no doubt, received by one of their colleagues for every first performance at one of the theaters on the boulevards, the consideration being that he should speak well of it. He was an honest man. Having made his bargain, he stuck to it. But his great secret lay, so they said, in so eulogizing the piece that it would be taken off as quickly as possible so that there might be many new plays. The tale, or the account, caused laughter, but nobody was surprised. And mingled with all that talk, they threw out fine phrases. They talked of poetry and art for art's sake. But through it all there rang art for money's sake, and this jobbing spirit, newly come into French literature, scandalized Christophe, as he understood nothing at all about the talk of money he had given it up. But then they began to talk of letters, or rather, of men of letters. Christophe pricked up his ears as he heard the name of Victor Hugo. They were debating whether he had been cuckold. They argued at length about the love of saint de Beuve and Madame Hugo, and then they turned to the lovers of George Sand and their respective merits. That was the chief occupation of criticism just then. When they had ransacked the houses of great men, rummaged through the closets, turned out the drawers, ransacked the cupboards, they borrowed down to their inmost lives. The attitude of Monsieur de Lausin, lying flat under the bed of the king and Madame de Montespan, was the attitude of criticism in its cult of history and truth. Everybody just then, of course, made a cult of truth. These young men were subscribers to the cult. No detail was too small for them in their search for truth. They applied it to the art of the present as well as to that of the past. 
and they analyzed the private life of certain of the more notorious of their contemporaries with the same passion for exactness it was a queer thing that they were possessed of the smallest details of scenes which are usually enacted without witnesses it was really as though the persons concerned had been the first to give exact information to the public out of their great devotion to the truth christophe was more and more embarrassed and tried to talk to his neighbors of something else but nobody listened to him at first they asked him a few vague questions about germany questions which to his amazement displayed the almost complete ignorance of these distinguished and apparently cultured young men concerning the most elementary things of their work literature and art outside paris at most they had heard of a few great names hopman suderman lieberman strauss david johann richard and they picked their way gingerly among them for fear of getting mixed if they had questioned christophe it was from politeness rather than from curiosity they had no curiosity they hardly seemed to notice his replies and they hurried back at once to the parisian topics which were regaling the rest of the company christophe timidly tried to talk of music not one of these men of letters was a musician at heart they considered music an inferior art but the growing success of music during the last few years had made them secretly uneasy and since it was the fashion they pretended to be interested in it they frothed especially about a new opera and declared that music dated from its performance or at least the new era in music this idea made things easy for their ignorance and snobbishness for it relieved them of the necessity of knowing anything else the author of the opera a parisian whose name christophe heard for the first time had said some made a clean sweep of all that had gone before him cleaned up renovated and recreated music christophe started at that he asked nothing better than to believe in genius but such a genius as that a genius who had at one swoop wiped out the past good heavens he must be a lusty lad how the devil had he done it he asked for particulars the others who would have been hard put to it to give any explanation and were disconcerted by christophe referred him to the musician of the company theophile gujart the great musical critic who began at once to talk of sevenths and ninths gujart knew music much as sconarella knew latin you don't know latin no with enthusiasm capricius architorum catalamus singularitur bonus bona bonum finding himself with a man who understood latin he prudently took refuge in the chatter of aesthetics from that impregnable fortress he began to bombard beethoven wagner and classical art which was not before the house but in france it is impossible to praise an artist without making as an offering a holocaust of all those who are unlike him he announced the advent of a new art which trampled underfoot the conventions of the past he spoke of a new musical language which had been discovered by the christopher columbus of parisian music and he said it made an end of the language of the classics that was a dead language christophe reserved his opinion of this reforming genius to wait until he had seen his work before he said anything but in spite of himself he felt an instinctive distrust of this musical ball to whom all music was sacrificed he was scandalized to hear the master so spoken of and he forgot that he had said much the same sort of thing in germany he who at home had thought himself a revolutionary in art he who had scandalized others by the boldness of his judgments and the frankness of his expressions felt as soon as he heard these words spoken in france that he was at heart a conservative he tried to argue and was tactless enough to speak not like a man of culture who advances arguments without exposition but as a professional bringing out disconcerting facts he did not hesitate to plunge into technical explanations and his voice as he talked struck a note which was well calculated to offend the ears of a company of superior persons to whom his arguments and the vigour with which he supported them were alike ridiculous the critic tried to demolish him with an attempt at wit and to end the discussion which had shown christophe to his stupefaction that he had to deal with a man who did not in the least know what he was talking about and so they came to the opinion that the german was pedantic and superannuated and without knowing anything about it they decided that his music was detestable but christophe's bizarre personality had made an impression on the company of young men and with their quickness in seizing on the ridiculous they had marked the awkward 
violent gestures of his thin arms with their enormous hands, and the furious glances that darted from his eyes as his voice rose to a falsetto. Sylvan Cohen saw to it that his friends were kept amused. Conversation had deserted literature in favor of women. As a matter of fact, there were only two aspects of the same subject, for their literature was concerned with nothing but women, and their women were concerned with nothing but literature. They were so much taken up with the affairs and men of letters. They spoke of one good lady, well known in Parisian society, who had, it was said, just married her lover to her daughter, the better to keep him. Christophe squirmed in his chair and tactlessly made a face of disgust. Cohen saw it and nudged his neighbor and pointed out that the subject seemed to excite the German, that no doubt he was longing to know the lady. Christophe blushed, muttered angrily, and finally said hotly that such women ought to be whipped. His proposition was received with a shout of Homeric laughter, and Sylvan Cohen cooingly protested that no man should touch a woman, even with a flower, etc., etc. In Paris he was the very knight of love. Christophe replied that a woman of that sort was neither more nor less than a bitch, and that there was only one remedy for vicious dogs, the whip. They roared at him. Christophe said that their gallantry was hypocritical, and that those who talked most of the respect for women were those who possessed the least of it, and he protested against these scandalous tales. They replied that there was no scandal in it, and that it was only natural, and they were all agreed that the heroine of the story was not only a charming woman, but the woman, par excellence. The German waxed indignant. Sylvan Cohen asked him slyly what he thought woman was like. Christoph felt that they were pulling his leg and laying a trap for him, but he fell straight into it in the violent expression of his convictions. He began to explain his ideas on love to these bantering Parisians. He could not find his words, floundered about after them, and finally fished up from the phrases he remembered such impossible words, such enormities, that he had all his hearers rocking with laughter while all the time he was perfectly and admirably serious, never bothered about them, and was touchingly impervious to the ridicule, for he could not help seeing that they were making fun of him. At last he tied himself up in a sentence, could not extricate himself, brought his fist down on the table, and was silent. They tried to bring him back into the discussion. He scowled and did not flinch, but sat with his elbows on the table, ashamed and irritated. He did not open his lips again, except to eat and drink, until the dinner was over. He drank enormously, unlike the Frenchmen, who only sipped their wine. His neighbor wickedly encouraged him, and went on filling his glass, which he emptied absently. But, although he was not used to these excesses, especially after the weeks of privation through which he had passed, he took his liquor well, and did not cut so ridiculous a figure as the others hoped. He sat there lost in thought. They paid no attention to him. They thought he was made drowsy by the wine. He was exhausted by the effort of following the conversation in French, and tired of hearing about nothing but literature, actors, authors, publishers, the chatter of the coulisses and literary life. Everything seemed to be reduced to that. Amid all these new faces and the buzz of words, he could not fix a single face, nor a single thought. His short-sighted eyes, dim and dreamy, wandered slowly round the table, and they rested on one man after another without seeming to see them, and yet he saw them better than any one, though he himself was not conscious of it. He did not, like these Jews and Frenchmen, peck at the things he saw and dissect them, tear them to rags, and leave them in tiny, tiny pieces. Slowly, like a sponge, he sucked up the essence of men and women and bore away their image in his soul. He seemed to have seen nothing and to remember nothing. It was only long afterwards, hours, often days, when he was alone, gazing in upon himself, that he saw that he had borne away a whole impression. But for the moment he seemed to be just a German boor, stuffing himself with food, concerned only with not missing a mouthful and he heard nothing clearly, except when he heard the others calling each other by name. And then, with a silly, drunken insistency, he wondered why so many Frenchmen have foreign names, Flemish, German, Jewish, Levantine, Anglo- or Spanish-American. He did not notice when they got up from the table. He went on, sitting alone, 
and he dreamed of the Rhenish hills, the great woods, the tilled fields, the meadows by the waterside, his old mother. Most of the others had gone. At last he thought of going, and got up, too, without looking at anybody, and went and took down his hat and cloak, which were hanging by the door. When he had put them on, he was turning away without saying good night, when through a half-open door he saw an object which fascinated him, a piano. He had not touched a musical instrument for weeks. He went in and lovingly touched the keys, sat down just as he was, with his hat on his head and his cloak on his shoulders, and began to play. He had altogether forgotten where he was. He did not notice that two men crept into the room to listen to him. One was Sylvan Cohen, a passionate lover of music. God knows why, for he knew nothing at all about it, and he liked bad music just as well as good. The other was the musical critic, Theophil Gujart. He, it simplifies matters so much, neither understood nor loved music, but that did not keep him from talking about it. On the contrary, nobody is so free in mind as the man who knows nothing of what he is talking about, for to such a man it does not matter whether he says one thing more than another. Theophil Gujart was tall, strong, and muscular. He had a black beard, thick curls on his forehead, which was lined with deep, inexpressible wrinkles, short arms, short legs, a big chest, a type of woodman or porter of the Auvergne. He had common manners and an arrogant way of speaking. He had gone into music through politics, at that time the only road to success in France. He had attached himself to the fortunes of a minister, to whom he had discovered that he was distantly related a son of the bastard of his apothecary. Ministers are not eternal, and when it seemed that the day of his minister was over, Theophil Gujart deserted the ship, taking with him all that he could lay his hands on, notably several orders, for he loved glory. Tired of politics, in which for some time past he had received various snubs, both on his own account and on that of his patron, he looked out for a shelter from the storm a restful position in which he could annoy others without being himself annoyed. Everything pointed to criticism. Just at that moment there fell vacant the post of musical critic to one of the great Parisian papers. The previous holder of the post, a young and talented composer, had been dismissed because he insisted on saying what he thought of the authors and their work. Gujart had never taken any interest in music and knew nothing at all about it. He was chosen without a moment's hesitation. They had had enough of competent critics. With Gujart, there was at least nothing to fear. He did not attach an absurd importance to his opinions. He was always at the editor's orders and ready to comply with a slashing article or enthusiastic approbation. That he was no musician was a secondary consideration. Everybody in France knows a little about music. Gujart quickly acquired the requisite knowledge. His method was quite simple. It consisted in sitting at every concert next to some good musician, a composer if possible, and getting him to say what he thought of the works performed. At the end of a few months of this apprenticeship, he knew his job. The fledging could fly. He did not, it is true, soar like an eagle. And God knows what howlers Gujart committed with the greatest show of authority in his paper. He listened and read haphazard, stirred the mixture up well in his sluggish brains, and arrogantly laid down the law for others. He wrote in a pretentious style, interlarded with puns, and plastered over with an aggressive pedantry. He had the mind of a schoolmaster. Sometimes, every now and then, he drew down on himself cruel replies. Then he shammed dead, and took good care not to answer them. He was a mixture of cunning and thick-headedness, insolent or groveling as circumstances demanded. He cringed to the masters who had an official position or an established fame. He had no other means of judging merit in music. He scorned everybody else and exploited writers who were starving. He was no fool. In spite of his reputation and the authority he had acquired, he knew in his heart of hearts that he knew nothing about music, and he recognized that Christoph knew a great deal about it. Nothing would have induced him to say so, but it was borne in upon him. And now he heard Christoph play, and he made great efforts to understand him, looking absorbed, profound, without a thought in his head. He could not see a yard ahead of him through the fog of sound, 
and he wagged his head solemnly as one who knew and adjusted the outward and visible signs of his approval to the fluttering of the eyelids of Sylvan Cohen, who found it hard to stand still. At last, Christoph, emerging to consciousness from the fumes of wine and music, became dimly aware of the pantomime going on behind his back. He turned and saw the two amateurs of music. They rushed at him and violently shook hands with him, Sylvan Cohen gurgling that he had played like a god, Gujart declaring solemnly that he had the left hand of Rubinstein and the right hand of Paderewski, or it might be the other way round. Both agreed that such talent ought not to be hid under a bushel, and they pledged themselves to reveal it. And, incidentally, they were both resolved to extract from it as much honor and profit as possible. From that day on, Sylvan Cohen took to inviting Christoph to his rooms, and put at his disposal his excellent piano, which he never used himself. Christoph, who was bursting with suppressed music, did not need to be urged, and accepted, and for a time he made good use of the invitation. At first all went well. Christoph was only too happy to play, and Sylvan Cohen was tactful enough to leave him to play in peace. He enjoyed it thoroughly himself. By one of those queer phenomena which must be in everybody's observation, the man, who was no musician, no artist, cold-hearted and devoid of all poetic feeling and real kindness, was enslaved sensually by Christoph's music, which he did not understand, though he found in it a strongly voluptuous pleasure. Unfortunately, he could not hold his tongue. He had to talk, loudly, while Christoph was playing. He had to underline the music with affected exclamations, like a concert snob, or else he passed ridiculous comment on it. Then Christoph would thump the piano and declare that he could not go on like that. Cohen would try hard to be silent, but he could not do it. At once he would begin again to sniffle, sigh, whistle, beat time, hum, imitate the various instruments. And when the piece was ended, he would have burst if he had not given Christoph the benefit of his inept comment. He was a queer mixture of German sentimentality, Parisian humbug, and intolerable fatuousness. Sometimes he expressed second-hand precious opinions, sometimes he made extravagant comparisons, and then he would make dirty, obscene remarks, or propound some insane nonsense. By way of praising Beethoven, he would point out some trickery, or read a lascivious sensuality into his music. The quartet in C minor seemed to him jolly spicy. The sublime, adagio of the Ninth Symphony, made him think of Carabino. After the three crashing chords at the opening of the Symphony in C minor, he called out, Don't come in! I've someone here! He admired the battle of Heldenleben because he pretended that it was like the noise of a motor car. And always he had some image to explain each piece, a puerile, incongruous image. Really, it seemed impossible that he could have any love for music. However, there was no doubt about it. He really did love it. At certain passages to which he attached the most ridiculous meanings, the tears would come into his eyes. But after having been moved by a scene from Wagner, he would strum out a gallop of Offenbach or sing some music hall ditty after the Ode to Joy. Then Christoph would bob about and roar with rage. But the worst of all to bear was not when Sylvan Cohn was absurd, so much as when he was trying to be profound and subtle, when he was trying to impress Christoph, when it was Hamilton speaking, and not Sylvan Cohen. Then Christoph would scowl blackly at him, and squash him with cold contempt, which hurt Hamilton's vanity. Very often, these musical evenings would end in a quarrel, but Cohen would forget it next day, and Christoph, sorry for his rudeness, would make a point of going back. That would not have mattered much if Cohen had been able to refrain from inviting his friends to hear Christoph. But he could not help wanting to show off his musician. The first time Christoph found in Cohen's rooms three or four little Jews and Cohen's mistress, a large floored woman, all paint and powder, who repeated idiotic jokes and talked about her food and thought herself a musician because she showed her legs every evening in the revue of the Varietés, Christoph looked black. Next time, he told Sylvan Cohen curtly that he would never again play in his rooms. Sylvan Cohen swore by all his gods that he would not invite anybody again. But he did so by stealth and hid his guests in the next room. Naturally, 
Christoph found that out and went away in a fury and this time did not return. And yet he had to accommodate Cohen, who had introduced him to various cosmopolitan families and found him pupils. End of section three. Section four of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Cannon. Chapter four. Marketplace one. Part four. A few days after, Théophile Goujat hunted Christophe up in his lair. He did not seem to mind his being in such a horrible place. On the contrary, he was charming. He said, I thought perhaps you would like to hear a little music from time to time, and as I have tickets for everything, I came to ask if you would care to come with me. Christophe was delighted. He was glad of the kindly attention, and thanked him effusively. Goujat was a different man from what he had been at their first meeting. He had dropped his conceit, and, man to man, he was timid, docile, anxious to learn. It was only when they were with others that he resumed his superior manner and his blatant tone of voice. His eagerness to learn had a practical side to it, he had no curiosity about anything that was not actual. He wanted to know what Christophe thought of a score he had received, which he would have been hard put to it to write about, for he could hardly read a note. They went to a symphony concert. They had to go in by the entrance to a music hall. They went down a winding passage to an ill-ventilated hall. The air was stifling. The seats were very narrow, and placed too close together. Part of the audience was standing, and blocking up every way out, the uncomfortable French. A man who looked as though he were hopelessly bored was racing through a Beethoven symphony as though he were in a hurry to get to the end of it. The voluptuous strains of a stomach dance coming from the music hall next door were mingled with the funeral march of the Eroica. People kept coming in and taking their seats, and turning their glasses on the audience. As soon as the last person had arrived, they began to go out again. Christophe strained every nerve to try and follow the thread of the symphony through the babble, and he did manage to wrest some pleasure from it, for the orchestra was skilful, and Christophe had been deprived of symphony music for a long time and then Goujat took his arm, and, in the middle of the concert, said, "'Now let us go. We'll go to another concert.' Christophe frowned, but he made no reply, and followed his guide. They went half across Paris, and then reached another hall that smelled of stables, in which, at other times, fairy plays and popular pieces were given." In Paris, music is like those poor working men who share a lodging. When one of them leaves the bed, the other creeps into the warm sheets. No air, of course. Since the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, the French have considered air unhealthy. And the ventilation of the theatres, like that of old at Versailles, makes it impossible for people to breathe. A noble old man, waving his arms like a lion-tamer, was letting loose an act of Wagner. The wretched beast, the act, was like the lions of a menagerie, dazzled and cowed by the footlights, so that they have to be whipped to be reminded that they are lions. The audience consisted of female Pharisees and foolish women smiling inanely. After the lion had gone through its performance and the tamer had bowed, and they had both been rewarded by the applause of the audience, Goujat suggested that they should go to yet another concert. But this time Christophe gripped the arms of his stall and declared that he would not budge. He had had enough of running from concert to concert, picking up the crumbs of a symphony and scraps of a concert on the way. 
in vain did goujat try to explain to him that musical criticism in paris was a trade in which it was more important to see than to hear christophe protested that music was not written to be heard in a cab and needed more concentration such a hodgepodge of concerts was sickening to him one at a time was enough for him he was much surprised at the extraordinary number of concerts in Paris. Like most Germans, he thought that music held a subordinate place in France, and he expected that it would be served up in small, delicate portions. By way of a beginning, he was given fifteen concerts in seven days. There was one for every evening in the week, and often two or three an evening at the same time in different quarters of the city on sundays there were four all at the same time christophe marvelled at this appetite for music and he was no less amazed at the length of the programmes till then he had thought that his fellow-countrymen had a monopoly of these orgies of sound which had more than once disgusted him in germany he saw now that the parisians could have given them points in the matter of gluttony they were given full measure two symphonies a concerto one or two overtures an act from an opera and they came from all sources german russian scandinavian french beer champagne orgiat wine they gulped down everything without winking christophe was amazed that these indolent parisians should have had such capacious stomachs they did not suffer for it at all it was the cask of the danaides it held nothing it was not long before christophe perceived that this mass of music amounted to very little really he saw the same faces and heard the same pieces at every concert their copious programmes moved in a circle practically nothing earlier than beethoven practically nothing later than wagner and what gaps between them it seemed as though music were reduced to five or six great german names three or four french names and since the franco-russian alliance half a dozen muscovites none of the old french masters none of the great italians none of the german giants of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries no contemporary german music with the single exception of richard strauss who was more acute than the rest and came once a year to plant his new works on the parisian public no belgian music no czech music but most surprising of all practically no contemporary french music and yet everybody was talking about it mysteriously as a thing that would revolutionize the world Christoph was yearning for an opportunity of hearing it. He was very curious about it, and absolutely without prejudice. He was longing to hear new music and to admire the works of genius, but he never succeeded in hearing any of it, for he did not count a few short pieces, quite cleverly written, but cold and brain-spun, to which he had not listened very attentively. While he was waiting to form an opinion, Christophe tried to find out something about it from musical criticism. That was not easy. It was like the court of King Peto. Not only did the various papers lightly contradict each other, but they contradicted themselves in different articles, almost on different pages. To read them all was enough to drive a man crazy fortunately the critics only read their own articles and the public did not read any of them but christophe who wanted to gain a clear idea about french musicians laboured hard to omit nothing and he marvelled at the agility of the critics who darted about in a sea of contradictions like fish in water but amid all these divergent opinions one thing struck him the pedantic manner of most of the critics who was it said that the french were amiable fantastics who believed in nothing those whom christophe saw were more hag ridden by the science of music even when they knew nothing than all the critics on the other side of the rhine 
at that time the french musical critics had set about learning what music was there were even a few who knew something about it they were men of original thought who had taken the trouble to think about their art and to think for themselves naturally they were not very well known they were shelved in their little reviews with only one or two exceptions the newspapers were not for them they were honest men intelligent interesting sometimes driven by their isolation to paradox and the habit of thinking aloud in tolerance and garrulity the rest had hastily learned the rudiments of harmony and they stood gaping in wonder at their newly acquired knowledge like m jourdain when he learned the rules of grammar they marvelled at their knowledge d a da f a fa r a ra ah how fine it is ah how splendid it is to know something they only babbled of theme and counter-theme of harmonies and resultant sounds of consecutive ninths and tierce major when they had labelled the succeeding harmonies which made up a page of music they proudly mopped their brows they thought they had explained the music and almost believed that they had written it as a matter of fact they had only repeated it in school language like a boy making a grammatical analysis of a page of cicero but it was so difficult for the best of them to conceive music as a natural language of the soul that when they did not make it an adjunct to painting they dragged it into the outskirts of science and reduced it to the level of a problem in harmonic construction some who were learned enough took upon themselves to show a thing or two to past musicians they found fault with beethoven and rapped wagner over the knuckles they laughed openly at berlioz and gluck nothing existed for them just then but johann sebastian bach and claude debussy and bach who had lately been roundly abused was beginning to seem pedantic a periwig and in fine a hack quite distinguished men extolled rameau in mysterious terms rameau and couperin called the great there were tremendous conflicts waged between these learned men they were all musicians but as they all affected different styles each of them claimed that his was the only true style and cried raka to that of their colleagues they accused each other of sham writing and sham culture and hurled at each other's heads the words idealism and materialism symbolism and verism subjectivism and objectivism christoph thought it was hardly worth while leaving germany to find the squabbles of the germans in paris instead of being grateful for having good music presented in so many different fashions they would only tolerate their own particular fashion and a new lutrin a fierce war divided musicians into two hostile camps the camp of counterpoint and the camp of harmony like the gros boutien and the petit boutien one side maintained with acrimony that music should be read horizontally and the other that it should be read vertically one party would only hear of full sounding chords melting concatenations succulent harmonies they spoke of music as though it were a confectioner's shop the other party would not hear of the ear that trumpery organ being considered music was for them a lecture a parliamentary assembly in which all the orators spoke at once without bothering about their neighbours and went on talking until they had done if people could not hear so much the worse for them they could read their speeches next day in the official journal music was made to be read and not to be heard when Christophe first heard of this quarrel between the horizontalists and the verticalists, he thought they were all mad. 
when he was summoned to join in the fight between the army of succession and the army of superposition he replied with his usual formula which was very different from that of socia gentlemen i am everybody's enemy and when they insisted saying which matters most in music harmony or counterpoint he replied music show me what you have done they were all agreed about their own music these intrepid warriors who when they were not pummeling each other were whacking away at some dead master whose fame had endured too long were reconciled by the one passion which was common to them all an ardent musical patriotism france was to them the great musical nation they were perpetually proclaiming the decay of germany that did not hurt christophe he had declared so himself and therefore was not in a position to contradict them but he was a little surprised to hear of the supremacy of french music there was in fact very little trace of it in the past and yet french musicians maintained that their art had been admirable from the earliest period by way of glorifying french music they set to work to throw ridicule on the famous men of the last century with the exception of one master who was very good and very pure and a belgian having done that amount of slaughter they were free to admire the archaic masters who had been forgotten while a certain number of them were absolutely unknown unlike the lay schools of france which date the world from the french revolution the musicians regarded it as a chain of mighty mountains to be scaled before it could be possible to look back on the golden age of music the el dorado of art after a long eclipse the golden age was to emerge again the hard wall was to crumble away a magician of sound was to call forth in full flower a marvellous spring the old tree of music was to put forth young green leaves in the bed of harmony thousands of flowers were to open their smiling eyes upon the new dawn and silvery trickling springs were to bubble forth with the vernal sweet song of streams a very idyll christophe was delighted but when he looked at the bills of the parisian theatres he saw the names of meyerbeer gounod massenet and mascagni and leon cavallo names with which he was only too familiar and he asked his friends if all this brazen music with its girlish rapture its artificial flowers like nothing so much as a perfumery shop was the garden of armide that they had promised him they were hurt and protested if they were to be believed these things were the last vestiges of a moribund age no one attached any value to them but the fact remained that Cavalleria Rusticana flourished at the Opera Comique, and Pagliacci at the Opera. Massenet and Gounod were more frequently performed than anybody else, and the musical trinity, Mignon, Les Huguenots, and Faust, had safely crossed the bar of the thousandth performance. But these were only trivial accidents. There was no need to go and see them when some untoward fact upsets a theory nothing is more simple than to ignore it the french critics shut their eyes to these blatant works and to the public which applauded them and only a very little more was needed to make them ignore the whole music theatre in france the music theatre was to them a literary form and therefore impure being all literary men, they set a ban on literature. Any music that was expressive, descriptive, suggestive, in short, any music with any meaning, was condemned as impure. In every Frenchman there is a Robespierre. He must be forever chopping the head off something or somebody to purify it the great french critics only recognized pure music the rest they left to the rabble 
Christophe was rather mortified when he thought how vulgar his taste must be. But he found some comfort in the discovery that all these musicians who despise the theatre spent their time in writing for it. There was not one of them who did not compose operas. But no doubt that was also a trivial accident. They were to be judged as they desired by their pure music. Christophe looked about for their pure music. End of section four. Section five of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Cannon. Chapter 5. Marketplace 1. Part 5. Théophile Goujat took him to the concerts of a society dedicated to the national art. There the new glories of French music were elaborated and carefully hatched. It was a club, a little church, with several side chapels. Each chapel had its saint, each saint his devotees, who blackguarded the saint in the next chapel. It was some time before Christophe could differentiate between the various saints. Naturally enough, being accustomed to a very different sort of art, he was at first baffled by the new music and the more he thought he understood it, the farther was he from a real understanding. It all seemed to him to be bathed in a perpetual twilight. It was a dull grey ground on which were drawn lines, shading off and blurring into each other, sometimes starting from the mist and then sinking back into it again. Among all these lines there were stiff, crabbed and cramped designs as though they were drawn with a set square patterns with sharp corners like the elbow of a skinny woman there were patterns in curves floating and curling like the smoke of a cigar but they were all enveloped in the grey light did the sun never shine in france Christophe had only had rain and fog since his arrival, and was inclined to believe so. But it is the artist's business to create sunshine when the sun fails. These men lit up their little lanterns, it is true, but they were like the glow-worm's lamp, giving no warmth and very little light. The titles of their works were changed. They dealt with spring, the south, love, the joy of living, country walks. But the music never changed. It was uniformly soft, pale, enervated, anemic, wasting away. It was then the mode in France among the fastidious to whisper in music. And they were quite right, for as soon as they tried to talk aloud, they shouted. There was no mean. There was no alternative but distinguished somnolence and melodramatic declamation. Christophe shook off the drowsiness that was creeping over him and looked at his programme, and he was surprised to read that the little puffs of cloud floating across the grey sky claimed to represent certain definite things, for, in spite of theory, all their pure music was almost always programme music or at least music descriptive of a certain subject. It was in vain that they denounced literature. They needed the support of a literary crutch. Strange crutches they were, too, as a rule. Christophe observed the odd puerility of the subjects which they labored to depict. Orchards, kitchen gardens, farmyards, musical menageries, a whole zoo— some musicians transposed for orchestra or piano the pictures in the Louvre, or the frescoes of the opera. They turned into music Quip, Baudry, and Paul Potter. Explanatory notes helped the hearer to recognize the apple of Paris, a Dutch inn, or the crupper of a white horse. 
to christophe it was like the production of children obsessed by images who not knowing how to draw scribble down in their exercise books anything that comes into their heads and naively write down under it in large letters an inscription to the effect that it is a house or a tree but besides these blind image fanciers who saw with their ears there were the philosophers they discussed metaphysical problems in music their symphonies were composed of the struggle between abstract principles and stated symbols or religions and in their operas they affected to study the judicial and social questions of the day the declaration of the rights of woman and the citizen elaborated by the metaphysicians of the butte and the palais bourbon they did not shrink from bringing the question of divorce on to the platform together with the inquiry into the birth-rate and the separation of the church and state among them were to be found lay symbolists and clerical symbolists they introduced philosophic rag-pickers sociological grisset prophetic bakers and apostolic fishermen to the stage goethe spoke of the artists of his day who reproduced the ideas of kant in allegorical pictures the artists of christophe's day wrote sociology in semi-quavers zola nietzsche maderlinck barre Warre, mendes the gospel and the moulin rouge all fed the cistern whence the writers of operas and symphonies drew their ideas many of them intoxicated by the example of wagner cried and i too am a poet and with perfect assurance they tacked on to their music verses in rhyme or unrhymed written in the style of an elementary school or a decadent feuilleton all these thinkers and poets were partisans of pure music but they preferred talking about it to writing it and yet they did sometimes manage to write it then they wrote music that was not intended to say anything unfortunately they often succeeded their music was meaningless at least to christophe it is only fair to say that he had not the key to it in order to understand the music of a foreign nation a man must take the trouble to learn the language and not make up his mind beforehand that he knows it christophe like every good german thought he knew it that was excusable many frenchmen did not understand it any more than he like the germans of the time of louis the fourteenth who tried so hard to speak french that in the end they forgot their own language the french musicians of the nineteenth century had taken so much pains to unlearn their language that their music had become a foreign lingo it was only of recent years that a movement had sprung up to speak french in france they did not all succeed the force of habit was very strong and with a few exceptions their french was belgian or still smacked faintly of germany it was quite natural therefore that a german should be mistaken and declare with his usual assurance that it was very bad german and meant nothing since he could make nothing of it christophe was in exactly that case the symphonies of the French seemed to him to be abstract, dialectic, and musical themes were opposed and superposed arithmically in them. Their combinations and permutations might just as well have been expressed in figures or the letters of the alphabet. One man would construct a symphony on the progressive development of a sonorous formula which did not seem to be complete until the last page of the last movement so that for nine-tenths of the work it never advanced beyond the grub stage of its existence another would erect variations on a theme which was not stated until the end so that the symphony gradually descended from the complex to the simple they were very clever toys 
but a man would need to be both very old and very young to be able to enjoy them they had cost their inventors untold effort they took years to write a fantasy they worried their hair white in the search for new combinations of chords to express no matter new expressions as the organ creates the need they say so the expression must in the end create the idea the chief thing is that the expression should be novel novelty at all costs they had a morbid horror of anything that had been said the best of them were paralyzed by it all they seemed always to be keeping a fearful guard on themselves and crossing out what they had written wondering good lord where did i read that there are some musicians especially in germany who spend their time in piecing together other people's music the musicians of france were always looking out at every bar to see that they had not included in their catalogues melodies that had already been used by others and erasing erasing changing the shape of the note until it was like no known note and even ceased to be like a note at all but they did not take christophe in in vain did they muffle themselves up in a complicated language and make superhuman and prodigious efforts go into orchestral fits or cultivate inorganic harmonies an obsessing monotony declamations a la sarah bernhardt beginning in a minor key and going on for hours plodding along like mules half asleep along the edge of the slippery slope always under the mask christophe found the souls of these men cold weary horribly scented like gounod and massenet but even less natural and he repeated the unjust comment on the french of gluck let them be they always go back to their giddy-go-round only they did try so hard to be learned they took popular songs as themes for learned symphonies like dissertations for the sorbonne that was the great game at the time all sorts and kinds of popular songs songs of all nations were pressed into the service and they worked them up into things like the ninth symphony and the quartet of cesar frank only much more difficult a musician would conceive quite a simple air at once he would mix it up with another which meant nothing at all though it jarred hideously with the first and all these people were obviously so calm so perfectly balanced and there was a young conductor properly haggard and dressed for the part who produced these works he flung himself about darted lightnings made michel angelesque gestures as though he were summoning up the armies of beethoven or wagner the audience which was composed of society people was bored to tears though nothing would have induced them to renounce the honour of paying a high price for such a glorious boredom and there were young tyros who were only too glad to bring their school knowledge into play as they picked up the threads of the music and they applauded with an enthusiasm as frantic as the gestures of the conductor and the fearful noise of the music what rot said christophe for he was well up in parisian slang by now but it is easier to penetrate the mystery of parisian slang than the mystery of parisian music christophe judged it with the passion which he brought to bear on everything and the native incapacity of the germans to understand french art at least he was sincere and only asked to be put right if he was mistaken and he did not regard himself as bound by his judgment but left it open to any new impression that might alter it as matters stood he readily admitted that there was much talent in the music he heard interesting stuff certain odd happy rhythms and harmonies an assortment of fine materials mellow and brilliant 
glittering colors, a perpetual outpouring of invention and cleverness. Christophe was entertained by it and learned a thing or two. All these small masters had infinitely more freedom of thought than the musicians of Germany. They bravely left the high road and plunged through the woods. They did their best to lose themselves, but they were so clever that they could not manage it. Some of them found themselves on the road again in twenty yards. Others tired at once and stopped wherever they might be. There were a few who almost discovered new paths, but instead of following them up, they sat down at the edge of the wood and fell to musing under a tree. What they most lacked was willpower, force. They had all the gifts save one, vigor and life. And all their multifarious efforts were confusedly directed and were lost on the road. It was only rarely that these artists became conscious of the nature of their efforts, and could join forces to a common and a given end. It was the usual result of French anarchy, which wastes the enormous wealth of talent and good intentions, through the paralyzing influence of its uncertainty and contradictions. With hardly an exception, all the great French musicians— like Berlioz and Saint-Saëns, to mention only the most recent, have been hopelessly muddled, self-destructive, and forsworn for want of energy, want of faith, and above all, for want of an inward guide. Christophe, with the insolence and disdain of the latter-day German, thought, the french do no more than fritter away their energy in inventing things which they are incapable of using they need a master of another race a gluck or a napoleon to turn their revolutions to any account and he smiled at the notion of an eighteenth of brumaire end of section five The Marketplace Chapter 1 Part 6 of John Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canaan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canaan. The Marketplace Chapter 1 Part 6 and yet, in the midst of all this anarchy, there was a group striving to restore order and discipline to the minds of artists and public. By way of a beginning, they had taken a Latin name reminiscent of a clerical institution which had flourished thirteen or fourteen centuries ago at the time of the great invasion of the Goths and Vandals. Christophe was rather surprised at their going back so far. It was a good thing, certainly, to dominate one's generation but it looked as though a watchtower fourteen centuries high might be a little inconvenient and more suitable perhaps for observing the movements of the stars than those of the men of the present day. But Christophe was soon reassured when he saw that the sons of St. Gregory spent very little time on their tower. They only went up it to ring the bells and spent the rest of their time in the church below. It was some time before Christophe, who attended some of their services, saw that it was a Catholic cult. He had been sure at the outset that their rites were those of some little Protestant sect. The audience groveled, the disciples were pious, intolerant, aggressive on the smallest provocation. At their head was a man of a cold sort of purity, rather childish and willful, maintaining the integrity of his doctrine, religious, moral, and artistic, explaining in abstract terms the gospel of music to the small number of the elect, and calmly demanding pride and heresy. To these two states of mind he attributed every defect in art and every vice of humanity, the Renaissance, the Reformation, and present-day Judaism, which he lumped together in one category. The Jews of music were burned in effigy after being ignominiously dressed. The colossal handle was soundly trounced, only Johann Sebastian Bach attained salvation by the grace of the Lord, who recognized that he had been a Protestant, 
by mistake. The temple of the Rue Saint-Jacques fulfilled an apostolic function. Souls and music found salvation there. The rules of genius were taught there most methodically. Laborious pupils applied the formulas with infinite pains and absolute certainty. It looked as though by their pious labours that they were trying to regain the criminal levity of their ancestors, the Aubers, the Adams, and the trebly damaged, the diabolical Berlioz, the devil himself, Diabolus in Musica. With laudable ardour and a sincere piety, they spread the cult of the acknowledged masters. In ten years, the work they had to show was considerable. French music was transformed. Not only the French critics, but the musicians themselves had learned something about music. There were now composers and even virtuosi who were acquainted with the works of Bach. And that was not so common, even in Germany. But... Above all, a great effort had been made to combat the stay-at-home spirit of the French who will shut themselves up in their homes and cannot be induced to go out. So, their music lacks air. It is sealed chamber music, sofa music, music with no sort of vigour. Think of Beethoven composing as he strode across country, rushing down the hillsides, swinging along through sun and rain, terrifying the cattle with his wild shouts and gestures. There was no danger of the musicians of Paris upsetting their neighbours with the noise of their inspiration, like the bear of Bonn. When they composed, they muted the strings of their thought, and the heavy hangings of their rooms prevented any sound from outside breaking in upon them. The scholar had tried to let in fresh air, and had opened the windows upon the past, but only on the past— the windows were opened upon a courtyard, not into the street, and it was not much use. Hardly had they opened the windows than they closed the shutters, like old women afraid of catching cold, and there came up a gust or two of the Middle Ages. Bach, Palestrina, popular songs, but what was the good of that? The room still smelt of stale air, but really that suited them very well. They were afraid of the great modern draughts of air. And if they knew more than other people, they also denied more in art. Their music took on a doctrinal character. There was no relaxation. Their concerts were history lectures or a string of edifying examples. Advanced ideas became academic. The great Bach, he whose music is like a torrent, was received into the bosom of the church and then tamed. His music was submitted to a transformation in the minds of the scholar, very like the transformation to which the savagely sensual Bible has been submitted in the minds of the English. As for modern music, the doctrine promulgated was aristocratic and eclectic, an attempt to compound the distinctive characteristics of the three or four great periods of music from the 6th to the 20th century. If it had been possible to carry it out, the resulting music would have been like those hybrid structures raised by a viceroy of India on his return from his travels, with rare materials collected in every corner of the earth. But the good sense of the French saved them from any such barbarically erudite excesses. They carefully avoided any application of their theories. They treated them as Moliere treated his doctors. They took their prescriptions but did not carry them out. The best of them went their own way the rest of them contented themselves in practice with very intricate and difficult exercises in counterpoint. They called them sonatas, quartets, and symphonies. Sonata, what do you desire of me? The poor thing desired nothing at all except to be a sonata. The idea behind it was abstract and anonymous, heavy and joyless. So might a lawyer conceive an art. Christoph who had at first been by way of being pleased with the French for not liking Brahms, now thought that there were many, many little Brahms in France. These laborious, conscientious, honest journeymen had many qualities and virtues. Christophe left them edified, but bored to distraction. It was all very good. Very good. How fine it was outside. And yet... There were a few independent musicians in Paris, men belonging to no school. They alone were interesting to Christophe. 
It was only through them that he could gauge the vitality of the art. Schools and coteries only express some superficial fashion or manufactured theory, but the independent men, who stand apart, have more chance of really discovering the ideas of their race and time. It is true that that makes them all the more difficult for a foreigner to understand. That was, in fact, what happened when Christophe first heard the famous work which the French had so extravagantly praised, while some of them were announcing the coming of the greatest musical revolution of the last ten centuries. It was easy for them to talk about centuries. They knew hardly anything of any except their own. Théophile Gouillard and Sylvain Cohn took Christophe to the Opera Comique to hear Pelias and Mélisande. They were proud to display the opera to him, as proud as though they had written it themselves. They gave Christophe to understand that it would be the road to Damascus for him. And they went on eulogizing it even after the piece had begun. Christophe shut them up and listened intently. After the first act, he turned to Sylvain Cohn, who asked him with glittering eyes, Well, old man, what do you think of it? And he said, is it like that all through? Yes. But it's nothing. Cohn protested loudly and called him a Philistine. Nothing at all, said Christophe. No music, no development, no sequence, no cohesion. Very nice harmony, quite good orchestral effects. Quite good. But it's nothing. Nothing at all. He listened through the second act. Little by little the lantern gathered light and glowed, and he began to perceive something through the twilight. Yes, he could understand the sober-minded rebellion against the Wagnerian ideal which swamped the drama with floods of music, but he wondered, a little ironically, if the ideal of sacrifice did not mean the sacrifice of something which one does not happen to possess. He felt the easy fluency of the opera, the production of an effect with the minimum of trouble, the indolent renunciation of the sturdy effort shown in the vigorous Wagnerian structures, and he was quite struck by the unity of it, the simple, modest, rather dragging declamation, although it seemed monotonous to him and, to his German ears, it sounded false. And it even seemed to him that the more it aimed at truth, the more it showed how little the French language was suited to music. It is too logical, too precise, too definite, a world perfect in itself, but hermetically sealed. However, the attempt was interesting, and Christophe gladly sympathised with the spirit of revolt and reaction against the overemphasis and violence of Wagnerian art. The French composer seemed to have devoted his attention discreetly and ironically to all the things that sentiment and passion only whisper. He showed love and death inarticulate. It was only by the imperceptible throbbing of a melody, a little trill from the orchestra that was no more than a quivering of the corners of the lips, that the drama passing through the souls of the characters was brought home to the audience. It was as though the artist were fearful of letting himself go. He had the genius of taste, except at certain moments when the Massenet slumbering in the heart of every Frenchman awoke and waxed lyrical. Then there showed hair that was too golden, lips that were too red, the Lot's wife of the Third Republic playing the lover. But such moments were the exception. They were a relaxation of the writer's self-imposed restraint. Throughout the rest of the opera there reigned a delicate simplicity, a simplicity which was not so very simple, a deliberate simplicity, the subtle flower of an ancient society. That young barbarian Christoph only half liked it. The whole scheme of the play, the poem, worried him. He saw a middle-aged Parisienne posing childishly and having fairy tales told to her. It was not the Wagnerian sickliness, sentimental and clumsy, like a girl from the Rhine provinces. But the Franco-Belgian sickliness was not much better, with its simpering parlour tricks, the hair, the little father, the doves, and the whole trick of mystery for the delectation of society women. 
The soul of the Parisienne was mirrored in a little piece, which, like a flattening picture, showed the languid fatalism, the boudoir nirvana, the soft, sweet melancholy. Nowhere a trace of willpower. No one knew what he wanted. No one knew what he was doing. It's not my fault, it's not my fault, these grown-up children groaned, all through the five acts which took place in a perpetual half-light. Forests, caves, cellars, death chambers. Little seabirds struggled. Hardly even that. Poor little birds, pretty birds, soft pretty birds. They were so afraid of too much light, of the brutality of deeds, words, passions, life. Life is not soft and pretty. Life is no kid-glove matter. Christoph could hear in the distance the rumbling of cannon coming to batter down that worn-out civilization, that perishing little Greece. Was it that proud feeling of melancholy and pity that made him, in spite of all, sympathize with the opera? It interested him more than he would admit, although he went on telling Sylvain Cohn, as they left the theatre, that it was very fine, very fine, but lacking in schwung, impulse, and did not contain enough music for him. He was careful not to confound Pelias with the other music of the French. He was attracted by the lamp shining through the fog. And then he saw other lights, vivid and fantastic, flickering round it. His attention was caught by these will-o'-the-wisps. He would have liked to go near them to find out how it was that they shone, but they were not easy to catch. These independent musicians whom Christoph did not understand were not very approachable. They seemed to lack that great need of sympathy which possessed Christoph. With a few exceptions, they seemed to read very little, know very little, desire very little. They almost all lived in retirement, some outside Paris, others in Paris, but isolated by circumstances or purposely. Shut up in a narrow circle from pride, shyness, disgust, or apathy. There were very few of them, but they were split up into rival groups and could not tolerate each other. They were extremely susceptible and could not bear with their enemies or their rivals or even their friends when they dared to admire any other musician than themselves, or when they admired too coldly or too fervently or in too commonplace or too eccentric a manner. It was extremely difficult to please them. Every one of them had actually sanctioned a critic armed with letters patent who kept a jealous watch at the foot of the statue. Visitors were requested not to touch. They did not gain any greater understanding from being understood only by their little groups. They were deformed by the adulation and the opinion that their partisans and they themselves held of their work, and they lost grip of their art and their genius. Men with a pleasing fantasy thought themselves reformers, and Alexandrine artists posed as rivals of Wagner. They were almost all the victims of competition. Every day they had to leap a little higher than the day before, and especially higher than their rivals. These exercises in high jumping were not always successful and were certainly not attractive, except to professionals. They took no account of the public, and the public never bothered about them. Their art was out of touch with the people, music which was only fed from music. Now, Christoph was under the impression, rightly or wrongly, that there was no music that had a greater need of outside support than French music. That supple climbing plant needed a prop. It could not do without literature but did not find it in enough of the breath of life. French music was breathless, bloodless, willless. It was like a woman languishing for her lover. But, like a Byzantine empress, slender and feeble in body, laden with precious stones, it was surrounded with eunuchs, snobs, esthetes and critics. The nation was not musical, and the craze so much talked of during the last twenty years for Wagner Beethoven, Bach or Debussy never reached farther than a certain class. The enormous increase in the number of concerts, the flowing tide of music at all costs, found no real response in the development of public taste. 
it was just a fashionable craze confined to the few and leading them astray. There was only a handful of people who really loved music, and these were not the people who were most occupied with it, composers and critics. There are so few musicians in France who really love music. So thought Christophe, but it did not occur to him that this is the same everywhere, that even in Germany there are not many more real musicians, and that the people who matter in art are not the thousands who understand nothing about it, but the few who love it and serve it in proud humility. Had he ever set eyes on them in France? Creators and critics, the best of them were working in silence far from the racket, as Caesar Frank had done, and the most gifted composers of the day were doing, and a number of artists who would live out their lives in obscurity, so that some day in the future some journalist might have the glory of discovering them, and posing as their friend, and the little army of industrious and obscure men of learning who, without ambition and careless of their fame, were building stone by stone the greatness of the past history of France, or, being vowed to the musical education of the country, were preparing the greatness of France of the future. There were minds there whose wealth and liberty and world-wide curiosity would have attracted Christophe if he had been able to discover them. But at most he only caught a cursory glimpse of two or three of them. He only made their acquaintance in the villainous caricatures of their ideas. He saw only their defects copied and exaggerated by the apish mimics of art and the bagmen of the press. But what most disgusted him with these vulgarians of music was their formalism. They never seemed to consider anything but form. Feeling? Character? Life? Never a word of these. It never seemed to occur to them that every real musician lives in a world of sound as other men live in a visible world, and that his days are lived and borne onward by a flood of music. Music is the air he breathes, the sky above him. Nature wakes, answering music in its soul. His soul itself is music. Music is in all that it loves, hates, suffers, fears, hopes. And when the soul of a musician loves a beautiful body, it sees music in that too. The beloved eyes are not blue or brown or grey, they are music. Their tenderness is like caressing notes, like a delicious chord. That inward music is a thousand times more rich than the music that finds expression, and the instrument is inferior to the player. Genius is measured by power of life, by the power of evoking life through the imperfect instrument of art, but to how many men in France does that ever occur? To these chemists, music seems to be no more than the art of resolving sounds. They mistake the alphabet for a book. Christophe shrugged his shoulders when he heard them say complacently that to understand art, it must be abstracted from the man. They were extraordinarily pleased with this paradox, for by it they fancied they were proving their own musical quality. And even Gouillard subscribed to it. Gouillard, the idiot who had never been able to understand how people managed to learn by heart a piece of music. He had tried to get Christophe to explain the mystery to him, and had tried to prove to him that Beethoven's greatness of soul and Wagner's sensuality had no more to do with their music than a painter's model has to do with his portraits. Christophe lost patience with him and said, that only proves that a beautiful body is of no more artistic value to you than a great passion. Poor fellow, you have no notion of the beauty given to a portrait by the beauty of a perfect face, or of the glow of beauty given to music by the beauty of the great soul which is mirrored in it. Poor fellow, you are interested only in the handiwork? So long as it is well done, you are not concerned with the meaning of a piece of work. Poor fellow! You are like those people who do not listen to what an orator says, but only to the sound of his voice, and watches his gestures without understanding them, and then say he speaks devilish well. Poor fellow, poor wretch, oh you rotten swine. But it was not only a particular theory that irritated Christoph; it was all their theories. He was appalled by their unending arguments, their Byzantine discussions, the everlasting talk, talk, talk of musicians about music and nothing else. 
it was enough to make the best of musicians heartily sick of music. Like Mazursky, Christoph thought that it would be as well for musicians every now and then to leave their counterpoint and harmony in favour of books or experience of life. Music is not enough for a present-day musician. Not thus will he dominate his age and raise his head above the stream of time. Life. All life. To see everything, to know everything, to feel everything, to love, to seek, to grasp truth. The lovely Penthesilia, queen of the Amazon, whose teeth bite in answer to a kiss. Away with your musical discussion societies, away with your chord factories. Not all the twaddle of the harmonic kitchens would ever help him to find a new harmony that was alive, alive and not a monstrous birth. He turned his back on these Dr. Wagners, brooding on their alembics to hatch out some homunculus in bottle, and, running away from French music, he sought to enter literary circles and Parisian society. Like many millions of people in France, Christophe made his first acquaintance with a modern French literate through the newspapers. He wanted to get the measure of Parisian thought as quickly as possible, and at the same time to perfect his knowledge of the language. And so he set himself conscientiously to read the papers, which he was told were most Parisian. On the first day, after a horrific chronicle of events, which filled several pages with paragraphs and snapshots, he read a story about a father and a daughter, a girl of fifteen. It was narrated as though it were a matter of course, and even rather moving. Next day, in the same paper, he read a story about a father and a son, a boy of twelve, and the girl was mixed up in it again. On the following day, he read a story about a brother and a sister. Next day, the story was about two sisters. On the fifth day, on the fifth day, he hurled the paper away with a shudder and said to Sylvain Cohn, But what's the matter with you all? Are you ill? Sylvain Cohn began to laugh and said, That is art. Christophe shrugged his shoulders. You're pulling my leg. Cohn laughed once more. Not at all. Read a little more. And he pointed to the report of a recent inquiry into art and morality, which set out that love sanctified everything, that sensuality was the leaven of art, that art could not be immoral, that morality was a convention of Jesuit education, and that nothing mattered except the greatness of desire. A number of letters from literary men witnessed the artistic purity of a novel depicting the life of bawds. Some of the signatories were amongst the greatest names in contemporary literature, or the most austere of critics. A domestic poet, bourgeois and a Catholic, gave his blessing as an artist to a detailed description of the decadence of the Greeks. There were enthusiastic praises of novels in which the course of lewdness was followed through the ages, Rome, Alexandria, Byzantium, the Italian and French Renaissance, the Age of Greatness. Nothing was omitted. Another cycle of studies was devoted to the various countries of the world. Conscientious writers had devoted their energies with a monkish patience to the study of the low quarters of the five continents, and it was no matter for surprise to discover that these geographers and historians of pleasure distinguished poets and very excellent writers. They were only marked out from the rest by their erudition. In their most impeccable style they told archaic stories, highly spiced. But what was most alarming was to see honest men and real artists, men who rightly enjoyed a high place in French literature, struggling in such a traffic for which they were not at all suited. Some of them, with great travail, wrote, like the rest, the sort of trash that the newspapers serialised. They had to produce it by a fixed time, once or twice a week, and it had been going on for years. They went on producing and producing, long after they had ceased to have anything to say, racking their brains to find something new, something more sensational, more bizarre, for the public was surfeited and sick of everything, and soon wearied of even the most wanton imaginary pleasures. They had always to go one better, better than the rest, better than their own best, and they squeezed out their very lifeblood, they squeezed out their guts, it was a pitiable sight, a grotesque spectacle. 
Christoph, who did not know the ins and outs of that melancholy traffic, and if he had known them would not have been more indulgent, for in his eyes nothing in the world could excuse an artist for selling his art for thirty pieces of silver. Not even to assure the well-being of those whom he loves. Not even then. All well, that is not human. It is not a question of being human. It is a question of being a man. Human. May God have mercy on your white-livered humanitarianism. It is so bloodless. No man loves twenty things at once. No man can serve many gods. Christoph, who in his hard-working life had hardly yet seen beyond the limits of his little German town, could have no idea that this artistic degradation which showed so rawly in Paris was common to nearly all the great towns and the hereditary prejudices of chaste Germany against Latin immorality awoke in him once more. And yet Sylvain Cohn might easily have pointed to what was going on by the banks of the Spree and the impurity of imperial Germany, where brutality made shame and degradation even more repulsive. But Sylvain Cohn never thought of it. He was no more shocked by that than by the life of Paris. He thought, ironically, every nation has its little ways. And the ways of the world in which he lived seemed so natural to him that Christoph could be excused for thinking it was in the nature of the people. And so, like so many of his compatriots, he saw in the secret sore which is eating away the intellectual aristocracies of Europe the vice proper to French art and the bankruptcy of the Latin races. Christophe was hurt by his first encounter with French literature, and it took him some time to get over it. And yet there were plenty of books which were not solely occupied with what one of these writers had nobly called the taste for fundamental entertainments. But he never laid hands on the best and finest of them. Such books were not written. For the like of Sylvain Cohn and his friends, they did not bother about them, and certainly Cohn and the rest never bothered about the better class of books. They ignored each other. Sylvain Cohn would never have thought of mentioning them to Christoph. He was quite sincerely convinced that his friends and himself were the incarnation of French art, and thought there was no talent, no art, no France, outside the men who have been consecrated as great by their opinion and the press of the boulevards. Christoph knew nothing about the poets who were the glory of French literature the very crown of France. Very few of the novelists reached him or emerged from the ocean of mediocre writers. A few books of Barres and Anatole France. But he was not sufficiently familiar with the language to be able to enjoy the universal dilettantism and erudition and irony of the one or the unequal but superior art of the other. He spent some time in watching the little orange trees in tubs growing in the hothouse of Anatole France and the delicate, perfect flowers clambering over the grave-like souls of Barres. He stayed for a moment or two before the genius, part sublime, part silly, of May Terlink. From that there issued a polite mysticism, monotonous, numbing like some vague sorrow. He shook himself and plunged into the heavy, sluggish stream, the muddy romanticism of Zola with whom he was already acquainted, and when he emerged from that, it was to sink back and drown in a deluge of literature. The submerged lands exhaled an odour de femina. The literature of the day teemed with effeminate men and women. It is well known that women should write if they are sincere enough to describe what no man has yet seen, the depths of the soul of a woman. But only very few dared to do that. Most of them only wrote to attract the men. They were as untruthful in their books as in their drawing-rooms. They jockeyed their facts and flirted with the reader. Since they were no longer religious and had no confessor to whom to tell their little lapses, they told them to the public. There was a perfect shower of novels, almost all scabrous, all affected, written in a sort of lisping style, a style scented with flowers and fine perfumes, sometimes too fine, sometimes not fine at all, and the eternal, stale, warm, sweetish smell. Their books reeked of it. Christoph thought, like Goethe, 
Let women do what they like with poetry and writing, but men must not write like women. That I cannot stand. He could not help being disgusted by their tricks, their sly coquetry, their sentimentality, which seemed to expend itself by preference upon creatures hardly worthy of interest, their style crammed with metaphor, their love-making and sensuality, their hotchpotch of subtlety and brutality. But Christoph was ready to admit that he was not in a position to judge. He was deafened by the row of this babel of words. It was impossible to hear the little fluting sounds that were drowned in it all. For even among such books as these there were some, for even among such books as these, there were some from the pages of which, behind all the nonsense, there shone the limpid sky and the harmonious outline of the hills of Attica, so much talent, so much grace, a sweet breath of life and charm of style, a thought like the voluptuous women or the languid boys of Perugino, and the young Raphael smiling with half-closed eyes at their dream of love. But Christoph was blind to that. Nothing could reveal to him the dominant tendencies, the currents of public opinion. Even a Frenchman would have been hard put to it to see them. And the only definite impression that he had at this time was that of a flood of writing which looked like a national disaster. It seemed as though everybody wrote. Men. Women. Children. Officers. Actors. Society people. Blackguards. It was an epidemic. For the time being, Christoph gave it up. He felt that such a guide as Sylvain Cohn must lead him hopelessly astray. His experience of a literary coterie in Germany gave him very properly a profound distrust of the people whom he met. It was impossible to know whether or no they only represented the opinion of a few hundred idle people, or even in certain cases, whether or no the author was his own public. The theatre gave a more exact idea of the society of Paris. It played an enormous part in the daily life of the city. It was an enormous kitchen, a pantagruelesque restaurant, which could not cope with the appetite of the two million inhabitants. There were thirty leading theatres without counting the local houses, cafe concerts, all sorts of shows, a hundred halls all giving performances every evening and, every evening, almost all full. A whole nation of actors and officials, vast sums were swallowed up in the gulf. The four state-aided theatres gave work to 3,000 people and cost the country 10 million francs. The whole of Paris re-echoed with the glory of the play-actors. It was impossible to go anywhere without seeing innumerable photographs, drawings, caricatures reproducing their features and mannerisms, gramophones reproducing their voices, and the newspapers their opinions on art and politics. They had special newspapers devoted to them. They published their heroic and domestic memoirs. These big, self-conscious children who spent their time in aping each other, these wonderful apes reigned and held sway over the Parisians, and the dramatic authors were their chief ministers. Christophe asked Sylvain Cohn to conduct him into the kingdom of shadows and reflections. End of the Marketplace Chapter 1 Part 6 of Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Rowland, translated by Gilbert Canaan, read by David Holmes. Section 7 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Cannon. Chapter 7. Marketplace 1. Part 7. But Sylvain Cohn was no safer as a guide in that world than in the world of books, and thanks to him, Christophe's first impression was almost as repulsive as that of his first essay in literature. It seemed that there was everywhere the same spirit of mental prostitution. The pleasure-mongers were divided into two schools. On the one hand, there was the good old way, the national way, of providing a coarse and unclean pleasure, 
quite frankly a delight in ugliness strong meat physical deformities a show of drawers barrack-room jests risky stories red pepper high game private rooms a uh, manly frankness as those people say who try to reconcile looseness and morality by pointing out that after four acts of dubious fun order is restored and the code triumphs by the fact that the wife is really with the husband whom she thinks she is deceiving so long as the law is observed then virtue is all right that vicious sort of virtue which defends marriage by endowing it with all the charm of lewdness the gallic way the other school was in the modern style it was much more subtle and much more disgusting the Parisianized Jews and the Judaicized Christians, who frequented the theatre, had introduced into it the usual hash of sentiment, which is the distinctive feature of a degenerate cosmopolitanism. Those sons who blushed for their fathers set themselves to abnegate their racial conscience, and they succeeded only too well having plucked out the soul that was their birthright all that was left them was a mixture of the moral and intellectual values of other races they made a macedoine of them an ola podrida it was their way of taking possession of them the men who were at that time in control of the theatres in paris were extraordinarily skilful at beating up filth and sentiment and giving virtue a flavouring of vice vice a flavouring of virtue and turning upside down every human relation of age sex the family and the affections their art therefore had an odour sui generis which smelt both good and bad at once that is to say it smelled very bad indeed they called it amoralism one of their favourite heroes at that time was the amorous old man their theatres presented a rich gallery of portraits of the type and in painting it they introduced a thousand pretty touches sometimes the sexagenarian hero would take his daughter into his confidence and talk to her about his mistress and she would talk about her lovers and they would give each other friendly advice the kindly father would aid his daughter in her indiscretions and the precious daughter would intervene with the unfaithful mistress beg her to return and bring her back to the fold sometimes the good old man would listen to the confidences of his mistress he would talk to her about her lovers or if nothing better was forthcoming he would listen to the tale of her gallantries and even take a delight in them and there were portraits of lovers distinguished gentlemen who presided in the houses of their former mistresses and helped them in their nefarious business society women were thieves the men were bawds the girls were lesbian and all these things happened in the highest society the society of rich people the only society that mattered for that made it possible to offer the patrons of the theatre damaged goods under cover of the delights of luxury so tricked out it was displayed in the market to the joy of old gentlemen and young women and it all reeked of death and the seraglio their style was not less mixed than their sentiments they had invented a composite jargon of expressions from all classes of society and every country under the sun pedantic slangy classical lyrical precious prurient and low a mixture of bawdy jests affectations coarseness and wit all of which seemed to have a foreign accent ironical and gifted with a certain clownish humour they had not much natural wit but they were clever enough and they manufactured their goods in imitation of paris if the stone was not always of the first water and if the setting was always strange and overdone at least it shone in artificial light and that was all it was meant to do they were intelligent keen though short-sighted observers 
their eyes had been dulled by centuries of the life of the counting-house turning the magnifying glass on human sentiments enlarging small things not seeing big things with a marked predilection for finery they were incapable of depicting anything but what seemed to their upstart snobbishness the ideal of polite society a little group of worn-out rakes and adventurers who quarrelled among themselves for the possession of certain stolen monies and a few virtuous females and yet upon occasion the real nature of these jewish writers would suddenly awake come to the surface from the depths of their being in response to some mysterious echo called forth by some vivid word or sensation then there appeared a strange hodgepodge of ages and races a breath of wind from the desert bringing over the seas to their parisian rooms the musty smell of a turkish bazaar the dazzling shimmer of the sands the mirage blind sensuality savage invective nervous disorder only a hair's breadth away from epilepsy a destructive frenzy samson suddenly rising like a lion after ages of squatting in the shade and savagely tearing down the columns of the temple which comes crashing down on himself and on his enemies christophe blew his nose and said to sylvain Cohn, there is power in it but it stinks that's enough let's go and see something else what asked sylvain Cohn. France. That's it, said Cohn. Can't be, replied Christophe. France isn't like that. It's France and Germany, too. I don't believe it. A nation that was anything like that wouldn't last for twenty years. Why, it's decomposing already. There must be something else. There's nothing better. There must be something else, insisted Christophe. Oh, yes, said Sylvain Cohn. We have fine people, of course, and theatres for them, too. Is that what you want? We can give you that. He took Christophe to the Théâtre Français. That evening they happened to be playing a modern comedy, in prose, dealing with some legal problem. From the very beginning Christophe was baffled to make out in what sort of world the action was taking place. The voices of the actors were out of all reason, full, solemn, slow, formal. They rounded every syllable as though they were giving a lesson in elocution, and they seemed always to be scanning alexandrines with tragic pauses. Their gestures were solemn and almost hieratic. The heroine, who wore her gown as though it were a Greek peplus, with arm uplifted and head lowered, was nothing else but Antigone, and she smiled with a smile of eternal sacrifice, carefully modulating the lower notes of her beautiful contralto voice. The heavy father walked about like a fencing master, with automatic gestures, a funereal dignity, romanticism in a frock-coat the juvenile lead gulped and gasped and squeezed out a sob or two the piece was written in the style of a tragic serial story abstract phrases bureaucratic epithets academic paraphrases no movement not a sound unrehearsed from beginning to end it was clockwork a set problem a scenario the skeleton of a play with not a scrap of flesh only literary phrases timid ideas lay behind discussions that were meant to be bold the whole spirit of the thing was hopelessly middle class and respectable the heroine had divorced an unworthy husband by whom she had had a child and she had married a good man whom she loved the point was that even in such a case as this divorce was condemned by nature as it is by prejudice nothing could be easier than to prove it the author contrived that the woman should be surprised for one occasion only into yielding to the first husband after that instead of a perfectly natural remorse perhaps a profound sense of shame 
together with a greater desire to love and honor the second and good husband the author trotted out an heroic case of conscience altogether beyond nature french writers never seem to be on good terms with virtue they always force the note when they talk of it they make it quite incredible they always seem to be dealing with the heroes of cornell and tragedy kings and are they not kings and queens these millionaire heroes and these heroines who would not be interesting unless they had at least a mansion in paris and two or three country houses for such writers and such a public wealth itself is a beauty and almost a virtue the audience was even more amazing than the play they were never bored by all the tiresomely repeated improbabilities they laughed at the good points when the actors said things that were meant to be laughed at it was made obvious that they were coming so that the audience could be ready to laugh they mopped their eyes and coughed and were deeply moved when the puppets gasped and gulped and roared and fainted away in accordance with the hallowed tragic ritual and people say the french are gay exclaimed christophe as they left the theatre there's a time for everything said sylvain cohn chaffingly you wanted virtue you see there's still virtue in france but that's not virtue cried christophe that's rhetoric in france said sylvain cohn virtue in the theatre is always rhetorical a praetorium virtue said christophe and the prize goes to the best talker i hate lawyers have you no poets in france sylvain cohn took him to the poetic drama there were poets in france there were even great poets but the theatre was not for them it was for the versifiers the theatre is to poetry what the opera is to music as berlioz said sicut amore lupinar christophe saw princesses who were virtuously promiscuous who prostituted themselves for their honor who were compared with christ ascending calvary friends who deceived their friends out of devotion to them glorified triangular relations heroic cuckoldry the cuckold like the blessed prostitute had become a european commodity the example of king mark had turned the heads of the poets like the stag of saint Hubert. the cuckold never appeared without a halo and christophe saw also lovely damsels torn between passion and duty their passion bade them follow a new lover duty bade them stay with the old one an old man who gave them money and was deceived by them and in the end they plumped heroically for duty christophe could not see how duty differed from sordid interest but the public was satisfied the word duty was enough for them they did not insist on having the thing itself they took the author's word for it the summit of art was reached and the greatest pleasure was given when most paradoxically sexual immorality and cornelian heroics could be combined in that way every need of the parisian public was satisfied mind senses rhetoric but it is only just to say that the public was fonder even of words than of lewdness eloquence could send it into ecstasies it would have suffered anything for a fine tirade virtue or vice heroics hobnobbing with the basest prurience there was no pill that it would not swallow if it was gilded with sonorous rhymes and redundant words anything that came to hand was ground into couplets antitheses arguments love suffering death and when that was done they thought they had felt love suffering and death nothing but phrases it was all a game when hugo brought thunder on to the stage at once as one of his disciples said he muted it so as not to frighten even a child the disciple fancied he was paying him a compliment it was never possible to feel any of the forces of nature in their art they made everything polite just as in music and even more than in music which was a younger art in france and therefore relatively more simple 
they were terrified of anything that had been already said the most gifted of them coldly devoted themselves to working contrariwise the process was childishly simple they pitched on some beautiful legend or fairy story and turned it upside down thus bluebeard was beaten by his wives or polyphemus was kind enough to pluck out his eye by way of sacrificing himself to the happiness of asis and galatea and they thought of nothing but form and once more it seemed to christophe though he was not a good judge that these masters of form were rather coxcombs and imitators than great writers creating their own style and giving breadth and depth to their work they played at being artists they played at being poets nowhere was the poetic lie more insolently reared than in the heroic drama they put up a burlesque conception of a hero Quote, the great thing is to have a soul magnificent, an eagle's eye, broad brow like portico, present, an air of strength, grave mane, most touchingly to show a heart that throbs, eyes full of dreams of worlds they know. End quote. Verses like that were taken seriously behind the hocus-pocus of such fine-sounding words the bombast the theatrical clash and clang of the swords and pasteboard helmets there was always the incurable futility of a sardou the intrepid vaudevillist playing punch and judy with history when in the world was the like of the heroism of cyrano ever to be found these writers moved heaven and earth they summoned from their tombs the emperor and his legions the bandits of the league the condottieri of the renaissance called up the human cyclones that once devastated the universe just to display a puppet standing unmoved through frightful massacres surrounded by armies soldiers and whole hosts of captive women dying of a silly calfish love for a woman whom he had seen ten or fifteen years before or king henri quat submitting to assassination because his mistress no longer loved him so and no otherwise did these good people present their parlor kings and condottieri and heroic passion they were worthy scions of the illustrious nincompoops of the days of grand cirrus those gascons of the ideal scuderi la calpronede an everlasting brood the songsters of sham heroism impossible heroism which is the enemy of truth Christophe observed to his amazement that the french who are said to be so clever had no sense of the ridiculous he was lucky when religion was not dragged in to fit the fashion. Then, during Lent, certain actors read the sermons of Bossuet at the Gaieté to the accompaniment of an organ. Jewish authors wrote tragedies about St. Teresa for Jewish actresses. The Way of the Cross was acted at the Baudinière, the Child Jesus at the Ambigu, the Passion at the Porte Saint-Martin, Jesus at the Odeon, orchestral suites on the subject of Christ at the Botanical Gardens, and a certain brilliant talker, a poet who wrote passionate love songs, gave a lecture on the redemption at the Châtelet. And, of course, the passages of the Gospel that were most carefully preserved by these people were those relating to Pilate and Mary Magdalene. What is truth? and the story of the blessed foolish virgin, and their boulevard Christ were horribly loquacious and well up in all the latest tricks of worldly casuistry. Christophe said, That is the worst yet. It is untruth incarnate. I'm stifling. Let's get out. And yet there was a great classic art that held its ground among all these modern industries, like the ruins of the splendid ancient temples among all the pretentious buildings of modern Rome. But outside Molière, Christophe was not yet able to appreciate it. He was not yet familiar enough with the language, and therefore could not grasp the genius of the race. 
nothing baffled him so much as the tragedy of the seventeenth century one of the least accessible provinces of french art to foreigners precisely because it lies at the very heart of france it bored him horribly he found it cold dry and revolting in its tricks and pedantry the action was thin or forced the characters were rhetorical abstractions or as insipid as the conversation of society women they were caricatures of the ancient legends and heroes a display of reason arguments quibbling and antiquated psychology and archaeology speeches 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 the eternal loquacity of the french christophe ironically refused to say whether it was beautiful or not there was nothing to interest him in it whatever the arguments put forward in turn by the orators of sinna he did not care a rap which of the talking machines won in the end however he had to admit that the french audience was not of his way of thinking and that they did applaud these plays that bored him but that did not help to dissipate his confusion he saw the plays through the audience and he recognized in the modern french certain of the features distorted of the classics so might a critical eye see in the faded charms of an old coquette the clear pure features of her daughter such a discovery is not calculated to foster the illusion of love like the members of a family who are used to seeing each other the french could not see the resemblance but christophe was struck by it and exaggerated it he could see nothing else every work of art he saw seemed to him to be full of old-fashioned caricatures of the great ancestors of the french and he saw these same great ancestors also in caricature he could not see any difference between cornel and the long line of his followers those rhetorical poets whose mania it was to present nothing but sublime and ridiculous cases of conscience and racine he confounded with his offspring of pretentiously introspective parisian psychologists none of these people had really broken free from the classics the critics were forever discussing tartuffe and fed they never wearied of hearing the same plays over and over again they delighted in the same old words and when they were old men they laughed at the same jokes which had been their joy when they were children and so it would be while the french nation endured no country in the world has so firmly rooted a cult of its great-great-grandfathers. The rest of the universe did not interest them. There were many, many men and women, even intelligent men and women, who had never read anything, and never wanted to read anything outside the works that had been written in France under the great king. Their theatres presented neither Goethe, nor Schiller, nor Kleist, nor Grillparzer, nor Hebel, nor any of the great dramatists of other nations, with the exception of the ancient Greeks, whose heirs they declared themselves to be, like every other nation in Europe. Every now and then they felt they ought to include Shakespeare. That was the touchstone. There were two schools of Shakespearean interpreters. The one played King Lear, with a commonplace realism, like a comedy of Émile Augier. The other turned Hamlet into an opera, with bravura airs and vocal exercises a la Victor Hugo. It never occurred to them that reality could be poetic, or that poetry was the spontaneous language of hearts bursting with life, shakespeare seemed false they very quickly went back to rostand and yet during the last twenty years there had been sturdy efforts made to vitalize the theatre the narrow circle of subjects drawn from parisian literature had been widened the theatre laid hands on everything with a show of audacity two or three times even the outer world public life had torn down the curtain of convention but the theatrists made haste to piece it together again. They lived in blinkers, and were afraid of seeing things as they are. 
a sort of clannishness a classical tradition a routine of form and spirit and a lack of real seriousness held them back from pushing their audacity to its logical extremity they turned the acutest problems into ingenious games and they always came back to the problem of women women of a certain class and what a sorry figure did the phantoms of great men cut on their boards the heroic anarchy of ibsen the gospel of tolstoy the superman of nietzsche the literary men of paris took a great deal of trouble to seem to be advanced thinkers but at heart they were all conservative there was no literature in europe in which the past the old the eternal yesterday held a completer and more unconscious sway in the great reviews in the great newspapers in the state-aided theatres in the academy paris was in literature what london was in politics the check on the mind of europe the french academy was a house of lords a certain number of the institutions of the ancien regime forced the spirit of the old days on the new society every revolutionary element was rejected or promptly assimilated they asked nothing better in vain did the government pretend to a socialistic polity in art it truckled under to the academies and the academic schools against the academies there was no opposition save from a few coteries and they put up a very poor fight for as soon as a member of a coterie could he fell into line with an academy and became more academic than the rest and even if a writer were in the advance guard or in the van of the army he was almost always trampled by his group and the ideas of his group some of them were hide-bound by their academic credo others by their revolutionary credo and when all was done they both amounted to the same thing end of section seven section eight of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert cannon marketplace one part eight by way of rousing christophe on whom academic art had acted as a soporific sylvain cohn proposed to take him to certain eclectic theatres the very latest thing there they saw murder rape madness torture eyes plucked out bellies gutted anything to thrill the nerves and satisfy the barbarism lurking beneath a too civilized section of the people it had a great attraction for pretty women and men of the world the people who would go and spend whole afternoons in the stuffy courts of the palais de justice listening to scandalous cases laughing talking and eating chocolates but christophe indignantly refused the more closely he examined that sort of art the more acutely he became aware of the odour that from the very first he had detected faintly in the beginning then more strongly and finally it was suffocating the odour of death death it was everywhere beneath all the luxury and uproar christophe discovered the explanation of the feeling of repugnance with which certain french plays had filled him it was not their immorality that shocked him morality immorality amorality all these words mean nothing christophe had never invented any moral theory he loved the great poets and great musicians of the past and they were no saints when he came across a great artist he did not inquire into his morality he asked him rather are you healthy to be healthy was the great thing if the poet is ill let him first of all cure himself as goethe says when he is cured he will write the writers of paris were unhealthy 
or if one of them happened to be healthy, the chances were that he was ashamed of it. He disguised it, and did his best to catch some disease. Their sickness was not shown in any particular feature of their art. The love of pleasure, the extreme license of mind, or the universal trick of criticism which examined and dissected every idea that was expressed. All these things could be, and were, as the case might be, healthy or unhealthy. If death was there, it did not come from the material, but from the use that these people made of it. It was in the people themselves. And Christophe himself loved pleasure. He too loved liberty. He had drawn down upon himself the displeasure of his little German town by his frankness in defending many things, which he found here, promulgated by these Parisians, in such a way as to disgust him. And yet they were the same things. But nothing sounded the same to the Parisians and to himself, when Christophe impatiently shook off the yoke of the great masters of the past, when he waged war against the aesthetics and the morality of the Pharisees, it was not a game to him as it was to these men of intellect, and his revolt was directed only towards life, the life of fruitfulness big with the centuries to come. With these people all tended to sterile enjoyment. Sterile, sterile, sterile. That was the key to the enigma. Mind and senses were fruitlessly debauched. A brilliant art, full of wit and cleverness, a lovely form in truth, a tradition of beauty, impregnably seated, in spite of foreign alluvial deposits, a theatre which was a theatre, a style which was a style, authors who knew their business, writers who could write, the fine skeleton of an art, and a thought that had been great, but a skeleton. Sonorous words, ringing phrases, the metallic clang of ideas hurtling down the void, witticisms, minds haunted by sensuality, and senses numbed with thought. It was all useless, save for the sport of egoism. It led to death. It was a phenomenon analogous to the frightful decline in the birth-rate of France, which Europe was observing and reckoning in silence. So much wit, so much cleverness, so many acute senses, all wasted and wasting in a sort of shameful onanism. They had no notion of it, and wished to have none. They laughed. That was the only thing that comforted Christophe a little. These people could still laugh. All was not lost." He liked them even less when they tried to take themselves seriously, and nothing hurt him more than to see writers, who regarded art as no more than an instrument of pleasure, giving themselves airs as priests of a disinterested religion. "'We are artists,' said Sylvain Cohn once more complacently. "'We follow art for art's sake. Art is always pure. Everything in art is chaste.' We explore life as tourists, we find everything amusing. We are amateurs of rare sensations, lovers of beauty. You are hypocrites, replied Christophe bluntly. Excuse my saying so. I used to think my own country had a monopoly. In Germany, our hypocrisy consists in always talking about idealism, while we think of nothing but our interests and we even believe that we are idealists while we think of nothing but ourselves but you are much worse you cover your national lewdness with the names of art and beauty with capitals when you do not shield your moral pilotism behind the names of truth science intellectual duty and you wash your hands of the possible consequences of your haughty inquiry art for art's sake that's a fine faith, but it is the faith of the strong. Art. To grasp life as the eagle claws its prey, to bear it up into the air, to rise with it into the serenity of space. 
for that you need talons great wings and a strong heart but you are nothing but sparrows who when they find a piece of carrion rend it here and there squabbling for it and twittering art for art's sake o oh, wretched men art is no common ground for the feet of all who pass it by why it is a pleasure it is the most intoxicating of all but it is a pleasure which is only won at the cost of a strenuous fight it is the laurel wreath that crowns the victory of the strong art is life tamed art is the emperor of life to be caesar a man must have the soul of caesar but you are only limelight kings you are playing a part and do not even deceive yourselves and like those actors who turn to profit their deformities you manufacture literature out of your own deformities and those of your public lovingly do you cultivate the diseases of your people their fear of effort their love of pleasure their sensual minds their chimerical humanitarianism everything in them that drugs the will everything in them that saps their power for action you deaden their minds with the fumes of opium behind it all is death you know it but you will not admit it well i tell you where death is there art is not art is the spring of life but even the most honest of your writers are so cowardly that even when the bandage is removed from their eyes they pretend not to see they have the effrontery to say it is dangerous i admit it is poisonous but it is full of talent it is as if a judge sentencing a hooligan were to say he's a blackguard certainly but he has so much talent christophe wondered what was the use of french criticism there was no lack of critics they swarmed all over and about french art it was impossible to see the work of the artists they were swamped by the critics christophe was not indulgent towards criticism in general he found it difficult to admit the utility of these thousands of artists who formed a fourth or fifth estate in the modern community he read in it the signs of a worn-out generation which relegates to others the business of regarding life feeling vicariously and to go farther it seemed to him not a little shameful that they could not even see with their own eyes the reflection of life but must have yet more intermediaries reflections of the reflection the critics at least they ought to have seen to it that the reflections were true but the critics reflected nothing but the uncertainty of the mob that moved round them they were like those trick mirrors which reflect again and again the faces of the sightseers who gaze into them against a painted background there had been a time when the critics had enjoyed a tremendous authority in france the public bowed down to their decrees and they were not far from regarding them as superior to the artists as artists with intelligence apparently the two words do not go together naturally then they had multiplied too rapidly there were too many oracles that spoiled the trade when there are so many people each of whom declares that he is the sole repository of truth it is impossible to believe them and in the end they ceased to believe it themselves they were discouraged in the passage from night to day according to the french custom they passed from one extreme to the other where they had before professed to know everything they now professed to know nothing it was a point of honour with them quite fatuously renan had taught those milksop generations that it is not correct to affirm anything without denying it at once or at least casting a doubt on it he was one of those men of whom st paul speaks for whom there was always yes yes and then no no all the superior persons in france had wildly embraced this amphibious credo 
it exactly suited their indolence of mind and weakness of character they no longer said of a work of art that it was good or bad true or false intelligent or idiotic they said it may be so nothing is impossible i don't know i wash my hands of it if some objectionable piece were put up they did not say that is nasty rubbish they said sir seganyarel please do not talk like that our philosophy bids us talk of everything open-mindedly and therefore you ought not to say that is nasty rubbish but it seems to me that that is nasty rubbish but it is not certain that it is so it may be a masterpiece who can say that it is not there was no danger of their being accused of tyranny over the arts schiller once taught them a lesson when he reminded the petty tyrants of the press of his time of what he called bluntly the duty of servants first the house must be clean that the queen is to enter bustle about then sweep the rooms that is what you are there for gentlemen but as soon as she appears out you go let not the serving wench sit in her lady's chair but to be just to the critics of that time it must be said that they never did sit in their lady's chair it was ordered that they should be servants and servants they were but bad servants they never took a broom in their hands the room was thick with dust instead of cleaning and tidying they folded their arms and left the work to be done by the master the divinity of the day universal suffrage in fact there had been for some time a wave of reaction passing through the popular conscience a few people had set out feebly enough on a campaign of public health but christophe could see no sign of it among the people with whom he lived they gained no hearing and were laughed at when every now and then some honest man did raise a protest against unclean art the authors replied haughtily that they were in the right since the public was satisfied that was enough to silence every objection the public had spoken that was the supreme law of art it never occurred to anybody to impeach the evidence of a debauched public in favor of those who had debauched them or that it was the artist's business to lead the public not the public the artist a numerical religion the number of the audience and the sum total of the receipts dominated the artistic thought of that commercialized democracy following the authors the critics docilely declared that the essential function of a work of art was to please success is law and when success endures there is nothing to be done but to bow to it and so they devoted their energies to anticipating the fluctuations of the exchange of pleasure in trying to find out what the public thought of the various plays the joke of it was that the public was always trying frantically to find out what the critics thought and so there they were looking at each other and in each other's eyes they saw nothing but their own indecision and yet never had there been such crying need of a fearless critic in an anarchical republic fashion which is all-powerful in art very rarely looks backward as it does in a conservative state it goes onwards always and there is a perpetual competition of libertinism which hardly anybody dare resist the mob is incapable of forming an opinion at heart it is shocked but nobody dares to say what everybody secretly feels if the critics were strong, if they dared to be strong, what a power they would have! A vigorous critic would in a few years become the Napoleon of public taste and sweep away all the diseases of art. But there is no Napoleon in France. All the critics live in that vitiated atmosphere and do not notice it, and they dare not speak. They all know each other, 
They are a more or less close company, and they have to consider each other. Not one of them is independent. To be so, they would have to renounce their social life and even their friendships. Who is there that would have the courage in such a knock-kneed time, when even the best critics doubt whether a just notice is worth the annoyance it may cause to the writer and the object of it? Who is there so devoted to duty that he would condemn himself to such a hell on earth, dare to stand out against opinion, fight the imbecility of the public, expose the mediocrity of the successes of the day, defend the unknown artist who is alone and at the mercy of the beasts of prey, and subject the minds of those who were born to obey to the dominion of the master mind. Christophe actually heard the critics at a first night in the vestibule of the theatre say, Hmm, pretty bad, isn't it? Utter rot. And next day in their notices they talked of masterpieces, Shakespeare, the wings of genius beating above their heads. It is not so much talent that your art lacks as character, said Christophe to Sylvain Cohn. You need a great critic, a lessing, a... A boileau, said Sylvain quizzically. A boileau, perhaps, more than these artists of genius. If we had a boileau, said Sylvain Cohn, no one would listen to him. If they did not listen to him, replied Christophe, he would not be a boileau. I bet you that if I set out and told you the truth about yourselves quite bluntly, however clumsy I might be, you would have to gulp it down. My dear good fellow, laughed Sylvain Cohn. That was all the reply he made. He was so cocksure and so satisfied with the general flabbiness of the French that suddenly it occurred to Christophe that Cohn was a thousand times more of a foreigner in France than himself, and there was a catch at his heart. It is impossible, he said once more, as he had said that evening when he had left the theatre on the boulevards in disgust, there must be something else. What more do you want? asked Sylvain Cohn. France. We are France, said Sylvain Cohn, gurgling with laughter. Christophe stared hard at him for a moment, then shook his head and said once more, There must be something else. Well, old man, you'd better look for it, said Sylvain Cohn, laughing louder than ever. Christophe had to look for it. It was well hidden. End of section 8《Section 9 of Jean Christophe in Paris》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jack Ossick. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Cannon. The Marketplace. Chapter 2. Part 1. The more clearly Christophe saw into the vat of ideas in which Parisian art was fermenting, the more strongly he was impressed by the supremacy of women in that cosmopolitan community. They had an absurdly disproportionate importance. It was not enough for woman to be the helpmeet of man. It was not even enough for her to be his equal. Her pleasure must be law, both for herself and for man. And man truckled to it. When a nation is growing old, it renounces its will, its faith, the whole essence of its being, in favor of the giver of pleasure. Men make works of art, but women make men, except when they tamper with the work of the men, as happened in France at that time. And it would be more just to say that they unmake what they make. No doubt the eternal feminine has been an uplifting influence on the best of men, but for the ordinary men, in ages of weariness and fatigue, there is, as someone has said, another feminine, just as eternal, who drags them down. This other feminine was the mistress of Parisian thought, the queen of the Republic. Christophe closely observed the Parisian women at the houses at which Sylvain Cohn's introduction or his own skill at the piano had made him welcome. Like most foreigners, he generalized freely and unsparingly about French women from the two or three types he had met. 
Young women, not very tall and not at all fresh, with neat figures, dyed hair, large hats on their pretty heads that were a little too large for their bodies. They had trim features, but their faces were just a little too fleshy. Good noses, vulgar sometimes, characterless always. Quick eyes without any great depth, which they tried to make as brilliant and large as possible. Well-cut lips that were perfectly under control plump little chins, and the lower part of their faces revealed their utter materialism. They were elegant little creatures who, amid all their preoccupations with love and intrigue, never lost sight of public opinion and their domestic affairs. They were pretty, but they belonged to no race. In all these polite ladies there was the savor of the respectable woman perverted, or wanting to be so, together with all the traditions of her class—prudence, economy, coldness, practical common sense, egoism. A poor sort of life. A desire for pleasure emanating rather from a cerebral curiosity than from a need of the senses. Their will was mediocre in quality, but firm. They were very well dressed and had little automatic gestures. They were always patting their hair or their gowns with the backs or the palms of their hands, with little delicate movements. And they always managed to sit so that they could admire themselves and watch other women in a mirror, near or far, not to mention, at tea or dinner, the spoons, knives, silver coffee pots, polished and shining, in which they always peeped at the reflections of their faces, which were more interesting to them than anything or anybody else. At meals they dieted sternly, drinking water and depriving themselves altogether of any food that might stand in the way of their ideal, of a complexion of a flowery whiteness. There was a fairly large proportion of Jewesses among Christophe's acquaintance and he was always attracted by them, although, since his encounter with Judith Mannheim, he had hardly any illusions about them. Sylvain Kohn had introduced him to several Jewish houses where he was received with the usual intelligence of the race, which loves intelligence. Christophe met financiers there, engineers, newspaper proprietors, international brokers, slave dealers of a sort from Algiers, the men of affairs of the Republic. They were clear-headed and energetic, indifferent to other people, smiling, affable, and secretive. Christoph felt sometimes that behind their hard faces was the knowledge of crime in the past and the future, of these men gathered round the sumptuous table laden with food, flowers, and wine. They were almost all ugly. But the women, taken as a whole, were quite brilliant, though it did not do to look at them too closely. In most of them there was a want of subtlety in their coloring. But brilliance there was, and a fair show of material life, beautiful shoulders generously exposed to view, and a genius for making their beauty and even their ugliness a lure for the men. An artist would have recognized in some of them the old Roman type, the women of the time of Nero, down to the time of Hadrian. And there were palmiesque faces, with a sensual expression, heavy chins solidly modeled with the neck, and not without a certain bestial beauty. Some of them had thick, curly hair and bold, fiery eyes. They seemed to be subtle, incisive, ready for everything, more virile than other women, and also more feminine. Here and there a more spiritual profile would stand out. Those pure features came from beyond Rome, from the East, the country of Laban. There was expressed in them the poetry of silence, of the desert. But when Christoph went nearer, and listened to the conversations between Rebecca and Faustina the Roman, or saint Barbe the Venetian, he found her to be just a Parisian Jewess, just like the others, even more Parisian than the Parisian women, more artificial and sophisticated, talking quietly, and maliciously stripping the assembled company, body and soul, with her Madonna's eyes. Christophe wandered from group to group, but could identify himself with none of them. The men talked savagely of hunting brutally of love, and only of money with any sort of real appreciation. And that was cold and cunning. They talked business in the smoking room. Christophe heard someone say of a certain fop who was sauntering from one lady to another, with a buttonhole in his coat, oozing heavy compliments. So, he is free again? In a corner of the room, two ladies were talking of the love affairs of a young actress and a society woman. There was occasional music. Christoph was asked to play. Large women, breathless and heavily perspiring, declaimed in an apocalyptic tone verses of Sully Prudhomme or Auguste d'Orchin, 
a famous actor solemnly recited a mystic ballad to the accompaniment of an American organ. Words and music were so stupid that they turned Christoph sick. But the Roman women were delighted and laughed heartily to show their magnificent teeth. Scenes from Ibsen were performed. It was a fine epilogue to the struggle of a great man against the pillars of society that it should be used for their diversion. And then they all began, of course, to prattle about art. That was horrible. The women especially began to talk of Ibsen, Wagner, Tolstoy, flirtatiously, politely, boredly, or idiotically. Once the conversation had started, there was no stopping it. The disease was contagious. Christoph had to listen to the ideas of bankers, brokers, and slave dealers on art. In vain did he refuse to speak or try to turn the conversation. They insisted on talking about music and poetry. As Berlioz said, Such people use the words quite coolly, just as though they were talking of wine, women, or some such trash. An alienist physician recognized one of his patients in an Ibsen heroine, though to his way of thinking she was infinitely more silly. An engineer quite sincerely declared that the husband was the sympathetic character in The Doll's House. The famous actor, a well-known comedian, brayed his profound ideas on Nietzsche and Carlyle. He assured Christoph that he could not see a picture of Velázquez, the idol of the hour, without the tears coursing down his cheeks. And he confided, still to Christoph's private ear, that though he esteemed art very highly, yet he esteemed still more highly the art of living, acting, and that if he were asked to choose what part he would play, it would be that of Bismarck. Sometimes there would be of the company a professed wit, but the level of the conversation was not appreciably higher for that. Generally, they said nothing. They confined themselves to a jerky remark or an enigmatic smile. They lived on their reputations and were saved for their trouble. But there were a few professional talkers, generally from the South, they talked about anything and everything. They had no sense of proportion. Everything came alike to them. One was a Shakespeare, another a Moliere, another a Pascal, if not a Jesus Christ. They compared Ibsen with Dumas fils, Tolstoy with George Sand, and the gist of it all was that everything came from France. Generally, they were ignorant of foreign languages, but that did not disturb them. It mattered so little to their audience whether they told the truth or not. What did matter was that they should say amusing things, things as flattering as possible to national vanity. Foreigners had to put up with a good deal, with the exception of the idol of the hour, for there was always a fashionable idol. Grieg, or Wagner, or Nietzsche, or Gorky, or D'Annunzio. It never lasted long, and the idol was certain one fine morning to be thrown onto the rubbish heap. For the moment, the idol was Beethoven. Beethoven, save the mark, was in the fashion, at least among literary and polite persons. For musicians had dropped him at once, in accordance with the seesaw system, which is one of the laws of artistic taste in France. A Frenchman needs to know what his neighbor thinks before he knows what he thinks himself, so that he can think the same thing or the opposite. Thus, when they saw Beethoven in popular favor, the most distinguished musicians began to discover that he was not distinguished enough for them. They claimed to lead opinion, not to follow it, and rather than be in agreement with it, they turned their backs on it. They began to regard Beethoven as a man afflicted with deafness, crying in a voice of bitterness. And some of them declare that he might be an excellent moralist, but that he was certainly overpraised as a musician. That sort of joke was not at all to Christoph's taste. Still less did he like the enthusiasm of polite society. If Beethoven had come to Paris just then, he would have been the lion of the hour. It was such a pity that he had been dead for more than a century. His vogue grew not so much out of his music as out of the more or less romantic circumstances of his life which had been popularized by sentimental and virtuous biographies. His rugged face and lion's mane had become a romantic figure. Ladies wept for him. They hinted that if they had known him, he should not have been so unhappy, and in their greatness of heart they were the more ready to sacrifice all for him. In that there was no danger of Beethoven taking them at their word, the old fellow was beyond all need of anything. That was why the virtuosi, the conductors, and the impresarii bowed down in pious worship before him. 
and as the representatives of Beethoven, they gathered the homage destined for him. There were sumptuous festivals at exorbitant prices, which afforded society people an opportunity of showing their generosity, and incidentally also of discovering Beethoven's symphonies. There were committees of actors, men of the world, bohemians, and politicians, appointed by the Republic to preside over the destinies of art, and they informed the world of their intention to erect a monument to Beethoven. And on these committees, together with a few honest men whose names guaranteed the rest, were all the riffraff who would have stoned Beethoven if he had been alive, if Beethoven had not crushed the life out of them. Christoph watched and listened. He ground his teeth to keep himself from saying anything outrageous. He was on tenterhooks the whole evening. He could not talk, nor could he keep silent. It seemed to him humiliating and shameful to talk neither for pleasure nor from necessity, but out of politeness, because he had to talk. He was not allowed to say what he thought, and it was impossible for him to make conversation. And he did not even know how to be polite without talking. If he looked at anybody, he glared too fixedly and intently. In spite of himself, he studied that person, and that person was offended. If he spoke at all, he believed too much in what he was saying, and that was disturbing for everybody, and even for himself. He quite admitted that he was out of his element, and as he was clever enough to sound the general note of the company— in which his presence was a discord, he was as upset by his manners as his hosts. He was angry with himself and with them. When at last he stood in the street once more, very late at night, he was so worn out with the boredom of it all that he could hardly drag himself home. He wanted to lie down just where he was, in the street, as he had done many times when he was returning as a boy from his performances at the palace of the Grand Duke. Although he had only five or six francs to take him to the end of the week, he spent two of them on a cab. He flung himself into it the more quickly to escape, and as he drove along he groaned aloud from sheer exhaustion. When he reached home and got to bed, he groaned in his sleep. And then, suddenly, he roared with laughter as he remembered some ridiculous saying. He woke up repeating it and imitating the features of the speaker. Next day, and for several days after, as he walked about, he would suddenly bellow like a bull. Why did he visit these people? Why did he go on visiting them? Why force himself to gesticulate and make faces like the rest, and pretend to be interested in things that did not appeal to him in the very least? Was it true that he was not in the least interested? A year ago he would not have been able to put up with them for a moment. Now, at heart, he was amused by it all, while at the same time it exasperated him. Was a little of the indifference of the Parisians creeping over him? He would sometimes wonder fearfully whether he had lost strength. But, in truth, he had gained in strength. He was more free in mind in strange surroundings. In spite of himself, his eyes were opened to the great comedy of the world. Besides, whether he liked it or not, he had to go on with it if he wanted his art to be recognized by Parisian society, which is only interested in art insofar as it knows the artist and he had to make himself known if he were to find among these Philistines the pupils necessary to keep him alive. And then, Christoph had a heart. His heart must have affection. Wherever he might be, there he would find food for his affections. Without it, he could not live. Among the few girls of that class of society, few enough, whom Christoph taught, was the daughter of a rich motor car manufacturer, Colette Stevens. Her father was a Belgian, a naturalized Frenchman, the son of an Anglo-American settled at Antwerp and a Dutch woman. Her mother was an Italian, a regular Parisian family. To Christophe and to many others, Colette Stevens was the type of French girl. She was 18 and had velvety, soft black eyes, which she used skillfully upon young men, regular Spanish eyes with enormous pupils a rather long and fantastic nose, which wrinkled up and moved at the tip as she talked, with little fractious pouts and shrugs, rebellious hair, a pretty little face, rather sallow complexion, dabbed with powder, heavy, rather thick features. Altogether, she was like a plump kitten. She was slight, very well-dressed, attractive, provoking. She had sly, affected, rather silly manners— her pose was that of a little girl, and she would sit rocking her chair for hours at a time and giving little exclamations like, No! Impossible! At meals she would clap her hands when there was a dish she loved. 
In the drawing room, she would smoke cigarette after cigarette, and, when there were men present, display an exuberant affection for her girl friends, flinging her arms round their necks, kissing their hands, whispering in their ears, making ingenuous and naughty remarks, doing it most brilliantly in a soft, twittering voice. And in the lightest possible way, she would say improper things without seeming to do more than hint at them, and was even more skillful in provoking them from others. She had the ingenuous air of a little girl, who knows perfectly well what she is about, with her large, brilliant eyes, slyly and voluptuously looking sidelong, maliciously taking in all the gossip, and catching at all the dubious remarks of the conversation, and all the time angling for hearts. All these tricks and shows, and her sophisticated ingenuity, were not at all to Christophe's liking. He had better things to do than to lend himself to the practices of an artful little girl, and did not even care to look on at them for his amusement. He had to earn his living, to keep his life and ideas from death. He had no interest in these drawing-room parakeets beyond the gaining of a livelihood. In return for their money, he gave them lessons, conscientiously concentrating all his energies on the task, to keep the boredom of it from mastering him, and his attention from being distracted by the tricks of his pupils when they were coquettes, like Colette Stevens. He paid no more attention to her than to Colette's little cousin, a child of twelve, shy and silent, whom the Stevens had adopted, to whom also Christophe gave lessons on the piano. But Colette was too clever not to feel that all her charms were lost on Christophe, and too adroit not to adapt herself at once to his character. She did not even need to do so deliberately. It was a natural instinct with her. She was a woman. She was like water, formless. The soul of every man she met was a vessel, whose form she took immediately out of curiosity. It was a law of her existence that she should always be someone else. Her whole personality was forever shifting. She was forever changing her vessel. Christophe attracted her for many reasons, the chief of which was that he was not attracted by her. He attracted her also because he was different from all the young men of her acquaintance. She had never tried to pour herself into a vessel of such a rugged form. And finally, he attracted her because, being naturally and by inheritance expert in the valuation at the first glance of men and vessels, she knew perfectly well that what he lacked in polish, Christophe made up in a solidity of character which none of her smart young Parisians could offer her. She played as well and as badly as most idle young women. She played a great deal and very little. That is to say that she was always working at it, but knew nothing at all about it. She strummed on her piano all day long for want of anything else to do, or from affectation, or because it gave her pleasure. Sometimes she rattled along mechanically. Sometimes she would play well, very well, with taste and soul. It was almost as though she had a soul, but as a matter of fact, she only borrowed one. Before she knew Christophe, she was capable of liking Massenet, Grieg, Tomé. But after she met Christophe, she ceased to like them. Then she played Bach and Beethoven very correctly, which is not very high praise. But the great thing was that she loved them. At bottom, it was not Beethoven, nor Tomé, nor Bach, nor Grieg that she loved, but the notes, the sounds, the fingers running over the keys, the thrills she got from the chords which tickled her nerves and made her wriggle with pleasure. In the drawing room of the great house, decorated with faded tapestry, and on an easel in the middle of the room, a portrait of the stout Madame Stevens by a fashionable painter who had represented her in a languishing attitude, like a flower dying for want of water, with a die-away expression in her eyes and her body draped in impossible curves, by way of expressing the rare quality of her millionaire soul. In the great drawing room, with its bow windows looking on to a clump of old trees powdered with snow, Christophe would find Colette sitting at her piano, repeating the same passage over and over again, delighting her ear with mellifluous dissonance. Ah, Christophe would say as he entered, the cat is still purring. How wicked of you, she would laugh, and she would hold out her soft little hand. Listen, isn't it pretty? Very pretty, he would say indifferently. You aren't listening. Will you please listen? I am listening. It's the same thing over and over again. Ah, you are no musician, she would say pettishly. As if that were music or anything like it. What? Not music? What is it, then, if you please? 
You know quite well. I won't tell you, because it would not be polite. All the more reason why you should say it. You want me to? So much the worse for you. Well, do you know what you are doing with your piano? You are flirting with it. Indeed. Certainly. You say to it, Dear piano, dear piano, say pretty things to me. Kiss me. Give me just one little kiss. You need not say any more, said Colette, half vexed, half laughing. You haven't the least idea of respect. Not the least. You are impertinent. And then, even if it were so, isn't that the right way to love music? Oh, come, don't mix music up with that. But that is music. A beautiful chord is a kiss. I never told you that. But isn't it true? Why do you shrug your shoulders and make faces? Because it annoys me. So much the better. It annoys me to hear music spoken of as though it were a sort of indulgence. Oh, it isn't your fault. It's the fault of the world you live in. The stale society in which you live regards music as a sort of legitimate vice. Come, sit down. Play me your sonata. No, let us talk a little longer. I'm not here to talk. I'm here to teach you the piano. Come, play away. You're so rude, said Colette, rather vexed, but at heart delighted to be handled so roughly. She played her piece carefully, and as she was clever, she succeeded fairly well, and sometimes even very well. Christophe, who was not deceived, laughed inwardly at the skill of the little beast who played as though she felt what she was playing, while really she felt nothing at all. And yet he had a sort of amused sympathy for her. Colette, on her part, seized every excuse for going on with the conversation, which interested her much more than her lesson. It was no good Christophe drawing back on the excuse that he could not say what he thought without hurting her feelings. She always wheedled it out of him and the more insulting it was, the less she was hurt by it. It was an amusement for her. But as she was quick enough to see that Christophe liked nothing so much as sincerity, she would contradict him flatly, and argue tenaciously. They would part very good friends. However, Christophe would never have had the least illusion about their friendship, and there would never have been the smallest intimacy between them, had not Colette one day taken it into her head, out of sheer instinctive coquetry, to confide in him. The evening before, her parents had given an at-home. She had laughed, chattered, flirted outrageously, but next morning when Christophe came for her lesson, she was worn out, drawn-looking, grey-faced and haggard. She hardly spoke. She seemed utterly depressed. She sat at the piano, played softly, made mistakes, tried to correct them, made them again, stopped short, and said, I can't. Please forgive me. Please wait a little. He asked if she were unwell. She said no. She was out of sorts. She had bouts of it. It was absurd, but he must not mind. He proposed to go away and come again another day, but she insisted on his staying. Just a moment. I shall be all right presently. It's silly of me, isn't it? He felt that she was not her usual self, but he did not question her, and, to turn the conversation, he said... That's what comes of having been so brilliant last night. You took too much out of yourself. She smiled a little ironically. One can't say the same of you, she replied. He laughed. I don't believe you said a word, she went on. Not a word. But there were interesting people there. Oh, yes. All sorts of lights and famous people all talking at once. But I am lost among all your boneless Frenchmen who understand everything, and explain everything, and excuse everything, and feel nothing at all. People who talk for hours together about art and love. Isn't it revolting? But you ought to be interested in art, if not in love. One doesn't talk about these things. One does them. But when one cannot do them, said Colette, pouting. Christophe replied with a laugh. Well, leave it to others. Everybody is not fit for art. Nor for love? Nor for love. How awful! What is left for us? Housekeeping. Thanks, said Colette, rather annoyed. She turned to the piano and began again, made mistakes, thumped the keyboard, and moaned, I can't. I'm no good at all. I believe you are right. Women aren't any good. It's something to be able to say so said Christophe genially. 
She looked at him rather sheepishly, like a little girl who has been scolded, and said, "'Don't be so hard.' "'I'm not saying anything hard about good women,' replied Christophe gaily. "'A good woman is paradise on earth. Only paradise on earth. I know. No one has ever seen it. "'I'm not so pessimistic. I say only that I have never seen it. But that's no reason why it should not exist. I'm determined to find it if it does exist. But it is not easy.' A good woman and a man of genius are equally rare. And all the other men and women don't count? On the contrary, it is only they who count, for the world. But for you? For me, they don't exist. You are hard, repeated Colette. A little. Somebody has to be hard, if only in the interest of the others. If there weren't a few pebbles here and there in the world, the whole thing would go to pulp. Yes, "'You are right. It is a good thing for you that you are strong,' said Colette, sadly. "'But you must not be too hard on men, and especially on women who aren't strong. "'You don't know how terrible our weakness is to us. "'Because you see us flirting and laughing and doing silly things, "'you think we never dream of anything else, and you despise us. "'Ah, if you could see all that goes on in the minds of the girls of from fifteen to eighteen as they go out into society, and have the sort of success that comes to their youth and freshness, when they have danced and talked smart nonsense and said bitter things at which people laugh because they laugh, when they have given themselves to imbeciles and sought in vain in their eyes the light that is nowhere to be found, if you could see them in their rooms at night, in silence, alone, kneeling in agony to pray— "'Is it possible?' said Christophe, altogether amazed. "'What? You too have suffered?' Colette did not reply, but tears came to her eyes. She tried to smile and held out her hand to Christophe. He grasped it warmly. "'What would you have us do? There is nothing to do. You men can free yourselves and do what you like, but we are bound forever and ever within the narrow circle of the duties and pleasures of society. We cannot break free.' There is nothing to prevent your freeing yourselves, finding some work you like, and winning your independence just as we do. As you do? Poor Monsieur Kraft, your work is not so very certain. But at least you like your work. But what sort of work can we do? There isn't any that we could find interesting. For, I know, we dabble in all sorts of things, and pretend to be interested in a heap of things that do not concern us. We do so want to be interested in something. I do what the others do. I do charitable work and sit on social work committees. I go to lectures at the Sorbonne by Bergson and Jules Lemaitre, historical concerts, classical matinees, and I take notes and notes. I never know what I am writing, and I try to persuade myself that I am absorbed by it, or at least that it is useful. Ah, but I know that it is not true. I know that I don't care a bit and that I am bored by it all. Don't despise me because I tell you frankly what everybody thinks in secret— I'm no sillier than the rest. But what use are philosophy, history, and science to me? As for art, you see, I strum and daub and make messy little watercolor sketches. But is that enough to fill a woman's life? There is only one end to our life, marriage. But do you think there is much fun in marrying this or that young man whom I know as well as you do? I see them as they are. I am not fortunate enough to be like your German Gretchens, who can always create an illusion for themselves. That is terrible, isn't it? To look around and see girls who have married and their husbands, and to think that one will have to do as they have done, be cramped in body and mind, and become dull like them. One needs to be stoical, I tell you, to accept such a life with such obligations. All women are not capable of it. And time passes, the years go by, youth fades, and yet there were lovely things and good things in us, all useless, for day by day they die, and one has to surrender them to the fools and people whom one despises, people who will despise oneself. And nobody understands. One would think that we were sphinxes. One can forgive the men who find us dull and strange. But the women ought to understand us. They have been like us. They have only to look back and remember. But no, there is no help from them. Even our mothers ignore us and actually try not to know what we are. They only try to get us married. For the rest, they say, live, die, do as you like. 
Society absolutely abandons us. Don't lose heart, said Christophe. Everyone has to face the experience of life all over again. If you are brave, it will be all right. Look outside your own circle. There must be a few honest men in France. There are, I know. But they are so tedious. And then, I tell you, I detest the circle in which I live. But I don't think I could live outside it now. It has become a habit. I need a certain degree of comfort, certain refinements of luxury and comfort, which, no doubt, money alone cannot provide, though it is an indispensable factor. That sounds pretty poor, I know, but I know myself. I am weak. Please, please don't draw away from me because I tell you of my cowardice. Be kind and listen to me. It helps me so to talk to you. I feel that you are strong and sound. I have such confidence in you. Will you be my friend? Gladly, said Christophe. But what can I do? Listen to me. Advise me. Give me courage. I am so often depressed. And then I don't know what to do. I say to myself, what is the good of fighting? What's the good of tormenting myself? One way or the other, what does it matter? Nothing and nobody matters. That is a dreadful condition to be in. I don't want to get like that. Help me. Help me. She looked utterly downcast. She looked older by ten years. She looked at Christophe with abject, imploring eyes. He promised what she asked. Then she revived, smiled, and was gay once more. And in the evening she was laughing and flirting as usual. End of section 9《Section 10 of Jean-Christophe in Paris》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Rolland》Translated by Gilbert Canin — The Market Place — Chapter 2 — Part 1 Thereafter they had many intimate conversations. They were alone together. She confided in him. He tried hard to understand and advise her. She listened to his advice, or if necessary, to his remonstrances, gravely, attentively, like a good little girl. It was a distraction, an interest, even a support for her. She thanked him coquettishly, with the depth of feeling in her eyes. But her life was changed in nothing. It was only a distraction the more. Her day was passed in a succession of metamorphoses. She got up very late, about midday, after a sleepless night, for she rarely went to sleep before dawn. All day long she did nothing. She would vaguely call to mind a poem, an idea, a scrap of an idea, or a face that had pleased her. She was never quite awake until about four or five in the afternoon. Till then her eyelids were heavy, her face puffy, and she was sulky and sleepy. She would revive on the arrival of a few girlfriends as talkative as herself, and all sharing the same interest in the gossip of Paris. They chattered endlessly about love, the psychology of love. That was the unfailing topic, mixed up with dress— the indiscretions of others, and scandal. She had also a circle of idle young men to whom it was necessary to spend three hours a day among skirts. They ought to have worn them, really, for they had the souls and the conversation of girls. Christophe had his hour as her confessor. At once Colette would become serious and intense. She was like the young Frenchwoman of whom Bodley speaks, who at the confessional, Quote, developed a calmly prepared essay, a model of clarity and order, in which everything that was to be said was properly arranged in distinct categories, end quote. And after that she flung herself once more into the business of amusement. As the day went on, she grew younger. In the evening she went to the theatre, and there was the eternal pleasure of recognising the same eternal faces in the audience. Her pleasure lay not in the play that was performed, but in the actors whom she knew, whose familiar mannerisms she remarked once more, and she exchanged spiteful remarks with the people who came to see her in her box, about the people in the other boxes, and about the actresses. The ingenue was said to have a thin voice, like sour mayonnaise, or the great comedienne was dressed like a lampshade, or else she went out to a party, and there the pleasure for a pretty girl like Colette lay in being seen. But there were bad days. Nothing is more capricious than good looks in Paris and she renewed her store of criticisms of people and their dresses and their physical defects. There was no conversation. She would go home late and take her time about going to bed. That was the time when she was most awake. She would dawdle about her dressing table, skim through a book, laugh to herself at the memory of something said or done. She was bored and very unhappy. 
she could not go to sleep, and in the night there would come frightful moments of despair. Christophe, who only saw Colette for a few hours at intervals and could only be present at a few of these transformations, found it difficult to understand her at all. He wondered when she was sincere, or if she were always sincere, or if she were never sincere. Colette herself could not have told him. Like most girls who are idle and circumscribed in their desires, she was in darkness. She did not know what she was, because she did not know what she wanted, because she could not know what she wanted without having tried it. She would try it, after her fashion, with the maximum of liberty and the minimum of risk, trying to copy the people about her and to take their moral measure. She was in no hurry to choose. She would have liked to try everything and turn everything to account. But that did not work with a friend like Christophe. He was perfectly willing to allow her to prefer people whom he did not admire, even people whom he despised, but he would not suffer her to put him on the same level with them. Everybody to his own taste, but at least let everybody have his own taste. He was the less inclined to be patient with Colette, as she seemed to take a delight in gathering round herself all the young men who were most likely to exasperate Christophe, disgusting little snobs, most of them wealthy, all of them idle, or jobbed into a sinecure in some government office which amounts to the same thing. They all wrote, or pretended to write. That was an itch of the Third Republic. It was a sort of indolent vanity, intellectual work being the hardest of all to control, and most easily lending itself to the game of bluff. They never gave more than a discreet, though respectful hint of their great labours. They seemed to be convinced of the importance of their work, staggering under the weight of it, at first Christophe was a little embarrassed by the fact that he had never heard of them or their works. He tried bashfully to ask about them. He was especially anxious to know what one of them had written, a young man who was declared by the others to be a master of the theatre. He was surprised to hear that this great dramatist had written a one-act play taken from a novel, which had been pieced together from a number of short stories, or rather sketches, which he had published in one of the reviews during the past ten years. The baggage of the others was not more considerable. A few one-act plays, a few short stories, a few verses. Some of them had won fame with an article, others with a book which they were going to write. They professed scorn for long-winded books. They seemed to attach extreme importance to the handling of words, and yet the word thought frequently occurred in their conversation. But it did not seem to have the same meaning as is usually given to it. They applied it to the details with style. However, there were among them great thinkers and great ironists who, when they wrote, printed their subtle and profound remarks in italics, so there might be no mistake. They all had the cult of the letter I. It was the only cult they had. They tried to proselytize, but unfortunately other people were subscribers to the cult. They were always conscious of their audience in their way of speaking, walking, smoking, reading a paper, carrying their heads, looking, bowing to each other. Such players' tricks are natural to young people, and the more insignificant, that is to say unoccupied they are, the stronger hold do they have on them. They are more especially paraded before women, for they covet women and long even more to be coveted by them, but even on a chance meeting they will trot out their bag of tricks, even for a passer-by from whom they can expect only a glance of amazement. Christophe often came across these young strutting peacocks, budding painters and musicians, art students, who modelled their appearance on some famous portrait, Van Dyck, Rembrandt, Velasquez, Beethoven, or fitted it to the parts they wished to play. Painter, musician, workman, the profound thinker, the jolly fellow, the Danubian peasant, the natural man. They were always on the lookout to see if they were attracting attention. When Christophe met them in the street, he took a malicious pleasure in looking the other way and ignoring them, but their discomfiture never lasted long. A yard or so further on, they would start strutting for the next comer. But the young men of Colette's little circle were rather more subtle. Their coxcombry was mental. They had two or three models, who were not themselves original, or else they would mimic an idea. Force, joy, pity, solidarity, socialism, anarchism, faith, liberty, all these were parts for their playing. They were horribly clever in making the dearest and rarest thoughts mere literary stuff, and in degrading the most heroic impulses of the human soul to the level of drawing-room commodities, fashionable neckties. But in love they were altogether in their element. That was their special province. The casuistry of pleasure had no secrets for them. They were so clever that they could invent new problems so as to have the honour of solving them. 
That has always been the occupation of people who have nothing else to do. In default of love, they make love. Above all, they explain it. Their notes took up far more room than their text, which, as a matter of fact, was very short. Sociology gave a relish to the most scabrous thoughts. Everything was sheltered beneath the flag of sociology. Though they might have had pleasure in indulging their vices, there would have been something lacking if they had not persuaded themselves that they were labouring in the cause of the new world. That was an eminently Parisian sort of socialism, erotic socialism. Among the problems that were then exercising the little court of love was the equality of men and women in marriage and their respective rights in love. There had been young men, honest, Protestant, and rather ridiculous, Scandinavians and Swiss, who had based equality on virtue, saying that men should come to marriage as chaste as women. The Parisian casuists looked for another sort of equality, an equality based on loss of virtue, saying that women should come to marriage as besmirched as men, the right to take lovers. The Parisians had carried adultery, in imagination and practice, to such a pitch that they were beginning to find it rather insipid, and in the world of letters attempts were being made to support it by a new invention, the prostitution of young girls. I mean regularized, universal, virtuous, decent, domestic, and above all social prostitution. There had just appeared a book on the question, full of talent, which apparently said all there was to be said through four hundred pages of playful pedantry, strictly in accordance with the rules of the Baconian method. It dealt with the best method of controlling the relations of the sexes. It was a lecture on free love, full of talk about manners, propriety, good taste, nobility, beauty, truth, modesty, morality, a regular berquin for young girls who wanted to go wrong. It was, for the moment, the gospel in which Colette's little court rejoiced while they paraphrased it. It goes without saying that, like all disciples, they discarded all the justice, observation, and even humanity that lay behind the paradox, and only retained the evil in it. They plucked all the most poisonous flowers from the little bed of sweetened blossoms, aphorisms of this sort, the taste for pleasure can only sharpen the taste for work. It is monstrous that a girl should become a mother before she has tasted the sweets of life. To have had the love of a worthy and pure-souled man as a girl is the natural preparation of a woman for a wise and considered motherhood. Mothers, said this author, should organize the lives of their daughters with the same delicacy and decency with which they control the liberty of their sons. The time would come when girls would return as naturally from their lovers as now they return from a walk or from taking tea with a friend. Colette laughingly declared that such teaching was very reasonable. Christophe had a horror of it. He exaggerated its importance and the evil that it might do. The French are too clever to bring their literature into practice. These Diderots in miniature are in ordinary life like the genial panurge of the Encyclopedia, Honest citizens, not really a whit less timorous than the rest, it is precisely because they're so timid in action that they amuse themselves with carrying action in thought to the limit of possibility. It is a game without any risk. But Christophe was not a French dilettante. Among the young men of Colette's circle, there was one whom she seemed to prefer, and of course he was the most objectionable of all to Christophe. He was one of those young parvenus of the second generation who form an aristocracy of letters and are the patricians of the Third Republic. His name was Lucien Lévicard. He had quick eyes, set wide apart, an aquiline nose, a fair Van Dyke beard clipped to a point. He was prematurely bald, which did not become him, and he had a silky voice, elegant manners, and fine soft hands, which he was always rubbing together. He always affected an excessive politeness, an exaggerated courtesy, even with people he did not like, and even when he was bent on snubbing them. Christophe had met him before at the literary dinner to which he was taken by Sylvain Cohn, and though they had not spoken to each other, the sound of Lévi Coeur's voice had been enough to rouse a dislike which he could not explain, and he was not to discover the reason for it until much later. There are sudden outbursts of love, and so there are of hate, or to avoid hurting those tender souls who are afraid of the word as of every passion. Let us call it the instinct of health, scenting the enemy and mounting guard against him. Lévi Carr was exactly the opposite of Christophe and represented the spirit of irony and decay which fastened gently, politely, inexorably on all the great things that were left of the dying society. The family, marriage, religion, patriotism, in art on anything that was manly, pure, healthy, 
of the people, faith in ideas, feelings, great men in man. Behind that mode of thought there was only the mechanical pleasure of analysis, analysis pushed to extremes, a sort of animal desire to nibble at thought, the instinct of a worm. And side by side with that ideal of intellectual nibbling was a girlish sensuality, the sensuality of a blue stocking, for, to Le Vicar, everything became literature. Everything was literary copy to him, his own adventures, his vices, and the vices of his friends. He had written novels and plays in which, with much talent, he described the private life of his relations and their most intimate adventures, and those of his friends, his own, his liaisons, among others one with the wife of his best friend. The portraits were well drawn. Everybody praised them, the public, the wife, and his friend. It was impossible for him to gain the confidence or the favours of a woman without putting them into a book. One would have thought that his indiscretions would have produced strained relations with his friends, but there was nothing of the kind. They were hardly more than a little embarrassed. They protested as a matter of form, but at heart they were delighted at being held up to the public gaze en déshabille, so long as their faces were masked. Their modesty was undisturbed. But there was never any spirit of vengeance or even of scandal in his tale-telling. He was no worse a man or lover than the majority. In the very chapters in which he exposed his father and mother and his mistress, he would write of them with a poetic tenderness and charm. He was really extremely affectionate. But he was one of those men who have no need to respect when they love. Quite the contrary. They rather love those whom they can despise a little. That makes the object of their affection seem nearer to them and more human. Such men are of all the least capable of understanding heroism and purity. They are not far from considering them lies or weakness of mind. It goes without saying that such men are convinced that they understand better than anybody else the heroes of art whom they judge with a patronizing familiarity. He got on excellently well with the young women of the rich, idle middle class. He was a companion for them, a sort of depraved servant, only more free and confidential, who gave them instruction and roused their envy. They had hardly any constraint with him, and with the lamp of Psyche in their hands they made a careful study of the hermaphrodite, and he suffered them. Christophe could not understand how a girl like Colette, who seemed to have so refined a nature and a touching eagerness to escape from the degrading round of her life, could find pleasure in such company. Christophe was no psychologist. Lucien Le Vicar could easily beat him on that score. Christophe was Colette's confidant, but Colette was the confidant of Lucien Le Vicar. That gave him a great advantage. It's very pleasant to a woman to feel that she has to deal with a man weaker than herself. She finds food in it at once for her lower and higher instincts. Her maternal instinct is touched by it. Lucien de Vicar knew that perfectly. One of the surest means of touching a woman's heart is to sound that mysterious chord. But in addition, Colette felt that she was weak and cowardly and possessed of instincts of which she was not proud, though she was not inclined to deny them. It pleased her to allow herself to be persuaded by the audacious and nicely calculated confessions of her friend that others were just the same and that human nature must be taken for what it is, and so she gave herself the satisfaction of not resisting inclinations that she found very agreeable, and the luxury of saying that it must be so and that it was wise not to rebel and to be indulgent with what one could not, alas, prevent. There was a wisdom in that, the practice of which contained no element of pain. For anyone who can envisage life with serenity, there is a peculiar relish in remarking the perpetual contrast which exists in the very bosom of society between the extreme refinement of apparent civilization and its fundamental animalism. In every gathering that does not consist only of fossils and petrified souls, there are, as it were, two conversational strata, one above the other one which everybody can hear, between mind and mind, the other, of which very few are conscious, though it is the greater of the two, between instinct and instinct, the beast in man and woman. Often these two strata of conversation are contradictory. While mind and mind are passing the small change of convention, body and body say, desire, aversion, or, more often, curiosity, boredom, disgust. The beast in man and woman, though tamed by centuries of civilization and as cowed as the wretched lions in the tamer's cage, is always thinking of its food. But Christophe had not yet reached that disinterestedness which comes only with age and the death of the passions. He had taken himself very seriously as adviser to Colette. 
she had asked for his help and he saw her in the lightness of her heart exposed to danger so he made no effort to conceal his dislike of lucien de vicar at first that gentleman maintained towards christophe an irreproachable and ironical politeness he too scented the enemy but he thought he had nothing to fear from him he made fun of him without seeming to do so if only he could have had christophe's admiration he would have been on quite good terms with him but that he never could obtain he saw that clearly for christophe had not the art of disguising his feelings and so lucien le vicar passed insensibly from an abstract intellectual antagonism to a little carefully veiled war of which colette was to be the prize she held the balance evenly between her two friends she appreciated christophe's talent and moral superiority but she also appreciated lucien le vicar's amusing immorality and wit and at bottom she found more pleasure in it christophe did not mince his protestations she listened to him with a touching humility which disarmed him she was quite a good creature but she lacked frankness partly from weakness partly from her very kindness she was half play-acting she pretended to think with christophe as a matter of fact she knew the worth of such a friend but she was not ready to make any sacrifice for a friendship she was not ready to sacrifice anything for anybody she just wanted everything to go smoothly and pleasantly and so she concealed from christophe the fact that she went on receiving les siens de vicar she lied with the easy charm of the young women of her class who from their childhood are expert in the practice which is so necessary for those who wish to keep their friends and please everybody she excused herself by pretending that she wished to avoid hurting christophe but in reality it was because she knew that he was right and wanted to go on doing as she liked without quarrelling with him sometimes christophe suspected her tricks then he would scold her and wax indignant she would go on playing the contrite little girl and be affectionate and sorry and she would look tenderly at him femine ultima ratio and really it did distress her to think of losing christophe's friendship she would be charmingly serious and in that way succeeded in disarming christophe for a little while longer but sooner or later there had to be an explosion christophe's irritation was fed unconsciously by a little jealousy and into colette's coaxing tricks there crept a little a very little love all of which made the rupture only the more violent one day when christophe had caught colette out in a flagrant lie he gave her a definite alternative she must choose between lucien le vicar and himself she tried to dodge the question and finally she vindicated her right to have whichever friend she liked she was perfectly right and christophe admitted that he had been absurd but he knew also that he had not been exacting from egoism he had a sincere affection for colette he wanted to save her even against her will he insisted awkwardly she refused to answer he said colette do you want us not to be friends any more she replied no no i should be sorry if you cease to be my friend but you will not sacrifice the smallest thing for our friendship sacrifice what a silly word she said why should one always be sacrificing one thing for another it's just a stupid christian idea you're nothing but an old parson at heart maybe he said i want one thing or another i allow nothing between good and evil not so much as the breadth of a hair yes i know she said that's why i love you for i do love you but but you love the other fellow too she laughed and said with a soft look in her eyes and a tender note in her voice stay he was just about to give in once more when lucien le vicar came in and he was welcomed with the same soft look in her eyes and the same tender note in her voice christophe sat for some time in silence watching colette at her tricks then he went away having made up his mind to break with her he was sick and sorry at heart it was so stupid to grow so fond always to be falling into the trap when he reached home he toyed with his books and idly opened his bible and read quote, the lord saith because the daughters of zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes walking and mincing as they go and making a twinkling with their feet therefore the lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of zion and the lord will discover their secret parts he burst out laughing as he thought of colette's little tricks and he went to bed well pleased with himself then he thought that he too must have become tainted with the corruption of paris for the bible to have become a humorous work to him but he did not stop saying over and over again the judgment of the great judiciary humorist and he tried to imagine its effect on the head of his young friend he went to sleep laughing like a child he had lost all thought of his new sorrow 
one more or less. He was getting used to it. End of section 10. Read by Sandra. Montreal, 2022. Section 11 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canan. The Marketplace. Chapter 2. Part 3. He did not give up Colette's music lessons, but he refused to take the opportunity she gave him of continuing their intimate conversations. It was no use her being sorry about it or offended, and trying all sorts of tricks. He stuck to his guns. They were rude to each other. Of her own accord she took to finding excuses for missing the lessons, and he also made excuses for declining the Stevens' invitations. He had had enough of Parisian society. He could not bear the emptiness of it, the idleness, the moral impotence, the neurasthenia, its aimless, pointless, self-devouring hypercriticism. He wondered how people could live in such a stagnant atmosphere of art for art's sake and pleasure for pleasure's sake. And yet the French did live in it. They had Beep, a great nation, and they still cut something of a figure in the world. At least, they seemed to do so to the outside spectator. But where were the springs of their life? They believed in nothing, nothing but pleasure. Just as Christophe reached this point in his reflections, he ran into a crowd of young men and women, all shouting at the tops of their voices, dragging a carriage in which was sitting an old priest casting blessings right and left. A little farther on he found some French soldiers battering down the doors of a church with axes. There were men attacking them with chairs. He saw that the French still did believe in something, though he could not understand in what. He was told that the state and the church were separated after a century of living together, and that as the church had refused to go with a good grace, standing on its rights and its power, it was being evicted. To Christophe the proceedings seemed ungallant, but he was so sick of the anarchical dilettantism of the Parisian artist that he was delighted to find men ready to have their heads broken for a cause, however foolish it might be. It was not long before he discovered that there were many such people in France. The political journals plunged into the fight like the Homeric heroes. They published daily calls to civil war. It is true that it got no farther than words, and that they very rarely came to blows. But there was no lack of simple souls to put into action what the others declared in words. Strange things happened. Departments threatened to break away from France. Regiments deserted. Prefectures were burned. Tax collectors were on horseback at the head of a company of gendarmes. Peasants were armed with scythes and put their kettles on to boil to defend the churches, which the free thinkers were demolishing in the name of liberty. There were popular redeemers who climbed trees to address the provinces of wine that had risen against the provinces of alcohol. Everywhere there were millions of men shaking hands, all red in the face from shouting, and in the end all going for each other. The Republic flattered the people, and then turned arms against them. The people on their side broke the heads of a few of their own young men, officers and soldiers. And so everyone proved to everybody else the excellence of his cause and his fists. Looked at from a distance, through the newspapers, it was as though the country had gone back a few centuries. Christophe discovered that France, skeptical France, was a nation of fanatics. But it was impossible for him to find out the meaning of their fanaticism. For or against religion. For or against reason for or against the country. They were for and against everything. They were fanatics for the pleasure of it. He spoke about it one evening to a socialist deputy whom he met sometimes at the Stevens. Although he had spoken to him before, he had no idea what sort of man he was. Till then they had only talked about music. Christophe was very surprised to learn that this man of the world was the leader of a violent party. Achille Roussin was a handsome man, with a fair beard, a burring way of talking, a florid complexion, affable manners, a certain polish on his fundamental vulgarity, certain peasant tricks which from time to time he used in spite of himself, a way of paring his nails in public, a vulgar habit of catching hold of the coat of the man he was talking to, or gripping him by the arm. He was a great eater, a heavy drinker, a high liver with a gift of laughter. 
and the appetite of a man of the people pushing his way into power. He was adaptable, quick to alter his manners to sort with his surroundings and the person he was talking to, full of ideas and reasonable in expounding them, able to listen and to assimilate at once everything he heard. For the rest he was sympathetic, intelligent, interested in everything, naturally, or as a matter of acquired habit, or merely out of vanity. He was honest so far as was compatible with his interests, or when it was dangerous not to be so. He had quite a pretty wife, tall, well-made, and well-set up, with a charming figure which was a little too much shown off by her tight dresses, which accentuated and exaggerated the rounded curves of her anatomy. Her face was framed in curly black hair. She had big black eyes, a long, pointed chin. Her face was big, but quite charming in its general effect, though it was spoiled by the twitch of her short-sighted eyes and her silly little pursed-up mouth. She had an affected, precise manner, like a bird, and a simpering way of talking, but she was kindly and amiable. She came of a rich shopkeeping family, broad-minded and virtuous, and she was devoted to the countless duties of society as to a religion, not to mention the duties, social and artistic, which she imposed on herself. She had her salon, dabbled in the university extension movements, and was busy with philanthropic undertakings and researches into the psychology of childhood, all without any enthusiasm or profound interest. From a mixture of natural kindness, snobbishness, and the harmless pedantry of a young woman of education, who always seems to be repeating a lesson and taking pride in showing that she has learned it well. She needed to be busy, but she did not need to be interested in what she was doing. It was like the feverish industry of those women who always have a piece of knitting in their hands and never stop clicking their needles, as though the salvation of the world depended on their work, which they themselves do not know what to do with. And then there was in her, as in women who knit, the vanity of the good woman who sets an example to other women. The deputy had an affectionate contempt for her. He had chosen well both as regards his pleasure and his peace of mind. He enjoyed her beauty and asked no more of her, and she asked no more of him. He loved her and deceived her. She put up with that, provided she had her share of his attention. Perhaps also it gave her a sort of pleasure. She was placid and sensual. She had the attitude of mind of a woman of the harem. They had two fine children of four and five years old, whom she looked after, like a good mother, with the same amiable, cold attentiveness with which she followed her husband's political career, and the latest fashions in dress and art. And it produced in her the most odd mixture of advanced ideas, ultra-decadent art, polite restlessness, and bourgeois sentiment. They invited Christophe to go and see them. Madame Roussin was a good musician, and played the piano charmingly. She had a delicate, firm touch, with her little head bowed over the keyboard, and her hands poised above it and darting down. She was like a pecking hen. She was talented and knew more about music than most French women, but as she was as insensible as a fish to the deeper meaning of music, to her it was only a succession of notes, rhythms, and degrees of sound, to which she listened or reproduced carefully. She never looked for the soul in it, having no use for it herself. This amiable, intelligent, simple woman, who was always ready to do anyone a kindness, gave Christophe the graceful welcome which she extended to everybody. Christophe was not particularly grateful to her for it. He was not much in sympathy with her. She hardly existed for him. Perhaps it was that unconsciously he could not forgive her acquiescence in her husband's infidelities of which she was by no means ignorant. Passive acceptance was of all the vices that which he could least excuse. He was more intimate with Achille Roussin. Roussin loved music, as he loved the other arts, crudely but sincerely. When he liked a symphony, it became a thing that he could take into his arms. He had a superficial culture and turned it to good account. His wife had been useful to him there. He was interested in Christophe because he saw in him a vigorous vulgarian such as he was himself, and he found it absorbing to study an original of his stamp. He was unwearying in his observation of humanity, and to discover his impressions of Paris. The frankness and rudeness of Christophe's remarks amused him. He was skeptic enough to admit their truth. 
He was not put out by the fact that Christoph was a German. On the contrary, he prided himself on being above the national prejudice. And, when all was said and done, he was sincerely human. That was his chief quality. He sympathized with everything human, but that did not prevent his being quite convinced of the superiority of the French, an old race, an old civilization, over the Germans, and making fun of the Germans. At Achille Roussin's, Christophe met other politicians, the ministers of yesterday and the ministers of tomorrow. He would have been only too glad to talk to each of them individually if these illustrious persons had thought him worthy. In spite of the generally accepted opinion, he found them much more interesting than the other Frenchmen of his acquaintance. They were more alive mentally, more open to the passions and the great interests of humanity. They were brilliant talkers, mostly men from the South, and they were amazingly dilettante. Individually, they were almost as much so as the men of letters. Of course, they were very ignorant about art, and especially about foreign art, but they all pretended more or less to some knowledge of it, and often they really loved it. They were councils which were very like the coterie of some little review. One of them would be a playwright, another would scrape on the violin, and another would be a besotted Wagnerian, and they all collected impressionist pictures, read decadent books, and prided themselves on a taste for some ultra-aristocratic art, which was almost always in direct opposition to their ideas. It puzzled Christoph to find these socialist or radical socialist ministers, these apostles of the poor and downtrodden, posing as connoisseurs of eclectic art. No doubt they had a perfect right to do so, but it seemed to him rather disloyal. But the odd thing was when these men who in private conversation were skeptics, sensualists, nihilists, and anarchists came to action, at once they became fanatics. Even the most dilettante of them, when they came into power, became like oriental despots. They had a mania for ordering everything, and let nothing alone. They were skeptical in mind and tyrannical in temper. The temptation to use the machinery of administrative centralization created by the greatest of despots was too great, and it was difficult not to abuse it. The result was a sort of republican imperialism onto which there had latterly been grafted an atheistic Catholicism. For some time past, the politicians had made no claim to do anything but control the body, that is to say, money. They hardly troubled the soul at all, since the soul could not be converted into money. Their own souls were not concerned with politics. They passed above or below politics, which in France are thought of as a branch, a lucrative, though not very exalted branch of commerce and industry. The intellectuals despised the politicians. The politicians despised the intellectuals. But lately there had been a closer understanding than an alliance between the politicians and the lowest class of intellectuals. A new power had appeared upon the scene, which had arrogated to itself the absolute government of ideas, the free thinkers. They had thrown in their lot with the other power, which had seen in them the perfect machinery of political despotism. They were trying not so much to destroy the church as to supplant it, and, in fact, they created a church of free thought which had its catechisms and ceremonies, its baptisms, its confirmations, its marriages, its regional councils, if not its ecumenicals at Rome. It was most pitifully comic to see these thousands of poor wretches having to band themselves together in order to be able to think freely. True, their freedom of thought consisted in setting a ban on the thought of others in the name of reason, for they believed in reason as the Catholics believed in the Blessed Virgin without ever dreaming for a moment that reason, like the Virgin, was in itself nothing, or that the real thing lay behind it. And, just as the Catholic Church had its armies of monks and its congregations stealthily creeping through the veins of the nation, propagating its views and destroying every other sort of vitality, so the anti-Catholic Church had its Freemasons, whose chief lodge, the Grand Orient, kept a faithful record of all the secret reports with which their pious informers in all quarters of France supplied them. The Republican state secretly encouraged the sacred espionage of these mendicant friars and Jesuits of reason, who terrorized the army, the university, and every branch of the state. And it was never noticed that while they 
pretended to serve the state, they were all the time aiming at supplanting it, and that the country was slowly moving towards an atheistic theocracy, very little, if anything, different from that of the Jesuits of Paraguay. Christophe met some of these gentry at Roussel's. They were all blind fetish worshippers. At that time they were rejoicing at having removed Christ from the courts of law. They thought they had destroyed religion because they had destroyed a few pieces of wood and ivory. Others were concentrating on Joan of Arc and her banner of the Virgin, which they had just wrested from the Catholics. One of the fathers of the new church, a general who was waging war on the French of the old church, had just given utterance to an anti-clerical speech in honor of Vercingetorix. He proclaimed the ancient Gaul, to whom free thought had erected a statue, to be a son of the people and the first champion against the Church of Rome. The ministers of the marine, by way of purifying the fleet and showing their horror of war, called their cruisers Descartes and Ernest Renan. Other free thinkers had set themselves to purify art. They expurgated the classics of the 17th century and did not allow the name of God to sully the fables of La Fontaine. They did not allow it in music either, and Christophe heard one of them, an old radical, to be a radical in old age, says Goethe, is the height of folly, wax indignant at the religious Leda of Beethoven, having been given at a popular concert. He demanded that other words should be used instead of God. What? asked Christophe in exasperation. The Republic? Others who were even more radical would accept no compromise and wanted purely and simply to suppress all religious music and all schools in which it was taught. In vain did a director of the University of Fine Arts, who was considered an Athenian in that Boeotia, try to explain that musicians must be taught music. For, as he said, with great loftiness of thought, when you send a soldier to the barracks, you teach him how to use a gun and then how to shoot. And so it is with a young composer. His head is buzzing with ideas, but he has not yet learned to put them in order. And, being a little scared by his own courage, he protested with every sentence, I am an old free thinker. I am an old Republican. And he declared audaciously that he did not care much whether the compositions of Pergolese were operas or masses. All that he wanted to know was, were they human works of art? But his adversary with implacable logic answered the old free thinker and Republican that there were two sorts of music, that which was sung in churches and that which was sung in other places. The first sort was the enemy of reason and the state, and the reason of the state ought to suppress it. All these silly people who would have been more ridiculous than dangerous if behind them there had not been men of real worth, supporting them, who were, like them, and perhaps even more, fanatics of reason. Tolstoy speaks somewhere of those epidemic influences which prevail in religion, philosophy, politics, art, and science. Insensate influences, the folly of which only becomes apparent to men when they are clear of them, while as long as they are under their dominion they seem so true to them that they think them beyond all argument. Instances are the craze for tulips, belief in sorcery, and the aberrations of literary fashions. The religion of reason was such a craze. It was common to the most ignorant and the most cultured to the sub-veterinaries of the chamber, and certain of the keenest intellects at the university. It was even more dangerous in the latter than in the former, for with the latter it was mixed up with a credulous and stupid optimism, which sapped its energy, while with the others it was fortified and given a keener edge by a fanatical pessimism which was under no illusion as to the fundamental antagonism of nature and reason, and they were only the more desperately resolved to wage the war of abstract liberty, abstract justice, abstract truth, against the malevolence of nature. There was behind it all the idealism of the Calvinists, the Jansenists, and the Jacobins, the old belief in the fundamental perversity of mankind, which can and must be broken by the implacable pride of the elect, inspired by the breath of reason, the spirit of God. It was a very French type, the type of intelligent Frenchman who is not at all human, a pebble as hard as iron. Nothing can penetrate it. It breaks everything that it touches. Christophe was appalled by the conversations that he had at Achille Roussin's with some of these fanatics. It upset all his ideas about France. He had thought, like so many people, that the French were a well-balanced, sociable, tolerant, liberty-loving people. And he found them lunatics with their abstract ideas, their diseased logic, ready to sacrifice themselves and everybody else for one of their syllogisms. 
they were always talking of liberty, but there never were men less able to understand it or stand it. Nowhere in the world were their characters more coldly and atrociously despotic in their passion for intellect or their passion for always being in the right. And it was not only true of one party. Every party was the same. They could not, they would not, see anything above or beyond their political or religious formula, or their country, their province, their group, or their own narrow minds. There were anti-Semites who expended all the forces of their being in a blind, impotent hatred of all the privileges of wealth, for they hated all Jews, and called those whom they hated Jews. There were nationalists who hated, when they were kinder they stopped short at despising, every other nation, and even among their own people, they called everybody who did not agree with them foreigners, or renegades, or traitors. There were anti-Protestants who persuaded themselves that all Protestants were English or Germans, and would have them all expelled from France. There were men of the West who denied the existence of anything east of the Rhine, men of the North who denied the existence of everything south of the Loire, men of the South who called all those who lived north of the Loire barbarians, and there were men who boasted of being of Gallic descent, and, craziest of all, there were Romans who prided themselves on the defeat of their ancestors, and Breton, and Lorrainian, and Philibre, and Aubigeois, and men from Carpentras, and Pontoise, and Kimper Corentin. They all thought only of themselves. The fact of being themselves was sufficient patent of nobility, and they would not put up with the idea of people being anything else. There is nothing to be done with such people. They will not listen to argument from any other point of view. They must burn everybody else at the stake, or be burned themselves. Christophe thought that it was lucky that such people should live under a republic, for all these little despots did at least annihilate each other. But if any one of them had become emperor or king, it would have been the end of him. He did not know that there is one virtue left to work the salvation of people of that temper of mind, in consequence. The French politicians were no exception. Their despotism was tempered with anarchy. They were forever swinging between two poles. On one hand, they relied on the fanatics of thought. On the other, they relied on the anarchists of thought. Mixed up with them was a whole rabble of dilettante socialists, mere opportunists, who held back from taking any part in the fight until it was won, though they followed in the wake of the army of free thought. And, after every battle won, they swooped down on the spoils. These champions of reason did not labor in the cause of reason, sic vos non vobis, but in the cause of the citizens of the world, who with glad shouts trampled underfoot the traditions of the country, and had no intention of destroying one faith in order to set up another, but in order to set themselves up and break away from all restraint. There Christophe marked the likeness of Lucien Levicour. He was not surprised to learn that Lucien Levicour was a socialist. He only thought that socialists must be fairly on the road to success to have enrolled Lucien Levicour. But he did not know that Lucien Levicour was also contrived to figure in the opposite camp, where he had succeeded in allying himself with men of the most anti-liberal opinions, if not anti-Semite, in politics and art. He asked Achille Roussin, how can you put up with such men? Roussin replied, He is so clever, and he is working for us. He is destroying the old world. He is doing that all right, said Christophe. He is destroying it so thoroughly that I don't see what is going to be left for you to build up again. Do you think there will be timber enough left for your new house? And are you even sure that the worms have not crept into your building yard? Lucien Levicour was not the only nibbler at socialism. The socialist papers were staffed by these petty men of letters, with their art for art's sake, these licentious anarchists who had fastened on all the roads that might lead to success. They barred the way to others, and filled the papers, which styled themselves the organs of the people, with their dilettante decadence and their struggle for life. They were not content with being jobbed into positions. They wanted fame. Never had there been a time when there were so many premature statues, or so many speeches delivered at the unveiling of them. But queerest of all were the banquets that were periodically offered to one or other of the great men of the fraternity by the sycophants of fame, not in celebration of any of their deeds, but in celebration of some honor given to them, for those were the things that most appealed to them. Esthetes, 
supermen, socialist ministers, they were all agreed when it was a question of feasting to celebrate some promotion in the Legion of Honor founded by the Corsican officer. Roussin laughed at Christophe's amazement. He did not think the German far out in his estimation of the supporters of his party. When they were alone together, he would handle them severely himself. He knew their stupidity and their knavery better than anyone but that did not keep him from supporting them in order to retain their support. And if in private he never hesitated to speak of the people in terms of contempt, on the platform he was a different man. Then he would assume a high-pitched voice, shrill, nasal, labored, solemn tones, a tremolo, a bleat, wide, sweeping, fluttering gestures like the beating of wings, exactly like Mounet Souli. Christophe tried hard to discover exactly how far Roussin believed in his socialism. It was obvious that at heart he did not believe in it at all. He was too skeptical, yet he did believe in it to a certain extent, and though he knew perfectly well that it was only a part of his mind that believed in it, perhaps the most important part, he had arranged his life and conduct in accordance with it, because it suited him best. It was not only his practical interest that was served by it, but also his vital interests, the foundations of his being and all his actions. His socialistic faith was to him a sort of state religion. Most people live like that. Their lives are based on religious, moral, social, or purely practical beliefs. Belief in their profession, in their work, in the utility of the part they play in life, in which they do not, at heart, believe. But they do not wish to know it, for they must have this apparent faith, this state religion, of which every man is priest, to live. End of section 11. Section 12 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Cannon. The Marketplace. Two, part four. Roussin was not one of the worst. There were many, many others who called themselves socialists and radicals from, it can hardly be called ambition, for their ambition was so short-sighted and did not go beyond immediate plunder and their re-election. They pretended to believe in a new order of society perhaps there was a time when they believed in it and they went on pretending to do so but in fact they had no idea beyond living on the spoils of the dying order of society this predatory nihilism was saved by a short-sighted opportunism the great interests of the future were sacrificed to the egoism of the present they cut down the army they would have dislocated the country to please the electors they were not lacking in cleverness they knew perfectly well what they ought to have done but they did not do it because it would have cost them too much effort and they were incapable of effort they wanted to arrange their own lives and the life of the nation with the least possible amount of trouble and sacrifice all down the scale the point was to get the maximum of pleasure with the minimum of effort this was their morality immoral enough but it was the only guide in the political muddle in which the leaders set the example of anarchy and the disordered pack of politicians were chasing ten hares at once and letting them all escape one after the other and an aggressive foreign office was yoked with a pacific war office and ministers of war were cutting down the army in order to purify it naval ministers were inciting the workmen in the arsenals military instructors were preaching the horrors of war and all the officials judges revolutionaries and patriots were dilettante the political demoralization was universal every man was expecting the state to provide him with office honors pensions indemnities and the government did as a matter of fact feed the appetite of its supporters honors and pensions were made the quarry of the sons nephews grandnephews and valets of those in power 
the deputies were always voting an increase in their own salaries revenues posts titles all the possessions of the state were being blindly squandered and like a sinister echo of the example of the upper classes the lower classes were always on the verge of a strike they had men teaching contempt of authority and revolt against the established order post office employees burned letters and dispatches workers and factories threw sand or emery powder into the gears of the machines men working in the arsenal sacked them ships were burned and artisans deliberately made a horrible mess of their work the destruction not of riches but of the wealth of the world and to crown it all the intellectuals amused themselves by discovering that this national suicide was based on reason and right in the sacred right of every human being to be happy there was a morbid humanitarianism which broke down the distinction between good and evil and developed a sentimental pity for the sacred and irresponsible human in the criminal the doting sentimentality of an old man it was a capitulation to crime the surrender of society to its mercies christophe thought france is drunk with liberty when she has raved and screamed she will fall down dead drunk and when she wakes up she will find herself in prison what hurt christophe most in this demagogy was to see the most violent political measures coldly carried through by these men whose fundamental instability he knew perfectly well the disproportion between the shiftiness of these men and the rigorous acts that they passed or authorized was too scandalous it was as though there were in them two contradictory things an inconsistent character believing in nothing and discursive reason intent on truncating mowing down and crushing life without regard for anything christophe wondered why the peaceful middle class the catholics the officials who were harassed in every conceivable way did not throw them all out by the window he dared not tell roussin what he thought but as he was incapable of concealing anything roussin had no difficulty in guessing it he laughed and said no doubt that is what you or i would do but there is no danger of them doing it they are just a set of poor devils who haven't the energy they can't do much more than grumble they're just the fag end of an aristocracy idiotic stultified by their clubs and their sport prostituted by the americans and the jews and by way of showing how up-to-date they are they play the degraded parts allotted to them in fashionable plays and support those who have degraded them they're an apathetic and surly middle class they read nothing understand nothing don't want to understand anything they only know how to vilify vilify vaguely bitterly futilely and they have only one passion sleep to lie huddled in sleep on their money-bags hating anybody who disturbs them and even anybody whose tastes differ from theirs for it does upset them to think of other people working while they are snoozing if you knew them you would sympathize with us but christophe could find nothing but disgust with both for he did not hold that the baseness of the oppressed was any excuse for that of the oppressor only too frequently had he met at the stevens types of the rich dull middle class that roussin described l'anime triste de colera que visse sans a infamia and sans a lodo he saw only too clearly the reason why roussin and his friends were sure not only of their power over these people but of their right to abuse it they had to hand all the instruments of tyranny thousands of officials who had renounced their will in every vestige of personality and obeyed blindly a loose vulgar way of living a republic without republicans socialist papers and socialist leaders grovelling before royalties when they visited paris the souls of servants gaping at titles and gold lace and orders they could be kept quiet by just having a bone to gnaw or the legion of honour flung at them if the kings had ennobled all the citizens of france all the citizens of france would have been royalist the politicians were having a fine time of the three estates of eighty nine the first was extinct the second was proscribed suspect or had emigrated the third was gorged by its victory and slept and as for the fourth estate which had come into existence at a later date and had become a public menace in its jealousy there was no difficulty about squaring that the decadent republic treated it as decadent rome treated the barbarian hordes that she no longer had the power to drive from her frontiers she assimilated them and they quickly became her best watch-dogs 
the ministers of the middle class called themselves socialists lured away and annexed to their own party the most intelligent and vigorous of the working class they robbed the proletariat of their leaders infused their new blood into their own system and in return gorged them with indigestible science and middle-class culture one of the most curious features of these attempts at distraint by the middle class on the people were the popular universities they were little jumbled sales of scraps of knowledge of every period and every country as one syllabus declared they set out to teach quote, every branch of physical biological and sociological science astronomy cosmology anthropology ethnology physiology psychology psychiatry geography languages aesthetics logic etc end of quote enough to split the skull of pico della mirandola in truth it had been originally and still was in some of them a certain grand idealism a keen desire to bring truth beauty and morality within the reach of all which was a very fine thing it was wonderful and touching to see workmen after a hard day's toil crowding into narrow stuffy lecture-rooms impelled by a thirst for knowledge that was stronger than fatigue and hunger but how the poor fellows had been tricked there were a few real apostles intelligent human beings a few upright warm-hearted men with more good intentions than skill to accomplish them but as against them there were hundreds of fools idiots schemers unsuccessful authors orators professors parsons speakers pianists critics anarchists who deluged the people with their productions every man jack of them was trying to unload his stock and trade the most thriving of them were naturally the nostrum mongers the philosophical lecturers who ladled out general ideas leavened with a few facts a scientific smattering and cosmological conclusions the popular universities were also an outlet for the ultra aristocratic works of art decadent etchings poetry and music the aim was the elevation of the people for the rejuvenation of thought and the regeneration of the race they began by inoculating them with all the fads and cranks of the middle class they gulped them down greedily not because they liked them but because they were middle class christophe who was taken to one of these popular universities by madame Roussin, heard her play debussy to the people between la bonne chanson of gabriel faure and one of the later quartets of beethoven he who had only begun to grasp the meaning of the later works of beethoven after many years and long weary labor asked some one who sat near him pityingly do you understand it the man drew himself up like an angry cock and said certainly why shouldn't i understand it as well as you and by way of showing that he understood it he encored a fugue glaring defiantly at christophe christophe went away he was amazed he said to himself that the swine had succeeded in poisoning even the living wells of the nation the people had ceased to be people yourselves as a working man said to one of the would-be founders of the theatres of the people i am as much of the middle class as you one fine evening when above the darkening town the soft sky was like an oriental carpet rich in warm faded colours christophe walked along by the river from notre dame to the invalides in the dim fading light the tower of the cathedral rose like the arms of moses held up during the battle the carved golden spire of the saint chapelle the flowering holy thorn flashed out of the labyrinth of houses on the other side of the water stretched the royal front of the louvre and its windows were like weary eyes lit up with the last living rays of the setting sun at the back of the great square of the invalides behind its trenches and proud walls majestic solitary floated the dull gold tome like a symphony of bygone victories and at the top of the hill there stood the arc de triomphe bestriding the hill with the giant stride of the imperial legions and suddenly christophe thought of it all as of a dead giant lying prone upon the plain the terror of it clutched at his heart he stopped to gaze at the gigantic fossils of a fabulous race long since extinct that in its life had made the whole earth ring with the tramp of its armies the race whose helmet was the dome of the invalide whose girdle was a louvre the thousand arms of whose cathedrals had clutched at the heavens who traversed the whole world with the triumphant stride of the arch of napoleon under whose heel there now swarmed lilliput end of section twelve section thirteen of jean christophe in paris this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canan. The Marketplace, Chapter 3, Part 1. Without any deliberate effort on his part, Christophe had gained a certain celebrity in the Parisian circles to which he had been introduced by Sylvain Cohn and Gougeau. He was seen everywhere with one or the other of his friends, at first nights and at concerts, and his extraordinary face, his ugliness, the absurdity of his figure and costume, his brusque, awkward manners, the paradoxical opinions to which he gave vent from time to time, his undeveloped but large and healthy intellect, and the romantic story spread by Sylvain Cohn about his escapades in Germany and his complications with the police and flight to France, had marked him out for the idle, restless curiosity of the great cosmopolitan hotel drawing room that Paris has become. As long as he held himself in check, observing, listening, and trying to understand before expressing any opinion, as long as nothing was known of his work or what he really thought, he was tolerated. The French were pleased with him for having been unable to stay in Germany, and the French musicians especially were delighted with Christophe's unjust pronouncements on German music, and took them all as homage to themselves. As a matter of fact, they heard only his youthful opinions, in many of which he would no longer have subscribed. A few articles published in a German review, which had been amplified and circulated by Sylvain Kahn. Christophe was interesting and did not interfere with anybody. There was no danger of his supplanting anybody. He needed only to become the great man of a coterie. He needed only not to write anything, or as little as possible, and not to have anything performed and to supply Gujar and his like with ideas. Gujar and the whole set of men, whose motto is the famous quip, adapted a little. My glass is small, but I drink the wine of others. A strong personality sheds its rays, especially on young people, who are more concerned with feeling than with action. There were plenty of young people about Christophe. They were, for the most part, idle, willless, aimless, purposeless. Young men, living in dread of work, fearful of being left alone with themselves, who sought an armchair immortality, wandering from café to theatre, from theatre to café, finding all sorts of excuses for not going home, to avoid coming face to face with themselves. They came and stayed for hours, dawdling, talking, making aimless conversation, and going away empty, aching, disgusted, satiated, and yet famishing, forced to go on with it in spite of loathing, they surrounded Christophe, like Goethe's water spaniel, the lurking spectres that lie in wait and seize upon a soul and fasten upon its vitality. A vain fool would have found pleasure in such a circle of parasites, but Christophe had no taste for pedestals. He was revolted by the idiotic subtlety of his admirers, who read into anything he did all sorts of absurd meanings, Renanian, Nietzschean, hermaphroditic. He kicked them out. He was not made for passivity. Everything in him cried aloud for action. He observed so as to understand. He wished to understand so as to act. He was free of the constraint of any school and of any prejudice, and he inquired into everything, read everything, and studied all the forms of thought and the resources of the expression of other countries and other ages in his art. He seized on all those which seemed to him effective and true. Unlike the French artists whom he studied, who were ingenious inventors of new forms and wore themselves out in the unceasing effort of invention and gave up the struggle halfway, he endeavored not so much to invent a new musical language as to speak the authentic language of music with more energy. His aim was not to be particular, but to be strong. His passion for strength was the very opposite of the French genius for subtlety and moderation. He scorned style for the sake of style and art for art's sake. The best French artists seemed to him to be no more than pleasure-mongers. One of the most perfect poets in Paris had amused himself with drawing up a list of the workers in contemporary French poetry with their talents, their productions, and their earnings, and he enumerated the crystals, the oriental fabrics, the gold and bronze metals, the lace for dowagers, the polychromatic sculpture, the painted porcelain, which had been produced in the workshops of his various colleagues. He pictured himself in the corner of a vast factory of letters, mending old tapestry or polishing up rusty halberds. Such a conception of the artist as a good workman, thinking only of the perfection of his craft, was not without an element of greatness. 
but it did not satisfy Christophe, and while he admitted in it a certain professional dignity, he had a contempt for the poor quality of life which most often it disguised. He could not understand writing for the sake of writing, or talking for the sake of talking. He never said words. He said, or wanted to say, the things themselves. E dice cose, e voi dite parole. After a long period of rest, during which he had been entirely occupied with taking in a new world, Christophe suddenly became conscious of an imperious need for creation. The antagonism which he felt between himself and Paris called up all his reserve of force by its challenge of his personality. All his passions were brimming in him, and imperiously demanding expression. They were of every kind, and they were all equally insistent. He tried to create, to fashion music, into which to turn the love and hatred that were swelling in his heart, and the will and the renunciation, and all the daemon struggling within him, all of whom had an equal right to live. Hardly had he assuaged one passion in music, sometimes he hardly had the patience to finish it, than he hurled himself at the opposite passion. But the contradiction was only apparent if they were always changing. They were, in truth, always the same. He beat out roads in music, roads that led to the same goal. His soul was a mountain. He tried every pathway up it. On some he wound easily, dallying in the shade. On others he mounted toilsomely, with the hot sun beating up from the dry, sandy track, they all led to God, enthroned on the summit. Love, hatred, evil, renunciation, all the forces of humanity at their highest pitch touched eternity and were a part of it. For every man the gateway to eternity is in himself. For the believer as for the atheist, for him who sees life everywhere as for him who everywhere denies it, and for him who doubts both life and the denial of it and for Christoph, in whose soul there met all these opposing views of life, all the opposites became one in eternal force. For Christoph, the chief thing was to wake that force within himself and in others, to fling armfuls of wood upon the fire, to feed the flames of eternity, and make them roar and flicker. Through the voluptuous night of Paris, a great flame darted in his heart. He thought himself free of faith, and he was a living torch of faith. Nothing was more calculated to outrage the French spirit of irony. Faith is one of the feelings which a too civilized society can least forgive, for it has lost it and hates others to possess it. In the blind or mocking hostility of the majority of men towards the dreams of youth, there is for many a bitter thought that they themselves were once even as they, and had ambitions, and never realized them. All those who have denied their souls, all those who had the seed of work within them, and have not brought it forth, rather to accept the security of an easy, honorable life, think, since I could not do the thing I dreamed, why should they do the things they dream? I will not have them do it. How many head of gabblers are there among men? What a relentless struggle is there to crush out strength in its new freedom? With what skill is it killed by silence, irony, wear and tear, discouragement, and at the crucial moment betrayed by some treacherous seductive art? The type is of all nations. Christoph knew it, for he had met it in Germany. Against such people he was armed. His method of defense was simple. He was the first to attack, pounced on the first move, and declared war on them. He forced these dangerous friends to become his enemies. But if such a policy of frankness was an excellent safeguard for his personality, it was not calculated to advance his career as an artist. Once more, Christoph began his German tactics. It was too strong for him. Only one thing was altered, his temper. He was in a fine fettle. Light-heartedly, for the benefit of anybody who cared to listen, he expressed his unmeasured criticism of French artists, and so he made many enemies. He did not take the precaution, as a wise man would have done, of surrounding himself with a little coterie. He would have found no difficulty in gathering about him a number of artists who would gladly have admired him if he had admired them. There were some who admired him in advance, investing admiration, as it were, they considered any man they praised as a debtor, of whom, at a given moment, they could demand repayment. But it was a good investment. But Christoph was a very bad investment. He never paid back. Worse than that, he was barefaced enough to consider poor the works of men who thought his good. Unavowedly, they were rancorous, and engaged themselves on the next opportunity to pay him back in kind. Among his other indiscretions, Christophe was foolish enough to declare war on Lucien Lévy-Cour. 
He found him in the way, everywhere, and he could not conceal an extraordinary antipathy for the gentle, polite creature who was doing no apparent harm, and even seemed to be kinder than himself, and was, at any rate, far more moderate. He provoked him into argument, and however insignificant the subject might be, Christophe always brought into it a sudden heat and bitterness which surprised their hearers. It was as though Christophe were seizing every opportunity of battering at Lucien Lévy-Cour, head down, but he could never reach him. His enemy had an extraordinary skill, even when he was most obviously in the wrong, in carrying it off well. He would defend himself with a courtesy which showed up Christophe's bad manners. Christophe still spoke French very badly, interlarding it with slang, and often with very coarse expressions which he had picked up, and, like many foreigners, used wrongly, and he was incapable of outwitting the tactics of Lucien Levy Corps, and he raged furiously against his gentle irony. Everybody thought him in the wrong, for they could not see what Christophe vaguely felt, the hypocrisy of that gentleness, which when it was brought up against a force which it could not hold in check, tried quietly to stifle it by silence. He was in no hurry, for, like Christophe, he counted on time, not as Christophe did, to build, but to destroy. He had no difficulty in detaching Sylvain, Conn, and Goujard from Christophe, just as he had gradually forced him out of the Stevens circle. He was isolating Christophe. Christophe himself helped him. He pleased nobody, for he would not join any party, but was rather against all parties. He did not like the Jews, but he liked the anti-Semites even less. He was revolted by the cowardice of the masses stirred up against a powerful minority, not because it was bad, but because it was powerful, and by the appeal to the basest instincts of jealousy and hatred. The Jews came to regard him as an anti-Semite, and the anti-Semites looked on him as a Jew. As for the artists, they felt his hostility. Instinctively, Christoph made himself more German than he was in art. Revolting against the voluptuous ataraxia of a certain class of Parisian music, he set up, with violence, a manly, healthy pessimism. When joy appeared in his music, it was with a want of taste, a vulgar ardor, which were well calculated to disgust even the aristocratic patrons of popular art, an erudite, crude form. In his reaction, he was not far from affecting an apparent carelessness in style and a disregard of external originality, which were bound to be offensive to the French musicians. And so those of them to whom he sent some of his work, without any careful consideration, visited on it the contempt they had for the belated Wagnerism of the contemporary German school. Christophe did not care. He laughed inwardly and repeated the lines of a charming musician of the French Renaissance adapted to his own case. Come, come, don't worry about those who will say, Christophe has not the counterpoint of A, and he has not such harmony as Monsieur B. I have something else which they will never see. But when he tried to have some of his music performed, he found the doors shut against him. They had quite enough to do to play, or not to play, the works of young French musicians, and could not bother about those of an unknown German. Christophe did not go on trying. He shut himself up in his room and went on writing. He did not much care whether the people of Paris heard him or not. He wrote for his own pleasure and not for success. The true artist is not concerned with the future of his work. He is like those painters of the Renaissance who joyously painted mural decorations, knowing full well that in ten years nothing would be left of them. So Christophe worked on in peace, quite good-humouredly, resigned to waiting for better times, when help would come to him from some unexpected source. Christophe was then attracted by the dramatic form. He dared not yet surrender freely to the flood of his own lyrical impulse. He had to run it into definite channels, and no doubt it is a good thing for a young man of genius, who is not yet master of himself, and does not even know exactly what he is, to set voluntary bounds upon himself, and to confine therein the soul of which he has so little hold. They are the dikes and sluices which allow the course of thought to be directed. Unfortunately, Christophe had not a poet. He had himself to fashion his subjects out of legend and history. Among the visions which had been floating before his mind for some months past were certain figures from the Bible. That Bible, which his mother had given him as a companion in his exile, had been a source of dreams to him. Although he did not read it in any religious spirit, the moral, or rather vital energy, of that Hebraic Iliad had been to him a spring in which, in the evenings, he washed his naked soul of the smoke and mud of Paris. 
He was concerned with the sacred meaning of the book, but it was not the less a sacred book to him for the breath of savage nature and primitive individualities that he found in its pages. He drew in its hymns of the earth, consumed with faith, quivering mountains, exultant skies, and human lions. One of the characters in the book for whom he had an especial tenderness was the young David. He did not give him the ironic smile of the Florentine boy or the tragic intensity of the sublime works of Michelangelo and Verrocchio. He knew them not. His David was a young shepherd poet with a virgin soul in which heroism slumbered, a Siegfried of the South, of a finer race and more beautiful and of greater harmony in mind and body. For his revolt against the Latin spirit was in vain. Unconsciously, he had been permeated by that spirit. Not only art influences art, not only mind and thought, but everything about the artist. People, things, gestures, movements, lines, the light of each town. The atmosphere of Paris is very powerful. It molds even the most rebellious souls, and the soul of a German is less capable than any other of resisting it. In vain does he gird himself in his national pride. Of all Europeans, the German is the most easily denationalized. Unwittingly, the soul of Christoph had already begun to assimilate from Latin art a clarity, a sobriety, an understanding of the emotions, and even up to a point, a plastic beauty, which otherwise it never would have had. His David was the proof of it. He had endeavored to recreate certain episodes of the youth of David, the meeting with Saul, the fight with Goliath, and he had written the first scene. He had conceived it as a symphonic picture with two characters. On a deserted plateau, on a moor covered with heather and bloom, the young shepherd lay dreaming in the sun, the serene light, the hum and buzz of tiny creatures, the sweet whispering of the waving grass, the silvery tinkling of the grazing sheep, the mighty beat and rhythm of the earth sang through the dreaming boy, unconscious of his divine destiny, drowsing. His voice and the notes of his flute joined the harmonious silence, and his song was so commonly, so limpidly joyous, that hearing it, there could be no thought of joy or sorrow, only the feeling that it must be so and could not be otherwise. Suddenly over the moor reached great shadows. The air was still. Life seemed to withdraw into the veins of the earth. Only the music of the flute went on calmly. Saul, with his crazy thoughts passed, the mad king, racked by his fancy, burned like a flame, devouring itself, flung this way and that by the wind. He breathed prayers and violent abuse, hurling defiance at the void about him, the void within himself. And when he could speak no more and fell breathless to the ground, there rang through the silence the smiling peace of the song of the young shepherd who had never ceased. Then, with a furious beating in his heart, came Saul in silence up to where the boy lay in the heather. In silence he gazed at him. He sat down by his side and placed his fevered hand on the cool brows of the shepherd. Untroubled, David turned and smiled and looked at the king. He laid his hand on Saul's knees and went on singing and playing his flute. Evening came. David went to sleep in the middle of his song, and Saul wept. And through the starry night there rose once more the serene, joyous hymn of nature refreshed, the song of thanksgiving of the soul relieved of its burden. When he wrote the scene, Christoph had thought of nothing but his own joy. He had never given a thought to the manner of its performance, and it had certainly never occurred to him that it might be produced on the stage. He meant it to be sung at a concert at such time as the concert hall should be open to him. One evening he spoke of it to Achille Roussin, and when, by request, he had tried to give him an idea of it on the piano, he was amazed to see Roussin burst into enthusiasm and declare that it must at all costs be produced at one of the theaters, and that he would see to it. He was even more amazed when a few days later he saw that Roussin was perfectly serious, and his amazement grew to stupefaction when he heard that Sylvain Caen, Gujar, and Lucien Lévy Couleur were taking it up. He had to admit that their personal animosity had yielded to their love of art, and he was much surprised. The only man who was not eager to see his work produced was himself. It was not suited to the theater. It was nonsense, and almost hurtful to stage it. But Roussin was so insistent, Sylvain Caen so persuasive, and Gujar so positive, that Christophe yielded to their temptation. He was weak. He was so longing to hear his music. It was quite easy for Roussin. Manager and artist rushed to please him. 
It happened that a newspaper was organizing a benefit matinee for some charity. It was arranged that the David should be produced. A good orchestra was got together. As for the singers, Poussin claimed that he had found the ideal representative of David. The rehearsals were begun. The orchestra came through the first reading fairly well, although, as usual in France, there was not much discipline about it. Saul had a good, though rather tired voice, and he knew his business. The David was a handsome, tall, plump, solid lady with a sentimental, vulgar voice which she used heavily, with a melodramatic tremolo, and all the café concert tricks. Christophe scowled. As soon as she began to sing, it was obvious that she could not be allowed to play the part. After the first pause in the rehearsal, he went to the impresario, who had charge of the business side of the undertaking, and was present with Sylvain Cohn at the rehearsal. The impresario beamed and said, "'Well, are you satisfied?' "'Yes,' said Christophe. "'I think it can be made all right. "'There's only one thing that won't do. "'The singer, she must be changed. "'Tell her as gently as you can. "'You're used to it. "'It will be quite easy for you to find me another.' The impresario looked disgruntled. He looked at Christophe as though he could not believe that he was serious, and he said, "'But that's impossible.' "'Why is it impossible?' asked Christophe. The impresario looked cunningly at Sylvain Cohn and replied, But she has so much talent. Not a spark, said Christophe. What? She has a fine voice. Not a bit of it. And she is beautiful. I don't care a damn. That won't hurt the part, said Sylvain Cohn, laughing. I want a David, a David who can sing. I don't want Helen of Troy, said Christophe. The impresario rubbed his nose uneasily. It's a pity, a great pity, he said. She is an excellent artist. I give you my word for it. Perhaps she is not at her best today. You must give her another trial. All right, said Christophe, but it is a waste of time. He went on with the rehearsal. It was worse than ever. He found it hard to go on to the end. It got on his nerves. His remarks to the singer, from cold and polite, became dry and cutting. In spite of the obvious pain she was taking to satisfy him, and the way she ogled him by way of winning his favor, the impresario prudently stopped the rehearsal, just when it seemed to be hopeless. By way of softening the bad effect of Christophe's remarks, he bustled up to the singer and paid her heavy compliments. Christophe, who was standing by, made no attempt to conceal his impatience, called the impresario, and said, "'There's no room for argument. I won't have the woman. It's unpleasant, I know, but I did not choose her. Do what you can to arrange the matter.' The impresario bowed frigidly and said coldly, I can't do anything. You must see Monsieur Roussin. What has it got to do with Monsieur Roussin? I don't want to bother him with this business, said Christophe. That won't bother him, said Sylvain Caen, ironically. And he pointed to Roussin, who had just come in. Christophe went up to him. Roussin was in high good humor and cried. What? Finished already? I was hoping to hear a bit of it. Well, maestro, what do you say? Are you satisfied? It's going quite well, said Christophe. I don't know how to thank you. Not at all, not at all. There is only one thing wrong. What is it will put it right? I am determined to satisfy you. Well, the singer, between ourselves, she is detestable. The beaming smile in Roussin's face froze suddenly. He said with some asperity, You surprise me, my dear fellow. She is useless, absolutely useless, Christophe went on. She has no voice, no taste, no knowledge of her work, no talent. You're lucky not to have heard her. Roussin grew more and more acid. He cut Christophe short and said cuttingly, I know Mademoiselle de saint -Igrain. She is a very talented artist. I have the greatest admiration for her. Every man of taste in Paris shares my opinion. And he turned his back on Christophe, who saw him offer his arm to the actress and go out with her. He was dumbfounded, and Sylvain Calm, who had watched the scene delightedly, took his arm and laughed, and said as they went down the stairs of the theatre, Didn't you know that she was his mistress? Christophe understood. So it was for her sake and not for his own that his piece was to be produced. That explained Roussin's enthusiasm, the money he had laid out, and the eagerness of his sycophants. 
He listened while Sylvain Cohen told him the story of the saint Grain, a music hall singer who, after various successes in the little vaudeville theatres, had, like so many of her kind, been fired with the ambition to be heard on a stage more worthy of her talent. She counted on Roussin to procure her an engagement at the opera, or the opera comique, and Roussin, who asked nothing better, had seen in the performance of David an opportunity of revealing to the Parisian public at no very great risk the lyrical gifts of the new tragedian in a part which called for no particular dramatic acting and gave her an excellent opportunity of displaying the elegance of her figure christophe heard the story through to the end then he shook off sylvain Cohn and burst out laughing he laughed and laughed when he had done he said you disgust me you all disgust me art is nothing to you it's always women nothing but women an opera is put on for a dancer or a singer for the mistress of monsieur so-and-so or madame thingamy you think of nothing but your dirty little intrigues bless you i'm not angry with you you are like that very well then be so and wallow in your mire but we must part company we weren't made to live together good night he left him and when he reached home wrote to Roussin, saying that he withdrew the peace and did not disguise his reasons for doing so it meant a breach with roussin and all his gang the consequences were felt at once the newspapers had made a certain amount of talk about the forthcoming piece and the story of the quarrel between the composer and the singer appeared in due course a certain conductor was adventurous enough to play the piece at a sunday afternoon concert his good fortune was disastrous for christophe the david was played and hissed all the singer's friends had passed the word to teach the insolent musician a lesson and the outside public who had been bored by the symphonic poem added their voices to the verdict of the critics to crown his misfortunes christophe was ill-advised enough to accept the invitation to display his talents as a pianist at the same concert by giving a fantasia for piano and orchestra the unkindly disposition of the audience which had been to a certain extent restrained during the performance of the david out of consideration for the interpreters broke loose when they found themselves face to face with the composer whose playing was not all that it might have been christophe was unnerved by the noise in the hall and stopped suddenly halfway through a movement and he looked jeeringly at the audience who were startled into silence and played malbrook sans vatant guerre and said insolently that is all you are fit for then he got up and went away there was a terrific row the audience shouted that he had insulted them and that he must come and apologize next day the papers unanimously slaughtered the grotesque german to whom justice had been meted out by the good taste of paris and then once more he was left in absolute isolation once more christophe found himself alone more solitary than ever in that great hostile stranger city he did not worry about it he began to think that he was fated to be so and would be so all his life he did not know that a great soul is never alone that however fortune may cheat him of friendship in the end a great soul creates friends by the radiance of the love with which it is filled and that even in that hour when he thought himself forever isolated he was more rich in love than the happiest men and women in the world end of section thirteen Section 14 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canan. The Marketplace. Chapter 3. Part 2. Living with the Stevens was a little girl of thirteen or fourteen, to whom Christophe had given lessons at the same time as Colette. She was a distant cousin of Colette's, and her name was Grazia Bontampi. She was a little girl with a golden-brown complexion, with cheeks delicately tinged with red, healthy-looking. She had a little aquiline nose, a large, well-shaped mouth, always half-open, a round chin, very white, calm, clear eyes, softly smiling, a round forehead framed in masses of long, silky hair, which fell in long, waving locks loosely down to her shoulders. 
She was like a little virgin of Andrea del Sarto, with her wide face and serenely gazing eyes. She was Italian. Her parents lived almost all the year round in the country on an estate in the north of Italy. Plains, fields, little canals. From the loggia on the housetop, they looked down on golden vines, from which here and there the black spikes of the cypress trees emerged. Beyond them were fields, and again fields, silence, the lowing of the oxen returning from the fields, and the shrill cries of the peasants at the plow were to be heard. He, fatinans, grasshoppers, chirruped in the trees, frogs croaked by the waterside, and at night there was infinite silence under the silver beams of the moon. In the distance, from time to time, the watchers by the crops, sleeping in huts of branches, fired their guns by way of warning thieves that they were awake. To those who heard them drowsily, these noises meant no more than the chiming of a dull clock in the distance, marking the hours of the night, and silence closed again, like a soft cloak, about the soul. Round little Grazia life seemed asleep. Her people did not give her much attention. In the calmness and beauty that was all about her, she grew up peacefully without haste, without fever. She was lazy and loved to dawdle and to sleep. For hours together she would lie in the garden. She would let herself be borne onward by the silence like a fly on a summer stream. And sometimes, suddenly, for no reason, she would begin to run. She would run like a little animal, head and shoulders a little leaning to the right, moving easily and supplely. She was like a kid climbing and slithering among the stones for the sheer joy of leaping about. She would talk to the dogs, the frogs, the grass, the trees, the peasants, and the beasts in the farmyard. She adored all the creatures about her, great and small, but she was less at her ease with the great. She saw very few people. The estate was isolated and far from any town. Very rarely there came along the dusty road some trudging, solemn peasant or lovely countrywoman with bright eyes and sunburnt face, walking with a slow rhythm, head high, and chest well out. For days together, Grazia lived alone in the silence of the garden. She saw no one. She was never bored. She was afraid of nothing. One day a tramp came, stealing fowls. He stopped dead when he saw the little girl lying on the grass, eating a piece of bread and butter and humming to herself. She looked up at him calmly and asked what he waited. He said, Give me something or I'll hurt you. She held out her piece of bread and butter and smiled and said, You must not do harm. Then he went away. Her mother died. Her father, a kind, weak man, was an old Italian of a good family, robust, jovial, affectionate, but rather childish, and he was quite incapable of bringing up his child. Old Buontompe's sister, Madame Stevens, came to the funeral and was struck by the loneliness of the child and decided to take her back to Paris for a while to distract her from her grief. Grazia and her father wept, but when Madame Stevens had made up her mind to anything, there was nothing for it but to give in. Nobody could stand out against her. She had the brains of the family, and, in her house in Paris, she directed everything, dominated everybody, her husband, her daughter, her lovers, for she had not denied herself in the matter of love. She went straight at her duties and her pleasures. She was a practical woman and a passionate, very worldly and very restless. Transplanted to Paris, Grazia adored her pretty cousin Colette, whom she amused. The pretty little savage was taken out into society and to the theater. They treated her as a child, and she regarded herself as a child, although she was a child no longer. She had feelings which she hid away, for she was fearful of them, accesses of tenderness for some person or thing. She was secretly in love with Colette, and would steal a ribbon or a handkerchief that belonged to her. Often in her presence she could not speak a word, and when she expected her, when she knew she was going to see her, she would tremble with impatience and happiness. At the theater, when she saw her pretty cousin in evening dress come into the box and attract general attention, she would smile humbly, affectionately, lovingly, and her heart would leap when Colette spoke to her. Dressed in white, with her beautiful black hair loose and hanging over her shoulders, biting the fingers of her long white cotton gloves, and idly poking her fingers through the holes. Every other minute during the play, 
she would turn towards Colette in the hope of meeting a friendly look to share the pleasure she was feeling and to say with her clear brown eyes, I love you. When they were out together in the Bois outside Paris, she would walk in Colette's shadow, sit at her feet, run in front of her, break off branches that might be in her way, place stones in the mud for her to walk on. And one evening in the garden, when Colette shivered and asked for her shawl, she gave a little cry of delight. She was at once ashamed of it. To think that her beloved would be wrapped in something of hers and would give it back to her presently, filled with the scent of her body. There were books, certain passages in the poets, which she read in secret, for she was still given children's books, which gave her delicious thrills. And there were more even in certain passages in music, although she was told that she could not understand them, and she persuaded herself that she did not understand them. But she would turn pale and cold with emotion. No one knew what was happening within her at such moments. Outside that, she was just a docile little girl, dreamy, lazy, greedy, blushing on the slightest provocations, now silent for hours together, now talking volubly, easily touched to tears and laughter, breaking suddenly into fits of sobbing or childish laughter. She loved to laugh, and silly little things would amuse her. She never tried to be grown up. She remained a child. She was, above all, kind and could not bear to hurt anybody, and she was hurt by the least angry word addressed to herself. She was very modest and retiring, ready to love and admire anything that seemed good and beautiful to her, and so she attributed to others qualities which they did not possess. She was being educated, for she was very backward, and that was how she came to be taught music by Christophe. She saw him for the first time at a crowded party in her aunt's house. Christophe, who was incapable of adapting himself to his audience, played an interminable adagio which made everybody yawn. When it seemed to be over, he began again, and everybody wondered if it was ever going to end. Madame Stevens was boiling with impatience. Colette was highly amused. She was enjoying the absurdity of it, and rather pleased with Christophe for being so insensible of it. She felt that he was a force, and she liked that. But it was comic, too, and she would have been the last person to defend him. Grazia alone was moved to tears by the music. She hid herself away in a corner of the room. When it was over, she went away, so that no one should see her emotion, and also because she could not bear to see people making fun of Christophe. A few days later, at dinner, Madame Stevens in her presence spoke of her having music lessons from Christophe. Grazia was so upset that she let her spoon drop into her soup plate and splashed herself and her neighbor. Colette said she ought first to have lessons in table manners. Madame Stevens added that Christophe was not the person to go to for that. Grazia was glad to be scolded in Christophe's company. Christophe began to teach her. She was stiff and frozen and held her arms close to her sides and could not stir. And when Christophe placed his hand on hers to correct the position of her fingers and stretched them over the keys, she nearly fainted. She was fearful of playing badly for him, but in vain did she practice until she nearly made herself ill and evoked impatient protests from her cousin. She always played vilely when Christophe was present. She was breathless, and her fingers were as stiff as pieces of wood or as flabby as cotton. She struck the wrong notes and gave the emphasis all wrong. Christophe would lose his temper, scold her, and go away. Then she would long to die. He paid no attention to her and thought only of Colette. Grazia was envious of her cousin's intimacy with Christophe, but, although it hurt her, in her heart she was glad both for Colette and for Christophe. She thought Colette so superior to herself that it seemed natural to her that she should monopolize attention. It was only when she had to choose between her cousin and Christophe that she felt her heart turn against Colette. With her girlish intuition, she saw that Christophe was made to suffer by Colette's coquetry and the persistent courtship of her by Lucien Lévicourt. Instinctively, she disliked Lévicourt, and she detested him as soon as she knew that Christophe detested him. She could not understand how Colette could admit him as a rival to Christophe. She began secretly to judge him harshly. She discovered certain of his small hypocrisies and suddenly changed her manner towards him. Colette saw it, but did not guess the cause. 
She pretended to ascribe it to a little girl's caprice, but it was very certain that she had lost her power over Grazia, as was shown by a trifling incident. One evening, when they were walking together in the garden, a gentle rain came on, and Colette tenderly, though coquettishly, offered Grazia the shelter of her cloak. Grazia, for whom, a few weeks before, it would have been happiness ineffable to be held close to her beloved cousin, moved away coldly, and walked on in silence at a distance of some yards. And when Colette said that she thought a piece of music that Grazia was playing was ugly, Grazia was not kept from playing and loving it. She was only concerned with Christophe. She had the insight of her tenderness and saw that he was suffering without his saying a word. She exaggerated it in her childish, uneasy regard for him. She thought that Christophe was in love with Colette, when he had really no more than an exacting friendship. She thought he was unhappy, and she was unhappy for him, and she had little reward for her anxiety. She paid for it when Colette had infuriated Christophe. Then he was surly and avenged himself on his pupil, waxing wrathful with her mistakes. One morning when Colette had exasperated him more than usual, he sat down by the piano so savagely that Grazia lost the little nerve she had. She floundered. He angrily scolded her for her mistakes. Then she lost her head altogether. He fumed, wrung his hands, declared that she would never do anything properly, and that she had better occupy herself with cooking, sewing, anything she liked, only, in heaven's name, she must not go on with her music. It was not worth the trouble of torturing people with her mistakes. With that, he left her in the middle of her lesson. He was furious, and poor Grazia wept, not so much for the humiliation of anything he had said to her, as for despair at not being able to please Christophe, when she longed to do so, and could only succeed in adding to his sufferings. The greatest grief was when Christophe ceased to go to the Stevens' house. Then she longed to go home, the poor child, so healthy, even in her dreams, in whom there was much of the sweet peace of the country, felt ill at ease in the town, among the neurasthenic, restless women of Paris. She never dared say anything, but she had come to a fairly accurate estimation of the people about her. But she was shy, and, like her father, weak, from kindness, modesty, distrust of herself. She submitted to the authority of her domineering aunt and her cousin, who was used to tyrannizing over everybody. She dared not write to her father, to whom she wrote regularly long, affectionate letters. Please, please, take me home. And her father dared not take her home, in spite of his own longing. For Madame Stevens had answered his timid advances by saying that Grazia was very well off where she was, much better off than she would be with him, and that she must stay for the sake of her education. But there came a time when her exile was too hard for the little southern creature, a time when she had to fly back towards the light. That was after Christophe's concert. She went to it with the Stevens, and she was tortured by the hideous sight of the rabble amusing themselves with insulting an artist. An artist? The man who in Grazia's eyes was the very type of art, the personification of all that was divine in life. She was on the point of tears. She longed to get away. She had to listen to all the caterwauling, the hisses, the howls, and, when they reached home, to the laughter of Colette as she exchanged pitying remarks with Lucien Lévy Coeur. She escaped to her room, and through part of the night she sobbed. She spoke to Christophe and consoled him. She would gladly have given her life for him, and she despaired of ever being able to do anything to make him happy. It was impossible for her to stay in Paris any longer. She begged her father to take her away, saying, I cannot live here any longer. I cannot. I shall die if you leave me here any longer. Her father came at once, and though it was very painful to them both to stand up to her terrible aunt, they screwed up their courage for it by a desperate effort of will. Grazia returned to the sleepy old estate. She was glad to get back to nature and the creatures that she loved. Every day she gathered comfort for her sorrow, but in her heart there remained a little of the melancholy of the north, like a veil of mist that very slowly melted away before the sun. Sometimes she thought of Christophe's wretchedness, 
lying on the grass, listening to the familiar frogs and grasshoppers, or sitting at her piano, which now she played more often than before, she would dream of the friend her heart had chosen. She would talk to him, in whispers, for hours together, and it seemed not impossible to her that one day he would open the door and come in to her. She wrote to him, and after long hesitation, she sent the letter, unsigned, which, one day, with beating heart, she went secretly and dropped into the box in the village two miles away, beyond the long ploughed fields. A kind, good, touching letter, in which she told him that he was not alone, that he must not be discouraged, and that there was one who thought of him, and loved him, and prayed to God for him. A poor little letter, which was lost in the post, so that he never received it. Then the serene, monotonous days succeeded each other in the life of his distant friend, and the Italian peace, the genius of tranquility, calm happiness, silent contemplation, once more took possession of that chaste and silent heart in whose depths there still burned, like a little constant flame, the memory of Christophe. But Christophe never knew of the simple love that watched over him from afar and was later to fill so great a room in his life. Nor did he know that at the same concert where he had been insulted, there sat the woman who was to be the beloved, the dear companion, destined to walk by his side, shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand. He was alone. He thought himself alone. But he did not suffer overmuch. He did not feel that bitter anguish that had given him such great agony in Germany. He was stronger, riper. He knew that it must be so. His illusions about Paris were destroyed. Men were everywhere the same. He must be a law unto himself, and not waste strength in a childish struggle with the world. He must be himself, calmly, tranquilly. As Beethoven had said, If we surrender the forces of our lives to life, what, then, will be left for the noblest and highest? He had firmly grasped a knowledge of his nature and the temper of his race, which formerly he had so harshly judged. The more he was oppressed by the atmosphere of Paris, the more keenly did he feel the need of taking refuge in his own country, in the arms of the poets and musicians in whom the best of Germany is garnered and preserved. As soon as he opened their books, his room was filled with the sound of the sunlit Rhine and lit by the loving smiles of old friends new found. How ungrateful he had been to them! How was it he had failed to feel the treasure of their goodness and honesty? He remembered with shame all the unjust, outrageous things he had said of them when he was in Germany. Then he saw only their defects, their awkward ceremonious manners, their tearful idealism, their little mental hypocrisies, their cowardice. Ah, how small were all these things compared with their great virtues! How could he have been so hard upon their weaknesses, which now made them even more moving in his eyes, for they were more human for them? In his reaction, he was the more attracted to those of them to whom he had been most unjust. What things he had said about Schubert and Bach, and now he felt so near to them. Now it was as though these noble souls, whose foibles he had so scorned, leaned over him, now that he was in exile and far from his own people, and smiled kindly and said, Brother, we are here. Courage. We too have had more than our share of misery. Bah! One wins through it. He heard the soul of Johann Sebastian Bach roaring like the sea, hurricanes, winds howling, the clouds of life scudding, men and women drunk with joy, sorrow, fury, and the Christ, all meekness, the Prince of Peace hovering above them, towns awakened by the cries of the watchmen, running with glad shouts to meet the divine bridegroom, whose footsteps shake the earth, the vast store of thoughts, passions, musical forms, heroic life, Shakespearean hallucinations, Savonarola-esque prophecies, pastoral, epic, apocalyptic visions, all contained in the stunted body of the little Thuringian cantor, with his double chin and little shining eyes under the wrinkled lids and the raised eyebrows. He could see him so clearly, somber, jovial, a little absurd, with his head stuffed full of allegories and symbols, gothic and rococo, choleric, obstinate, serene, with a passion for life and a great longing for death. He saw him in his school, a genial pedant, surrounded by his pupils, dirty, coarse, vagabond, ragged, with hoarse voices, the ragamuffins with whom he squabbled and sometimes fought like a navvy, one of whom once gave him a mighty thrashing. 
He saw him with his family, surrounded by his twenty-one children, of whom thirteen died before him, and one was an idiot, and the rest were good musicians who gave little concerts. Sickness, burial, bitter disputes, want, his genius misunderstood, and through and above it all, his music, his faith, deliverance and light, joy half seen, felt, desired, grasped, God, the breath of God kindling his bones, thrilling through his flesh, thundering from his lips. O oh, force, force, thrice joyful thunder of force. Christoph took great draughts of that force. He felt the blessing of that power of music which issues from the depths of the German soul. Often mediocre and even coarse, what does it matter? The great thing is that it is so, and that it flows plenteously. In France, music is gathered carefully, drop by drop, and passed through Pasteur filters into bottles, and then corked. And the drinkers of stale water are disgusted by the rivers of German music. They examine minutely the defects of the German men of genius. Poor little things, thought Christoph, forgetting that he himself had once been just as absurd. They find fault with Wagner and Beethoven. They must have faultless men of genius, as though, when the tempest rages, it would take care not to upset the existing order of things. He strode about Paris, rejoicing in his strength. If he were misunderstood, so much the better. He would be all the freer to create, as genius must, a whole world organically constituted according to his own inward laws. The artist must live in it altogether. An artist can never be too much alone. What is terrible is to see his ideas reflected in a mirror which deforms and stunts them. He must say nothing to others of what he is doing until he has done it. Otherwise, he would never have the courage to go on to the end, for it would no longer be his idea, but the miserable idea of others that would live in him. Now that there was nothing to disturb his dreams, they bubbled forth like springs from all the corners of his soul, and from every stone of the roads by which he walked. He was living in a visionary state. Everything he saw and heard called forth in him creatures and things different from those he saw and heard. He had only to live to find everywhere about him the life of his heroes. Their sensations came to him of their own accord, the eyes of the passers-by, the sound of a voice borne by the wind, the light on a lawn, the birds singing in the trees of the Luxembourg, a convent bell ringing so far away, the pale sky, the little patch of sky seen from his room, the sounds and shades of sound of the different hours of the day. All these were not in himself, but in the creatures of his dreams. Christoph was happy. But his material position was worse than ever. He had lost his few pupils, his only resource. It was September, and rich people were out of town, and it was difficult to find new pupils. The only one he had was an engineer, a crazy, clever fellow, who had taken it into his head, at forty, to become a great violinist. Christoph did not play the violin very well, but he knew more about it than his pupil, and for some time he gave him three hours a week at two francs an hour. But at the end of six weeks the engineer got tired of it, and suddenly discovered that painting was his vocation. When he imparted his discovery to Christoph, Christoph laughed heartily. But when he had done laughing, he reckoned up his finances, and found that he had in hand the twelve francs which his pupil had just paid him for his last lessons. That did not worry him. He only said to himself that he must certainly set about finding some other means of living, and start once more going from publisher to publisher. That was not very pleasant. Pfft! It was useless to torment himself in advance. It was a jolly day. He went to Meudon. He had a sudden longing for a walk. As he walked, there rose in him scraps of music. He was as full of it as a hive of honey, and he laughed aloud at the golden buzzing of his bees. For the most part, it was changing music, and lively, leaping rhythms, insistent, haunting. Much good it is to create and fashion music buried within four walls. There you can only make combinations of subtle, hard, unyielding harmonies, like the Parisians. When he was weary, he lay down in the woods. The trees were half in leaf. The sky was periwinkle blue. Christoph dozed off dreamily, and in his dreams there was the color of the sweet light falling from October clouds. His blood throbbed. He listened to the rushing flood of his ideas. They came from all corners of the earth, worlds, young and old, 
at war, rags and tatters of dead souls, guests and parasites that once had dwelled within him, as in a city. The words that Gottfried had spoken by the grave of Melchior returned to him. He was a living tomb, filled with the dead, striving in him, all his unknown forefathers. He listened to those countless lives. It delighted him to set the organ roaring, the roaring of that age-old forest, full of monsters, like the forest of Dante. He was no longer fearful of them as he had been in his youth, for the master was there, his will. It was a great joy to him to crack his whip and make the beasts howl and feel the wealth of living creatures in himself. He was not alone. There was no danger of his ever being alone. He was a host in himself, ages of crafts, healthy and rejoicing in their health. Against hostile Paris, against a hostile people, he could set a whole people. The fight was equal. End of section 14《Section 15 of Jean Christophe in Paris》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Jean Christophe in Paris》by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canan. The Marketplace, Chapter 3, Part 3 He had left the modest room. It was too expensive which he occupied and taken an attic in the Mont Rouge district. It was well aired, though it had no other advantage. There was a continual draft, but he wanted to breathe. From his window he had a wide view over the chimneys of Paris to Montmartre in the background. It had not taken him long to move. A handcart was enough. Christophe pushed it himself. Of all his possessions, the most precious to him, after his old bag, was one of those casts which have lately become so popular of the death mask of Beethoven. He packed it with as much care as though it were a priceless work of art. He never let it out of his sight. It was an oasis in the midst of the desert of Paris, and also it served him as a moral thermometer. The death mask indicated more clearly than his own conscience the temperature of his soul, the character of his most secret thoughts, now a cloudy sky, now the gusty wind of the passions, now fine calm weather. He had to be sparing with his food. He only ate once a day at one in the afternoon. He bought a large sausage and hung it up in his window. A thick slice of it, a hunk of bread, and a cup of coffee that he made himself were a feast for the gods. He would have preferred two such feasts. He was angry with himself for having such a good appetite. He called himself to task and thought himself a glutton thinking only of his stomach. He lost flesh. He was leaner than a famished dog. But he was solidly built. He had an iron constitution, and his head was clear. He did not worry about the morrow, though he had good reason for doing so. As long as he had in hand money enough for the day, he never bothered about it. When he came to the end of his money, he made up his mind to go the round of the publishers once more. He found no work. He was on his way home, empty, when happening to pass the music shop where he had been introduced to Daniel Hecht by Sylvain Conn, he went in without remembering that he had already been there under not very pleasant circumstances. The first person he saw was Hecht. He was on the point of turning tail, but he was too late. Hecht had seen him. Christoph did not wish to seem to be avoiding him. He went up to Hecht, not knowing what to say to him, and fully prepared to stand up to him as arrogantly as need be, for he was convinced that Hecht would be unsparingly insolent. But he was nothing of the kind. Hecht coldly held out his hand, muttered some conventional inquiry after his health, and, without waiting for any request from Christoph, he pointed to the door of his office, and stepped aside to let him pass. He was secretly glad of the visit, which he had foreseen, though he had given up expecting it. Without seeming to do so, he had carefully followed Christoph's doings. He had missed no opportunity of hearing his music. He had been at the famous performance of the David, and, despising the public, he had not been greatly surprised at its hostile reception, since he himself had felt the beauty of the work. There were probably not two people in Paris more capable than Hecht of appreciating Christoph's artistic originality. But he took care not to say anything about it, not only because his vanity was hurt by Christophe's attitude towards himself, but because it was impossible for him to be amiable. It was the peculiarly ungracious quality of his nature. He was sincerely desirous of helping Christophe, but he would not have stirred a finger to do so. He was waiting for Christophe to come and ask it of him. 
And now that Christophe had come, instead of generously seizing the opportunity of wiping out the memory of their previous misunderstanding by sparing his visitor any humiliation, he gave himself the satisfaction of hearing him make his request at length, and he even went so far as to offer Christophe, at least for the time being, the work which he had formerly refused. He gave him fifty pages of music to transpose for mandolin and guitar by the next day, after which, being satisfied that he had made him truckle down, he found him less distasteful work, but always so ungraciously that it was impossible to be grateful to him for it. Christophe had to be ground down by necessity before he would ever go to Hecht again. In any case, he preferred to earn his money by such work, however irritating it might be, then accepted as a gift from Hecht, as it was once more offered to him. And, indeed, Hecht meant it kindly. But Christoph had been conscious of Hecht's original intention to humiliate him. He was forced to accept his conditions, but nothing would induce him to accept any favor from him. He was willing to work for him. By giving and giving he squared the account. But he would not be under any obligation to him. Unlike Wagner, that impudent mendicant where his art was concerned, he did not place his art above himself. The bread that he had not earned himself would have choked him. One day, when he brought some work that he had sat up all night to finish, he found Hecht at table. Hecht, remarking his pallor and the hungry glances that involuntarily he cast at the dishes, felt sure that he had not eaten that day, and invited him to lunch. He meant kindly, but he made it so apparent that he had noticed Christophe's straits that his invitation looked like charity. Christophe would have died of hunger rather than accept. He could not refuse to sit down at the table. Hecht said he wanted to talk to him, but he did not touch a morsel. He pretended that he had just had lunch. His stomach was aching with hunger. Christophe would gladly have done without Hecht, but the other publishers were even worse. There were also wealthy amateurs who had conceived some scrap of a musical idea and could not even write it down. They would send for Christophe, hum over their lucubrations, and say, Isn't it fine? Then they would give them to him for elaboration, to be written. And then they would appear under their own names through some great publishing house. They were quite convinced that they had composed themselves. Christophe knew such a one, a distinguished nobleman, a strange, restless creature who would suddenly call him, dear friend, grasp him by the arm, and burst into a torrent of enthusiastic demonstrations, talking and giggling, babbling and telling funny stories, interlarded with cries of ecstatic laughter. Beethoven, Verlaine, Faure, Yves Guilbert. He made him work and failed to pay. He worked it out in invitations to lunch and handshakes. Finally, he sent Christophe twenty francs, which Christophe gave himself the foolish luxury of returning. That day he had not twenty sous in the world, and he had to buy a twenty-five centime stamp for a letter to his mother. It was Louise's birthday, and Christophe would not for the world have failed her. The poor old creature counted on her son's letter, and could not have endured disappointment. For some weeks past she had been writing to him more frequently, in spite of the pain it caused her. She was suffering from her loneliness, but she could not bring herself to join Christophe in Paris. She was too timid, too much attached to her own little town, to her church, her house, and she was afraid of traveling. And besides, if she had wanted to come, Christophe had not enough money. He had not always enough for himself. He had been given a great deal of pleasure once by receiving a letter from Lorcan, the peasant girl for whose sake he had plunged into the brawl with the Prussian soldiers. Footnote. See Jean Christophe I. Revolt. She wrote to tell him that she was going to be married. She gave him news of his mother and sent him a basket of apples and a piece of cake to eat in her honor. They came in the nick of time. That evening with Christophe was a fast, ember days, Lent. Only the butt end of the sausage hanging by the window was left. Christophe compared himself to the anchorite saints fed by a crow among the rocks. But no doubt the crow was hard put to it to feed all the anchorites, for he never came again. In spite of all his difficulties, Christophe kept his end up. He washed his linen in his basin and cleaned his boots, whistling like a blackbird. He consoled himself with the saying of Berlioz, Let us raise our heads above the miseries of life, and let us blithely sing the familiar gay refrain, Dis Irae. He used to sing it sometimes, to the dismay of his neighbors, who were amazed and shocked to hear him break off in the middle and shout with laughter. He led a life of stern chastity, as Berlioz remarked, the lover's life is a life for the idle and the rich. 
Christoph's poverty, his daily hunt for bread, his excessive sobriety, and his creative fever left him neither the time nor the taste for any thought of pleasure. He was more than indifferent about it. In his reaction against Paris, he had plunged into a sort of moral asceticism. He had a passionate need of purity, a horror of any sort of dirtiness. It was not that he was rid of his passions. At other times he had been swept headlong by them. But his passions remained chaste even when he yielded to them, for he never sought pleasure through them, but the absolute giving of himself and fullness of being. And when he saw that he had been deceived, he flung them furiously from him. Lust was not to him a sin like any other. It was the great sin, that which poisons the very springs of life. All those in whom the old Christian belief has not been crusted over with strange conceptions, all those who still feel in themselves the vigor and life of the races, which through the strengthening of an heroic discipline have built up Western civilization, will have no difficulty in understanding him. Christoph despised cosmopolitan society, whose only aim and creed was pleasure. In truth, it is good to seek pleasure, to desire pleasure for all men, to combat the cramping pessimistic beliefs that have come to weigh upon humanity through twenty centuries of Gothic Christianity. But that can only be upon condition that it is a generous faith, earnestly desirous of the good of others. But instead of that, what happens? The most pitiful egoism, a handful of loose-living men and women trying to give their senses the maximum of pleasure with the minimum of risk, while they take good care that the rest shall drudge for it. Yes, no doubt, they have their parlor socialism, but they know perfectly well that their doctrine of pleasure is only practicable for well-fed people, for a select pampered few, that it is poison to the poor. The life of pleasure is a rich man's life. Christoph was neither rich nor likely to become so. When he had a little money, he spent it at once on music. He went without food to go to concerts. He would take cheap seats in the gallery of the Théâtre du Châtelet, and he would steep himself in music. He found both food and love in it. He had such a hunger for happiness and so great a power in enjoying it that the imperfections of the orchestra never worried him. He would stay for two or three hours, drowsy and beatific, and wrong notes or defective taste never provoked in him more than an indulgent smile. He left his critical faculty outside. He was there to love, not to judge. Around him the audience sat motionless, with eyes half-closed, letting itself be borne on by the great torrent of dreams. Christoph fancied them as a mass of people curled up in the shade, like an enormous cat, weaving fantastic dreams of lust and carnage. In the deep golden shadows certain faces stood out, and their strange charm and silent ecstasy drew Christoph's eyes and heart. He loved them. He listened through them. He became them, body and soul. One woman in the audience became aware of it, and between her and Christoph during the concert there was woven one of those obscure sympathies which touched the very depths, though never by one word are they translated into the region of consciousness. While, when the concert is over and the thread that binds soul to soul is snapped, nothing is left of it. It is a state familiar to lovers of music, especially when they are young and do most wholly surrender. The essence of music is so completely love that the full savor of it is not one unless it be enjoyed through another. And so it is that, at a concert, we instinctively seek among the throng for friendly eyes, for a friend with whom to share a joy too great for ourselves alone. Among such friends, the friends of one brief hour, whom Christoph marked out for choice of love, the better to taste the sweetness of the music, he was attracted by one face which he saw again and again at every concert. It was the face of a little grisette who seemed to adore music without understanding it at all. She had an odd little profile, a short, straight nose, almost in line with her slightly pouting lips and delicately molded chin, fine arched eyebrows, and clear eyes. One of those pretty little faces behind the veil of which one feels joy and laughter, concealed by calm indifference. It is perhaps in such light-hearted girls, little creatures working for their living, that one finds most the old serenity that is no more, the serenity of the antique statues and the faces of Raphael. There is but one moment in their lives, the first awakening of pleasure. All too soon their lives are sullied, but at least they have lived for one lovely hour. It gave Christoph an exquisite pleasure to look at her. A pretty face would always warm his heart. He could enjoy without desire. He found joy in it, force, comfort, almost virtue. 
It goes without saying that she quickly became aware that he was watching her, and, unconsciously, there was set up between them a magnetic current, and as they met at almost every concert, almost always in the same places, they quickly learned each other's likes and dislikes. At certain passages they would exchange meaning glances. When she particularly liked some melody, she would just put out her tongue as though to lick her lips, or, to show that she did not think much of it, she would disdainfully wrinkle up her pretty nose. In these little tricks of hers there was a little of that innocent posing of which hardly anyone can be free when he knows that he is being watched. During serious music she would sometimes try to look grave and serious, and she would turn her profile towards him, and look absorbed, and smile to herself, and look out of the corner of her eye to see if he were watching. They had become very good friends, without exchanging a word, and even without having attempted, at least Kristoff did not, to meet outside. At last, by chance, at an evening concert, they found themselves sitting next to each other. After a moment of smiling hesitation, they began to talk amicably. She had a charming voice and said many stupid things about music, for she knew nothing about it and wanted to seem as if she knew. But she loved it passionately. She loved the worst and the best, Massenet and Wagner. Only the mediocre bored her. Music was a physical pleasure to her. She drank it in through all the pores of her skin as Danae did the golden rain. The prelude of Tristan made her blood run cold, and she loved feeling herself being carried away, like some warrior's prey, by this Symphonia Eroica. She told Christoph that Beethoven was deaf and dumb, and that, in spite of it all, if she had known him, she would have loved him, although he was precious ugly. Christoph protested that Beethoven was not so very ugly. Then they argued about beauty and ugliness, and she agreed that it was a matter of taste. What was beautiful for one person was not so for another. We're not Golden Louis and can't please everyone. He preferred her when she did not talk. He understood her better. During the death of Isolde, she held out her hand to him. Her hand was warm and moist. He held it in his until the end of the piece. They could feel life coursing through the veins of their clasped hands. They went out together. It was near midnight. They walked back to the Latin Quarter, talking eagerly. She had taken his arm, and he took her home. But when they reached the door, and she seemed to suggest that he should go up and see her room, he disregarded her smile and the friendliness in her eyes and left her. At first she was amazed, then furious, then she laughed aloud at the thought of his stupidity, and then, when she had reached her room and began to undress, she felt hurt and angry, and finally wept in silence. When next she met him at a concert, she tried to be dignified and indifferent and crushing, but he was so kind to her that she could not hold to her resolution. They began to talk once more, only now she was a little reserved with him. He talked to her warmly, but very politely, and always about serious things, and the music to which they were listening, and what it meant to him. She listened attentively, and tried to think as he did. The meaning of his words often escaped her, but she believed him all the same. She was grateful to Kristoff, and had a respect for him which she hardly showed. By tacit agreement, they only spoke to each other at concerts. He met her once surrounded with students. They bowed gravely. She never talked about him to anyone. In the depths of her soul there was a little sanctuary, a quality of beauty, purity, consolation. And so Christoph, by his presence, by the mere fact of his existence, exercised an influence that brought strength and solace. Whenever he passed, he unconsciously left behind the traces of his inward light. He was the last person to have any notion of it. Near him, in the house where he lived, there were people whom he had never seen, people who, without themselves suspecting it, gradually came under the spell of his beneficent radiance. For several weeks Christoph had no money for concerts even by fasting, and in his attic, under the roof, now that winter was coming in, he was numbed with the cold. He could not sit still at his table. Then he would get up and walk about Paris, trying to warm himself. He had the faculty of forgetting the seething town about him, and slipping away into space and the infinite. It was enough for him to see above the noisy street the dead, frozen moon, hung there in the abysm of the sky, or the sun, like a disk, rolling through the white mist. Then Paris would sink down into the boundless void, and all the life of it would seem to be no more than the phantom of a life that had once been, long, long ago, ages ago. The smallest tiny sign, imperceptible to the common lot of men, of the great wild life of nature, so sparsely covered with the livery of civilization, was enough to make it all come rushing mightily up before his gaze. 
the grass growing between the stones of the streets, the budding of a tree strangled by its cast-iron cage, airless, earthless, on some bleak boulevard, a dog, a passing bird, the last relics of the beast and birds that thronged the primeval world, which man has since destroyed, a whirling cloud of flies, the mysterious epidemic that raged through a whole district. These were enough in the thick air of that human hothouse to bring the breath of the spirit of the earth up to slap his cheeks and whip his energy to action. During these long walks, when he was often starving, and often had not spoken to a soul for days together, his wealth of dreams seemed inexhaustible. Privation and silence had aggravated his morbid, heated condition. At night he slept feverishly, and had exhausting dreams. He saw once more, and never ceased to see, the old house and the room in which he had lived as a child. He was haunted by musical obsessions. By day he talked and never ceased to talk to the creatures within himself and the beings whom he loved, the absent and the dead. One cold afternoon in December, when the grass was covered with frost, and the roofs of the houses and the great domes were glistening through the fog, and the trees, with their cold, twisted, naked branches, groping through the mist that hung about them, looked like great weeds at the bottom of the sea. Christoph, who had been shivering all day and could not get warm again, went into the Louvre, which he hardly knew at all. Till then painting had never much moved him. He was too much absorbed by the world within himself to grasp the world of color and form. They only acted on him through their music and rhythm, which only brought him an indistinguishable echo of their truth. No doubt his instinct did obscurely divine the selfsame laws that rule the harmony of visible form, as of the form of sounds, and the deep waters of the soul, from which spring the two rivers of color and sound, to flow down the two sides of the mountain of life. But he only knew one side of the mountain, and he was lost in the kingdom of the eye, which was not his. So he missed the secret of the most exquisite, and perhaps the most natural charm of clear-eyed France, the queen of the world of light." Even had he been interested in painting, Christoph was too German to adapt himself to so widely different a vision of things. He was not one of those up-to-date Germans who decry the German way of feeling and persuade themselves that they admire and love French Impressionism or the artists of the 18th century, except when they go farther and are convinced that they understand them better than the French. Christophe was a barbarian, perhaps, but he was frank about it. The pink flesh of Boucher, the fat chins of Watteau, the bored shepherds and plump, tight-laced shepherdesses, the whipped cream soles, the virtuous oglings of Clues, the tucked shirts of Frogadin, all that bare-legged poesy interested him no more than a fashionable, rather spicy newspaper. He did not see its rich and brilliant harmony, the voluptuous and sometimes melancholy dreams of that old civilization, the highest in Europe, were foreign to him. As for the French school of the 17th century, he liked neither its devout ceremony nor its pompous portraits, the cold reserve of the gravest of the masters, a certain grayness of soul that clouded the proud works of Nicolas Poussin and the pale faces of Philippe de Champagne, repelled Christophe from old French art, and, once more, he knew nothing about it. If he had known anything about it, he would have misunderstood it. The only modern painter whose fascination he had felt at all in Germany, Bucklan of Basel, had not prepared him much for Latin art. Christoph remembered the shock of his impact with that brutal genius, which smacked of earth and the musty smell of the heroic beasts that it had summoned forth. His eyes, seared by the raw light, used to the frantic motley of that drunken savage, could hardly adapt themselves to the half-tints, the dainty and mellifluous harmonies of French art. But no man with impunity can live in a foreign land. Unknown to him, it sets its seal upon him. In vain does he withdraw into himself. Upon a day he must wake up to find that something has changed." There was a change in Christophe on that evening when he wandered through the rooms of the Louvre. He was tired, cold, hungry. He was alone. Around him darkness was descending upon the empty galleries, and sleeping forms awoke. Christophe was very cold as he walked in silence among Egyptian sphinxes, Assyrian monsters, bulls of Persepolis, gleaming snakes from Palissy. He seemed to have passed into a magic world, and in his heart there was a strange, mysterious emotion. The dream of humanity wrapped him about, the strange flowers of the soul. In the misty, gilded light of the picture galleries, and the gardens of rich, brilliant hues, and painted airless fields, Christoph, in a state of fever, on the very brink of illness, was visited by a miracle. He was walking, numbed by hunger, by the coldness of the galleries, by the bewildering mass of pictures, his head was whirling. 
when he reached the end of the gallery that looks on to the river he stood before the good samaritan of Remrat and leaned on the rail in front of the pictures to keep himself from falling he closed his eyes for a moment when he opened them on the picture in front of him he was quite close to it and he was spellbound day was spent day was already far gone it was already dead the invisible sun was sinking down into the night it was the magic hour when dreams and visions come mounting from the soul saddened by the labors of the day still musing drowsily all is silent only the beating of the heart is heard in the body there is hardly the strength to move hardly to breathe sadness resignation only an immense longing to fall into the arms of a friend a hunger for some miracle a feeling that some miracle must come it comes a flood of golden light flames through the twilight is cast upon the walls of the hovel on the shoulder of the stranger bearing the dying man touches with its warmth those humble objects and those poor creatures and the whole takes on a new gentleness a divine glory it is the very god clasping in his terrible tender arms the poor wretches weak ugly poor unclean the poor down at heel rascal the miserable creatures with twisted haggard faces thronging outside the window the apathetic silent creature standing in mortal terror all the pitiful human beings of rembrandt the herd of obscure broken creatures who know nothing can do nothing only wait tremble weep and pray but the master is there he will come it is known that he will come not he himself is seen only the light that goes before and the shadow of the light which he casts upon all men christophe left the louvre staggering and tottering his head ached he could not see in the street it was raining but he hardly noticed the puddles between the flags and the water trickling down from his shoes over the sun the yellowish sky was lit up as the day waned by an inward flame like the light of a lamp still christophe was spellbound hypnotized it seemed as though nothing existed not the carriages rattling over the stones with a pitiless noise the passers-by were not banging into him with their wet umbrellas he was not walking in the street perhaps he was sitting at home and dreaming perhaps he had ceased to exist and suddenly he was so weak he felt giddy and felt himself falling heavily forward it was only for the flash of a second he clenched his fists hurled himself backward and recovered his balance at that very moment when he emerged into consciousness his eyes met the eyes of a woman standing on the other side of the street who seemed to be looking for recognition he stopped dead trying to remember when he had seen her before it was only after a moment or two that he could place those sad soft eyes it was the little french governess whom unwittingly he had had dismissed in germany for whom he had been looking for so long to beg her to forgive him she had stopped too in the busy throng and was looking at him suddenly he saw her try to cross through the crowd of people and step down into the road to come to him he rushed to meet her but they were separated by a block in the traffic he saw her again for a moment struggling on the other side of that living wall he tried to force his way through was knocked over by a horse slipped and fell on the slippery asphalt and was all but run over when he got up covered with mud and succeeded in reaching the other side of the street she had disappeared he tried to follow her but he had another attack of giddiness and he had to give it up illness was close upon him he felt that but he would not submit to it he set his teeth and would not go straight home but went far out of his way it was just a useless torment to him he had to admit that he was beaten his legs ached he dragged along and only reached home with frightful difficulty halfway up the stairs he choked and had to sit down when he got to his icy room he refused to go to bed he sat in his chair wet through his head was heavy and he could hardly breathe and he drugged himself with music as broken as himself he heard a few fugitive bars of the unfinished symphony of schubert poor schubert he too was alone when he wrote that feverish somnolent in that semi-torpid condition which precedes the last great sleep he sat dreaming by the fireside all round him were heavy drowsy melodies like stagnant water he dwelt on them like a child half asleep delighting in some self-told story and repeating some passage in it twenty times so sleep comes then death 
and Christoph heard fleetingly that other music with burning hands, closed eyes, a little weary smile, heart big with sighs, dreaming of the deliverance of death, the first chorus in the cantata of J.S. Bach, Dear God, when shall I die? It was sweet to sink back into the soft melodies floating by, to hear the distant, muffled clangor of the bells, to die, to pass into the peace of earth, undan zoba, erde verden, and then himself to become earth. Christoph shook off these morbid thoughts, the murderous smile of the siren who lies in wait for the hours of weakness of the soul. He got up and tried to walk about his room, but he could not stand. He was shaking and shivering with fever. He had to go to bed. He felt that it was serious this time, but he did not lay down his arms. He never was one of those who, when they are ill, yield utterly to their illness. He struggled, he refused to be ill, and, above all, he was absolutely determined not to die. He had his poor mother waiting for him in Germany, and he had his work to do. He would not yield to death. He clenched his chattering teeth and firmly grasped his will that was oozing away. He was like a sturdy swimmer battling with the waves dashing over him. At every moment, down he plunged. His mind wandered. Endless fancies haunted him. Memories of Germany and of Parisian society. He was obsessed by rhythms and scraps of melody which went round and round and round, like horses in a circus. The sudden shock of the golden light of the Good Samaritan, the tense, stricken faces in the shadow, and then dark nothingness and night. Then up he would come once more, wrenching away the grimacing mists, clenching his fists and setting his jaw. He clung to all those whom he loved in the present and the past, to the face of the friend he had just seen in the street, his dear mother, and to the indestructible life within himself. That he felt was like a rock, impervious to death. But once more the rock was covered by the tide, the waves dashed over it, and tore his soul away from its hold upon it. It was borne headlong and dashed by the foam, and Christoph struggled in delirium, babbling strangely, conducting and playing an imaginary orchestra, trombones, horns, cymbals, timbals, bassoons, double bass. He scraped blue, beat the drum, frantically. The poor wretch was bubbling over with suppressed music. For weeks he had been unable to hear or play any music, and he was like a boiler at high pressure, near bursting point. Certain insistent phrases bored into his brain like gimlets, pierced his skull, and made him scream with agony. After these attacks he would fall back on his pillow, dead tired, wet through, utterly weak, breathless, choking. He had placed his water jug by his bedside, and he took great draughts of it. The various noises of the adjoining rooms, the banging of the attic doors, made him start. He was filled with a delirious disgust for the creatures swarming about him, but his will fought on sounded a warlike clarion note, declaring battle on all devils. Und wenn die Welt voll dürfel war, und wollten uns verschlingen, so fürchten wir uns nicht so sehr. And even though the world were full of devils, all seeking to devour us, we should not be afraid. And over the sea of scalding shadows that dashed over him, there came a sudden calm, glimpses of light, a gentle murmuring of violins and viols, the clear, triumphant notes of trumpets and horns, while almost motionless, like a great wall, there rose from the sick man's soul an indomitable song, like a choral of J.S. Bach. End of section 15《セクション16 of Jean Christophe in Paris》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canan. The Marketplace, Chapter 3, Part 4. While he was fighting against the phantoms of fever and the choking in his lungs, he was dimly aware that someone had opened the door, and that a woman entered with a candle in her hand. He thought it was another hallucination. He tried to speak but could not, and fell back on his pillow. When, every now and then, he was brought for a moment back to consciousness, he felt that his pillow had been raised, that his feet had been wrapped up, that there was something burning his back, or he would see the woman whose face was not altogether unfamiliar, sitting at the foot of his bed. Then he saw another face, that of a doctor using a stethoscope, 
Christoph could not hear what they were saying, but he gathered that they were talking of sending him to the hospital. He tried to protest, to cry out that he would not go, that he would die where he was, alone. But he could only frame incomprehensible sounds. But the woman understood him, for she took his part and reassured him. He tried hard to find out who she was. As soon as he could, with frightful effort, frame a sentence, he asked her. She replied that she lived in the next attic and had heard him moaning through the wall and had taken the liberty of coming in, thinking that he wanted help. She begged him respectfully not to wear himself out with talking. He obeyed her. He was worn out with the effort he had made. He lay still and said nothing, but his brain went on working, painfully gathering together its scattered memories. Where had he seen her? At last he remembered. Yes, he had met her on the attic landing. She was a servant, and her name was Sidonie. He watched her with half-closed eyes, so that she could not see him. She was little, and had a grave face, a wide forehead, hair drawn back, so that her temples were exposed. Her cheeks were pale and high-boned. She had a short nose, pale blue eyes, with a soft, steady look in them, thick lips tightly pressed together, an anemic complexion, a humble, deliberate, and rather stiff manner. She looked after Christoph with busy, silent devotion, without a spark of familiarity, and without ever breaking down the reserve of a servant who never forgets class differences. However, little by little, when he was better and could talk to her, Christoph's affectionate cordiality made Sidonie talk to him a little more freely, but she was always on her guard. There were obviously certain things which she would not tell. She was a mixture of humility and pride. Christoph learned that she came from Brittany, where she had left her father, of whom she spoke very discreetly. But Christoph gathered that he did nothing but drink, have a good time, and live on his daughter. She put up with it without saying anything from pride, and she never failed to send him part of her month's wages, but she was not taken in. She had also a younger sister who was preparing for a teacher's examination, and she was very proud of her. She was paying almost all the expenses of her education. She worked frightfully hard with grim determination. Have you a good situation? asked Christoph. Yes, but I am thinking of leaving. Why? Aren't they good to you? Oh, no, they're very good to me. Don't they pay you enough? Yes. He did not quite understand. He tried to understand and encouraged her to talk. She had nothing to tell him but the monotony of her life and the difficulty of earning a living. She did not lay any stress on it. She was not afraid of work. It was a necessity to her, almost a pleasure. She never spoke of the thing that tried her most, boredom. He guessed it, little by little, with the intuition of perfect sympathy. He saw that her suffering was increasing, and it was made more acute for him by the memory of the trials supported by his own mother in a similar circumstance. He saw, as though he had lived it, the drab, unhealthy, unnatural existence, the ordinary existence imposed on servants by the middle classes, employers who were not so much unkind as indifferent sometimes leaving her for days together without speaking a word outside her work, the hours and hours spent in the stuffy kitchen, the one small window, blocked up by a meat safe, looking out on to a white wall. Her only pleasure was when she was told carelessly that her sauce was good or the meat well cooked, a cramped airless life with no prospect, with no ray of desire or hope, without interest of any kind. The worst time of all for her was when her employers went away to the country. They economized by not taking her with them. They paid her wages for the month, but not enough to take her home. They gave her permission to go at her own expense. She would not. She could not do that. And so she was left alone in the deserted house. She had no desire to go out, and did not even talk to other servants, whose coarseness and immorality she despised. She never went out in search of amusement. She was naturally serious, economical, and afraid of misadventure. She sat in her kitchen, or in her room, from whence across the chimney she could see the top of a tree in the garden of a hospital. She did not read, but tried to work listlessly. She would sit there dreaming, bored, bored to tears. She had a singular and infinite capacity for weeping. 
It was her only pleasure. But when her boredom weighed too heavily on her, she could not even weep. She was frozen, sick at heart and dead. She would pull herself together, or life would return of its own accord. She would think of her sister, listen to a barrel organ in the distance, and dream, and slowly count the days until she had gained such and such a sum of money. She would be out in her reckoning, and begin to count all over again. She would fall asleep. So the days passed. The fits of depression alternated with outbursts of childish chatter and laughter. She would make fun of herself and other people. She watched and judged her employers, and their anxieties fed by their want of occupation, and her mistress's moods and melancholy, and the so-called interests of the so-called people of culture, how they patronized a picture, or a piece of music, or a book of verse. With her rude common sense, as far removed from the snobbishness of the very Parisian servants as from the crass stupidity of the very provincial girls, who only admire what they do not understand, she had a respectful contempt for their dabbling in music, their pointless chatter, and all those perfectly useless and tiresome intellectual smatterings which play so large a part in such hypocritical existences. She could not help silently comparing the real life with which she grappled with the imaginary pains and pleasures of that cushioned life, in which everything seems to be the product of boredom. She was not in revolt against it. Things were so. Things were so. She accepted everything, knaves and fools alike. She said, It takes all sorts to make a world. Christophe imagined that she was borne up by her religion. But one day she said, speaking of others who were richer and more happy, But in the end we shall all be equal. When? asked Christophe. After the social revolution? The revolution? said she. Oh, there will be much water flowing under bridges before that. I don't believe that stuff. Things will always be the same. When shall we all be equal, then? When we're dead, of course. That's the end of everybody. He was surprised by her calm materialism. He dared not say to her, Isn't it a frightful thing, in that case, if there is only one life, that it should be the like of yours, while there are so many others who are happy? But she seemed to have guessed his thought. She went on phlegmatically, resignedly, and a little ironically. One has to put up with it. Everybody cannot draw a prize. I've drawn a blank. So much the worse. She never even thought of looking for a more profitable place outside France. She had once been offered a situation in America. The idea of leaving the country never entered her head. She said, stones are hard everywhere. There was in her a profound, skeptical, and mocking fatalism. She was of the stock that has little or no faith, few considered reasons for living, and yet a tremendous vitality the stock of the French peasantry, industrious and apathetic, riotous and submissive, who have no great love of life but cling to it, and have no need of artificial stimulants to keep up their courage. Christophe, who had not yet come across them, was astonished to find in the girl an absence of all faith. He marveled at her tenacious hold on life, without pleasure or purpose, and most of all he admired her sturdy moral sense that had no need of prop or support. Till then he had only seen the French people through naturalistic novels and the theories of the mannequins of contemporary literature, who, reacting from the art of the century of pastoral scenes in the Revolution, loved to present natural man as a vicious brute in order to sanctify their own vices. He was amazed when he discovered Sidonie's uncompromising honesty. It was not a matter of morality but of instinct and pride. She had her aristocratic pride. For it is foolish to imagine that everybody belonging to the people is popular. The people have their aristocrats just as the upper classes have their vulgarians. The aristocrats are those creatures whose instincts, and perhaps whose blood, are purer than those of the others, those who know and are conscious of what they are, and must be true to themselves. They are in the minority, but even when they are forced to live apart, the others know that they are the salt of the earth, and the fact of their existence is a check upon the others, who are forced to model themselves upon them, or to pretend to do so. Every province, every village, every congregation of men is, to a certain degree, what its aristocrats are, and public opinion varies accordingly, and is, in one place, severe, in another, lax. The present anarchy and upheaval of the majority will not change the unvoiced power of the minority. 
it is more dangerous for them to be uprooted from their native soil and scattered far and wide in the great cities. But even so, lost amid strange surroundings, living in isolation, yet the individualities of the good stock persist and never mix with those about them. Sidonie knew nothing, wished to know nothing, of all that Christophe had seen in Paris. She was no more interested in the sentimental and unclean literature of the newspapers than in the political news. She did not even know that there were popular universities, and if she had known, it is probable that she would have put herself out as little to go to them as she did to hear a sermon. She did her work and thought for herself. She was not concerned with what other people thought. Christophe congratulated her. Why is that surprising? she asked. I am like everybody else. You haven't met any French people. I've been living among them for a year, said Christophe, and I haven't met a single one who thought of anything but amusing himself or of aping those who amuse him. That's true, said Sidonie. You have only seen rich people. The rich are the same everywhere. You have seen nothing at all. That's true, said Christophe. I'm beginning. For the first time he caught a glimpse of the people of France, men and women who seem to be built for eternity, who are one with the earth, who, like the earth, have seen so many conquering races, so many masters of a day, pass away, while they themselves endure and do not pass. When he was getting better and was allowed to get up for a little, the first thing he thought of was to pay Sidonie back for the expenses she had incurred during his illness. It was impossible for him to go about Paris looking for work, and he had to bring himself to write to Hecht. He asked him for an advance on account of future work. With his amazing combination of indifference and kindliness, Hecht made him wait a fortnight for a reply, a fortnight during which Christophe tormented himself and practically refused to touch any of the food Sidonie brought him, and would only accept a little bread and milk, which she forced him to take. And then he grumbled and was angry with himself because he had not earned it. Then, without a word, Hecht sent him the sum he had asked, and not once during the months of Christoph's illness did Hecht make any inquiry after him. He had a genius for making himself disliked even when he was doing a kindness. Even in his kindness, Hecht could not be generous. Sidonie came every day in the afternoon and again in the evening. She cooked Christoph's dinner for him. She made no noise but went quietly about her business, and when she saw the dilapidated condition of his clothes she took them away to mend them. Insensibly there had crept an element of affection into their relation. Christophe talked at length about his mother, and that touched Sidonie. She put herself in Louise's place, alone in Germany, and she had a maternal feeling for Christophe, and when he talked to her he tried to trick his need of mothering and love, from which a man suffers most when he is weak and ill. He felt nearer Louisa with Sidonie than with anybody else. Sometimes he would confide his artistic troubles to her. She would pity him gently, though she seemed to regard such sorrows of the intellect ironically. That, too, reminded him of his mother and comforted him. He tried to get her to confide in him, but she was much less open than he. He asked her jokingly why she did not get married and she would reply in her usual tone of mocking resignation that it was not allowed for servants to marry. It complicates things too much. Besides, she was sure to make a bad choice, and that is not pleasant. Men are sordid creatures. They come courting when a woman has money, squeeze it out of her, and then leave her in the lurch. She had seen too many cases of that and was not inclined to do the same. She did not tell him of her own unfortunate experience. Her future husband had left her when he found that she was giving all her earnings to her family. Christophe used to see her in the courtyard mothering the children of a family living in the house. When she met them alone on the stairs, she would sometimes embrace them passionately. Christophe would fancy her occupying the place of a lady of his acquaintance. She was not a fool, and she was no plainer than many another woman. He declared that in the lady's place she would have been the better woman of the two. There are so many splendid lives hidden in the world, unknown and unsuspected. And, on the other hand, the hosts of the living dead, who encumber the earth and take up the room and the happiness of others in the light of the sun. Christophe had no ulterior thought. He was fond, too fond of her. He let her coddle him like a child. Some day Sidonie would be queer and depressed, but he attributed that to her work. 
Once, when they were talking, she got up suddenly and left him, making some excuse about her work. Finally, after a day when Christoph had been more confidential than usual, she broke off her visits for a time, and when she came back she would only talk to him constrainedly. He wondered what he could have done to offend her. He asked her. She replied quickly that he had not offended her, but she stayed away again. A few days later she told him that she was going away. She had given up her situation and was leaving the house. Coldly and reservedly she thanked him for all his kindness, told him she hoped he would soon recover, and that his mother would remain in good health, and then she said good-bye. He was so astonished at her abrupt departure that he did not know what to say. He tried to discover her reasons. She replied evasively. He asked her where she was going. She did not reply, and to cut short his question she got up to go. As she reached the door he held out his hand. She grasped it warmly, but her face did not betray her, and to the end she maintained her stiff, cold manner. She went away. He never understood why. End section 16《Section 17 of Jean Christophe in Paris》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Jean Christophe in Paris》by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canan. The Marketplace, Chapter 3, Part 5 he dragged through the winter, a wet, misty, muddy winter, weeks on end without sun. Although Christophe was better, he was by no means recovered. He still had a little pain in his lungs, a lesion which healed slowly, and fits of coughing which kept him from sleeping at night. The doctor had forbidden him to go out. He might just as well have ordered him to go to the Riviera or the Canary Islands. He had to go out. If he did not go out to look for his dinner, his dinner would certainly not come to look for him. And he was ordered medicines which he could not afford, and so he gave up consulting doctors. It was a waste of money, and besides, he was always ill at ease with them. They could not understand each other. They lived in separate worlds. They had an ironical and rather contemptuous pity for the poor devil of an artist who claimed to be a world unto himself, and was swept along like a straw by the river of life. He was humiliated by being examined and prodded and handled by these men. He was ashamed of his sick body, and thought, How glad I shall be when it is dead. In spite of loneliness, illness, poverty, and so many other causes of suffering, Christophe bore his lot patiently. He had never been so patient. He was surprised at himself. Illness is often a blessing. By ravaging the body, it frees the soul and purifies it. During the nights and days of forced inaction, thoughts arise which are fearful of the raw light of day and are scorched by the sun of health. No man who has never been ill can have a thorough knowledge of himself. His illness had, in a queer way, soothed Christophe. It had purged him of the coarser elements of his nature. Through his most subtle nerves he felt the world of mysterious forces which dwell in each of us, though the tumult of life prevents us hearing them. Since his visit to the Louvre, in his hours of fever, the smallest memories of which were graven upon his mind, he had lived in an atmosphere like that of the Rembrandt picture, warm, soft, profound, he too felt in his heart the magic beams of an invisible sun, and although he did not believe, he knew that he was not alone. A god was holding him by the hand, and leading him to the predestined goal of his endeavors. He trusted in him like a little child. For the first time for years he felt that he must rest. The lassitude of his convalescence was in itself a rest for him after the extraordinary tension of mind that had gone before his illness and had left him still exhausted. Christophe, who for many months had been continually on the alert and strained upon his guard, felt the fixity of his gaze slowly relax. He was not less strong for it. He was more human. The great, though rather monstrous, quality of life of the man of genius had passed into the background. He found himself a man like the rest, purged of the fanaticism of his mind and all the hardness and mercilessness of his actions. He hated nothing. He gave no thought to things that exasperated him, or, if he did, he shrugged them off. He thought less of his own troubles and more of the troubles of others. Since Sidonie had reminded him of the silent suffering of the lowly, fighting on without complaint all over the world, he forgot himself in them. 
He who was not usually sentimental now had periods of that mystique tenderness which is the flower of weakness and sickness. In the evening, as he sat with his elbows on the window sill, gazing down into the courtyard and listening to all the mysterious noises of the night, a voice singing in a house nearby, made moving by the distance, or a little girl artlessly strumming Mozart, he thought, All you whom I love, though I know you not, you whom life has not sullied, who dream of great things, that you know to be impossible, while you fight for them against the envious world. May you be happy. It is so good to be happy. Oh, my friends, I know that you are there, and I hold my arms out to you. There is a wall between us. Stone by stone I am breaking it down, but I am myself broken in the labor of it. Shall we ever be together? Shall I reach you before another wall is raised up between us, the wall of death? No matter. Though all my life I am alone, so only I may work for you, do you good, and you may love me a little later on when I am dead. So the convalescent Christoph was nursed by those two good foster mothers, Liebe und Not, love and poverty. While his will was thus in abeyance, Christoph felt a longing to be with people, and although he was still very weak, and it was a very foolish thing to do. He used to go out early in the morning when the stream of people poured out of the residential streets on their way to their work, or in the evening when they were returning. His desire was to plunge into the refreshing bath of human sympathy. Not that he spoke to a soul. He did not even try to do so. It was enough for him to watch the people pass, and guess what they were, and love them. With fond pity, he used to watch the workers hurrying along, all, as it were, already worn out by the business of the day, young men and girls, with pale faces, worn expressions, and strange smiles, thin, eager faces beneath which there passed desires and anxieties, all with a changing irony, all so intelligent, too intelligent, a little morbid, the dwellers in a great city. They all hurried along, the men reading the papers, the women nibbling and munching. Christoph would have given a month of his life to let one poor girl, whose eyes were swollen with sleep, who passed near him with a little nervous, mincing walk, sleep on for a few hours more. Oh, how she would have jumped at it if she had been offered the chance! He would have loved to pluck all the idle rich people out of their rooms, hermetically sealed at that hour, where they were so ungratefully lying at their ease, and replace them in their beds, in their comfortable existence, with all these eager, weary bodies, these fresh souls, not abounding with life, but alive and greedy of life. In that hour he was full of kindness towards them, and he smiled at their alert, thin little faces, in which there were cunning and ingenuousness, a bold and simple desire for pleasure, and, behind all, honest little souls, true and industrious. And he was not hurt when some of the girls laughed in his face, or nudged each other to point out the strange young man staring at them so hard. And he would lounge about the riverside, lost in dreams. That was his favorite walk. It did a little satisfy his longing for the great river that had sung the lullaby of his childhood. Ah, it was not fought or Rhine. It had none of his all-puissant might, none of the wide horizons, vast plains over which the mind soars and is lost. A river with gray eyes, gowned in pale green, with finely drawn, correct features, a graceful river, with supple movements, wearing with sparkling nonchalance the sumptuous and sober garb of her city, the bracelets of its bridges, the necklets of its monuments, and smiling at her own prettiness, like a lovely woman strolling through the town. The delicious light of Paris, that was the first thing that Christophe had loved in the city. It filled his being sweetly, sweetly, and imperceptibly slowly. It changed his heart. It was to him the most lovely music, the only music in Paris. He would spend hours in the evening walking by the river, or in the gardens of old France, tasting the harmonies of the light of day, touching the tall trees bathed in purple mist the gray statues and ruins, the worn stones of the royal monuments which had absorbed the light of centuries, that smooth atmosphere made of pale sunshine and milky vapor, in which, on a cloud of silvery dust, there floats the laughing spirit of the race. One evening he was leaning over the parapet near the Saint-Michel bridge, and looking at the water and absently turning over the books in one of the little boxes. He chanced upon a battered old volume of Michelet, and opened it at random. He had already read a certain amount of that historian, and had been put off by his Gallic boasting, his trick of making himself drunk with words, and his halting style. But that evening he was held from the very first words. He had lighted on the trial of Joan of Arc, 
He knew the maid of Orleans through Schiller, but hitherto she had only been a romantic heroine who had been endowed with an imaginary life by a great poet. Suddenly the reality was presented to him and gripped his attention. He read on and on, his heart aching for the tragic horror of the glorious story. And when he came to the moment when Joan learns that she is to die that evening and faints from fear, his hands began to tremble. Tears came into his eyes, and he had to stop. He was weak from his illness. He had become absurdly sensitive, and was himself exasperated by it. When he turned once more to the book, it was late, and the bookseller was shutting up his boxes. He decided to buy the book and hunted through his pockets. He had exactly six sous. Such scantiness was not rare and did not bother him. He had paid for his dinner and counted on getting some money out of Hecht the next day for some copying he had done. But it was hard to have to wait a day. Why had he spent all he had on his dinner? Ah, if only he could offer the bookseller the bread and sausages that were in his pockets in payment. Next morning, very early, he went to Hex to get his money, but as he was passing the bridge which bears the name of the Archangel of Battle, the brother in paradise of Joan of Arc, he could not help stopping. He found the precious book once more in the bookseller's box and read it right through. He stayed reading it for nearly two hours and missed his appointment with Hecht, and he wasted the whole day waiting to see him. At last he managed to get his new commission and the money for the old. At once he rushed back to buy the book, although he had read it. He was afraid it might have been sold to another purchaser. No doubt that would not have mattered much. It was quite easy to get another copy, but Christophe did not know whether the book was rare or not. And besides, he wanted that particular book and no other. Those who love books easily become fetish worshippers. The pages from which the well of dreams springs forth are sacred to them, even when they are dirty and spotted. In the silence of the night, in his room, Christophe read once more the gospel of the passion of Joan of Arc, and now there was nothing to make him restrain his emotions. He was filled with tenderness, pity, infinite sorrow for the poor little shepherdess in her coarse peasant clothes, tall, shy, soft-voiced, dreaming of the sound of bells. She loved them as he did, with her lovely smile, full of understanding and kindness, and her tears that flowed so readily, tears of love, tears of pity, tears of weakness, for she was at once so manlike and so much a woman, the pure and valiant girl, who tamed the savage lusts of an army of bandits, and calmly, with her intrepid sound good sense, her woman's subtlety, and her gentle persistency, alone, betrayed on all hands, for months together foiled the threats and hypocritical tricks of a gang of churchmen and lawyers, wolves and foxes with bloody eyes and fangs, who closed a ring about her, what touched Christophe most nearly was her kindness, her tenderness of heart, weeping after her victories, weeping over her dead enemies, over those who had insulted her, giving them consolation when they were wounded, aiding them in death, knowing no bitterness against those who sold her, and even at the stake, when the flames roared about her, thinking not of herself, thinking only of the monk who exorcised her, and compelling him to depart. She was gentle in the most bitter fight, good even amongst the most evil, peaceful even in war. Into war, the triumph of Satan, she brought the very spirit of God. And Christoph, thinking to himself, said, And into my fight I have not brought enough of the spirit of God. He read the fine words of the evangelist of Joan of Arc. Be kind, and seek always to be kinder, amid all the injustice of men and the hardships of fate. Be gentle and of a good countenance even in bitter quarrels. Win through experience, and never let it harm that inward treasure. And he said within himself, I have sinned. I have not been kind. I have not shown good will towards men. I have been too hard. Forgive me. Do not think me your enemy, you against whom I wage war. For you too I seek to do good but you must be kept from doing evil. And, as he was no saint, the thought of them was enough to kindle his anger again. What he could least forgive them was that when he saw them, and saw France through them, he found it impossible to conceive such a flower of purity and poetic heroism ever springing from such a soil. And yet it was so. Who could say that such a flower would not spring from it a second time? The France of today could not be worse than that of Charles VII, the debauched and prostituted nation from which the maid sprang. The temple was empty, fouled, half in ruins. No matter, God had spoken in it. Christophe was seeking a Frenchman whom he could love for the love of France. It was about the end of March. 
For months Christoph had not spoken to a soul nor had a single letter, except every now and then a few lines from his mother, who did not know that he was ill and did not tell him that she herself was ill. His relation with the outside world was confined to his journeys to the music shop to take or bring away his work. He arranged to go there at times when he knew that Hecht would be out, to avoid having to talk to him. The precaution was superfluous, for the only time he met Hecht, he hardly did more than ask him a few indifferent questions about his health. He was immured in a prison of silence when, one morning, he received an invitation from Madame Rousson to a musical soiree a famous quartet was to play. The letter was very friendly in tone, and Roussin had added a few cordial lines. He was not very proud of his quarrel with Christophe, the less so as he had since quarrelled with the singer, and now condemned her in no sparing terms. He was a good fellow. He never bore those whom he had wronged any grudge, and he would have thought it preposterous for any of his victims to be more thin-skinned than himself. And so, when he had the pleasure of seeing them again, he never hesitated about holding out his hand. Christophe's first impulse was to shrug his shoulders and vow that he would not go, but he wavered as the day of the concert came nearer. He was stifling from never hearing a human voice or a note of music, but he vowed again that he would never set foot inside the Roussin's house. But when the day came, he went, raging against his own cowardice. He was ill-rewarded. Hardly did he find himself once more in the gathering of politicians and snobs than he was filled with an aversion for them more violent than ever. For during his months of solitude he had lost the trick of such people. It was impossible to hear the music. It was a profanation. Christophe made up his mind to go as soon as the first piece was over. He glanced round among the faces of those people who were even physically so antipathetic to him. At the other end of the room he saw a face the face of a young man looking at him, and then he turned away at once. There was in the face a strange quality of candor which among such bored, indifferent people was most striking. The eyes were timid, but dear and direct, French eyes, which, once they marked a man, went on looking at him with absolute truth, hiding nothing of the soul behind them, missing nothing of the soul of the man at whom they gazed. They were familiar to Christophe, and yet he did not know the face. It was that of a young man between twenty and twenty-five, short, slightly stooping, delicate-looking, beardless, and melancholy, with chestnut hair, irregular features, though fine, a certain crookedness which gave an expression not so much of uneasiness as of bashfulness, which was not without charm, and seemed to contradict the tranquillity of the eyes. He was standing in an open door, and nobody was paying any attention to him. Once more Christophe looked at him, and once more he met his eyes, which turned away timidly with a delightful awkwardness. Once more he recognized them. It seemed to him that he had seen them in another face. Christophe, as usual, was incapable of concealing what he felt, and moved towards the young man. But as he made his way he wondered what he should say to him, and he hesitated and stood still looking to right and left, as though he were moving without any fixed object. But the young man was not taken in, and saw that Christoph was moving towards himself. He was so nervous at the thought of speaking to him that he tried to slip into the next room. But he was glued to his place by his very bashfulness. So they came face to face. It was some moments before they could find anything to say. And as they went on standing like that, each thought the other must think him absurd. At last Christoph looked straight at the young man, and said with a smile and a gruff voice, "'You're not a Parisian?' In spite of his embarrassment, the young man smiled at this unexpected question, and replied in the negative. His light voice, with its hint of a musical quality, was like some delicate instrument. I thought not, said Christophe, and as he saw that he was a little confused by the singular remark, he added, It is no reproach. But the young man's embarrassment was only increased. There was another silence. The young man made an effort to speak. His lips trembled. It seemed that he had a sentence on the tip of his tongue, but he could not bring himself to speak it. Christophe eagerly studied his mobile face, the muscles of which he could see twitching under the clear skin. He did not seem to be of the same clay as the people all about him in the room, with their heavy, coarse faces, which were only a continuation of their necks, part and parcel of their bodies. In the young man's face the soul shone forth. In every part of it there was a spiritual life. He could not bring himself to speak. Christophe went on genially. What are you doing among all these people? He spoke out loud with that strange freedom of manner which made him hated. His friend blushed and could not help looking round to see if he had been heard, and Christophe disliked the movement. Then, instead of answering, he asked with a shy, sweet smile, 
And you? Christoph began to laugh as usual, rather loudly. Yes, and I, he said delightedly. The young man at last summoned up his courage. I, I love your music so much, he said in a choking voice. Then he stopped and tried once more, vainly, to get the better of his shyness. He was blushing, and knew it, and he blushed the more, up to his temples and round to his ears. Christoph looked at him with a smile, and longed to take him in his arms. The young man looked at him timidly. No, he said. Of course, I can't. I can't talk about that. Not here. Christoph took his hand with a grin. He felt the stranger's thin fingers tremble in his great paw, and press it with an involuntary tenderness. And the young man felt Christoph's paw affectionately crush his hand. They ceased to hear the chatter of the people round them. They were alone together, and they knew that they were friends. It was only for a second, for then Madame Roussin touched Christophe on the arm with her fan and said, I see that you have introduced yourselves and don't need me to do so. The boy came on purpose to meet you this evening. Then, rather awkwardly, they parted. Christophe asked Madame Roussin, Who is he? What? said she. You don't know him? He is a young poet and writes very prettily, one of your admirers. He is a good musician and plays the piano quite nicely. It is no good discussing you in his presence. He is mad about you. The other day he all but came to blows about you with Lucien Levicourt. Oh, bless him for that, said Christophe. Yes, I know you are unjust to poor Lucien, and yet he loves your work. Ah, don't tell me that. I should hate myself. It is so, I assure you. Never, never, I will not have it. I forbid him to do so. Just what your admirer said. You are both mad. Lucien was just explaining one of your compositions to us. The shy boy you met just now got up, trembling with anger, and forbade him to mention your name. Think of it. Fortunately, I was there. I laughed it off. Lucien did the same, and the boy was utterly confused and relapsed into silence, and in the end he apologized. Poor boy, said Christophe. He was touched by it. Where did he go? he asked, without listening to Madame Roussin, who had already begun to talk about something else. He went to look for him, but his unknown friend had disappeared. Christophe returned to Madame Roussin. Tell me, what is his name? Who? she asked. The boy you were talking about just now. Your young poet, she said. His name is Olivier Genin. The name rang in Christophe's ears like some familiar melody. The shadowy figure of a girl floated for a moment before his eyes. But the new image, the image of his friend, blotted it out at once. Christophe went home. He strode through the streets of Paris, mingling with the throng. He saw nothing, heard nothing. He was insensible to everything about him. He was like a lake cut off from the rest of the world by a ring of mountains. Not a breath stirred, not a sound was heard. All was still. Peace. He said to himself over and over again, I have a friend. End of section 17. Read by Brian Fullen, August 2022.